All right, welcome to the Stormbreak Open, our first event for the 2021 Eternal Organized Play season. I am Andrew Beckstrom. I'm joined today by Luis Scott Vargas. How are you doing this morning, Luis? Oh, doing great. Uh, I'm going to get to watch these players play for their share of $5,000. And, uh, you know, the, kicking off organized play is really sweet this year because uh, why don't you tell us about kind of the offerings this year? I know I'm personally most excited about the fact that there's going to be uh, a draft open for every every expansion. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. So this year, our, the major ways that you can qualify for the World Championships is about once a month, we're going to have a 5K open. And in those events, you get like this one this weekend, you can play games on Friday and Saturday. Joining up gets you an altar card four copies of that. And then if you make, if you have one of the 64 best records from the qualifying games, the 28 qualifying games you play over those two days, you get to join us today where you get a chance to winning cash prizes. And if you make it to first place, you get all the way to the 2021 Eternal World Championships. And this year, as you mentioned, we're going to be doing some draft opens. That's going to be in the offerings. There's going to be expedition opens this weekend. We have a throne open featuring the newest set to hit Eternal, Stormbreak. So these 20 plus cards making their impact on Eternal's throne format where you get to see all of the cards in action. And there's a lot of different Stormbreak cards in today's offerings. We've got everything. We've got Grenahens. We're going to get to see some crafty occultists. We've even got eccentric officer making an appearance in today's top 64 list. So lots of fun action on queue for you today. Uh, but to kick things off today uh, and to just give you an idea about how this event is going to all going to work. So Luis, we, we start off with a 64 person field. How do we get down to our champion? Uh, I, I assume playing round Robin where each player plays 63 matches. No, uh, <laughs> uh, it's single elimination. So if you lose a match, you're done, but best two out of three games uh, to determine that. And so it means every round, every round, half the field goes home. Well, they're probably at home already, but half the field uh, is done for, which means the the winner to, will be determined by the person who does not lose a single match today. Absolutely. So that means we're going to get to see a lot of different decks in action today because each round of our of our sixty four person event today, we're going to start off with a featured match. As soon as that best of three match concludes. We'll jump right into one of the other matches that is ongoing, and we'll keep on doing that until all of the players in the field have completed this round. Then we'll get queued up for another round, take a quick one to two minute break, and then we'll be back with another round of action. And we'll just keep on doing that. So this is probably the most talking, the most time in the booth we'll spend all day. For the most part, it's just going to be nonstop eternal action. Yeah, we, we know what people came here to see, and that's people playing Eternal and not us uh, talking. <laughs> they want us talking about Eternal games. And uh, one of the one of the benefits of this tournament structure is that, you know, the, these these broadcasts are basically all gameplay, with the exception, of course, of this intro as we kind of wait for the players to get set up and, uh, you know, we, we go live. There is a delay, so uh, the players can't just, you know, stream Sniper, watch the stream. Not that, of course, any of our Eternal competitors would do that, but... No, no reason to even put that on the table. So uh, we're going to get going in just a few minutes here. Uh, one thing I did want to bring up, by the way, uh, is Dune Imperium, a board game you know made by Direwolf Digital. Actually, I had the pleasure of working on it myself. is nominated for five Dice Tower Awards, including Game of the Year. And it's really awesome seeing all the work that uh, you know the, the the design team put into that game. And uh, it's a really fun game. I actually got my copy recently. It's a, kind of a worker placement game set in the Dune universe, and it, it's a new twist. You know, Paul Denon, the creative director and then the creator of the game, you know, behind hits such as Clank or uh, Chronicles of the Throne, the uh, kind of the eternal deck building game. He he always had, does such a good job of taking things that we know and love, but also putting these awesome new twists in it. So it plays unlike any other game I've played while also having a lot of elements that you, you, you've kind of gotten accustomed with if you've played a lot of games. So I would definitely check out Dune Imperium. Yep, and you can find all of those games just at direwolfdigital.com and going to the store. Uh, so if you've been enjoying Internal and you want to check out some more sweet games that we've worked on, check it out. For now, though, we're going to kick things off with Isomorphic versus Synesthesia, and uh, that game is actually ready, so let's head down to the match. All right, we're off and rolling here in our top 64. Isomorphic on the bottom of your screen is playing a JPS Justice Primal Shadow Reanimator deck. Missing Justice at the moment. He's just splashing Kilo for that. Up against Synesthesia 
on yetis and isomorphic is uh hunting for some power right now luis yeah uh, uh the, the good thing for isomorphic uh multiple copies of grenahan is actually quite strong so grenahan is a card from stormbreak and uh it's gonna give isomorphic a lot of what isomorphic is looking for which is it's a one three uh, lifesteal by itself while also finding damaging spells or in this case units and it, it blocks nicely in this case it's eating a torch but you know you, you for a card that costs two and drew you a card, you can't ask for a whole lot more. And overall, it's going to be one of Isomorphic's strongest card against Yetis, but if Isomorphic doesn't find power, I don't think even a, a whole flock of Grenahens is going to save them. Yeah. Isomorphic kind of hoping that there's a privilege of rank in the offerings that they're discarding here from Grenahan, and that would play from the Void, give them a Justice Sigil, but unfortunately there's not. Synesthesia is curving out nice and beautifully here. Just going to get down a Thudrock's Masterwork. That's going to pump all of their Yetis plus one, plus one, and stun the Grenahan as they play the Fend Off from the site. And to me, it looks like this game one is just going to go quickly into the Book of Synesthesia, and Isomorphic is going to have their work cut out from them. As this is best of three, they'll still have a chance here to win the next two, but they their margin of error is basically gone now. And uh, yeah, they they they've drawn more eight drops than they've drawn power this game. So that that kind of uh, gives gives you a sign of how things are going. And even though the privileges of rank aren't aren't as great as uh, they used to be, getting that justice sigil for free would still be a lot of help. So yeah, isomorphic playing an interesting take on reanimator though. As we talk a little bit more about their deck list here, is the this game. Looks to be close to wrapping up. We'll see the dark water vines. What, what do you have against Yetis that you don't want to talk more about the Yetis deck? <laughs> well, if you've seen Yetis before, Yetis is uh, no stranger to our top 64. One of the strongest aggro decks in Eternal. The combination of these small units, they come down early, they, they hit hard, and they, a lot of them just have these nice little abilities that give them some extra staying power. Snowcrest Yeti with its Aegis, Mischief Yeti giving you potentially a snowball if you play a spell on it. And for Synesthesia, that is game number one for them. But yes, talking about Isomorphic's decks, uh, Kilo, Bold Innovator, is a, is, is a pretty big part of the deck. Why don't you go through kind of what Kilo offers? Because surely it's not searching out 8 drops. <laughs> Well, it can in some circumstances. So Kilo Bold Innovator is a 1-3, and you can pay two with it and sacrifice one of your units to play another unit from your deck that has the same, that equal to the cost of the unit you sacrificed plus the number of battle skills it had. So it sounds a little, a little complicated on the surface, but if we take something like a Black Sky Harbinger, that's a six-cost unit. It has Flying and Lifesteal. So six plus Flying plus Lifesteal, that's eight. And so you can search up an eight drop with it. And so can use that to potentially get increased uh, access to some of the key units in their deck. And so and, we see uh, a Kilo in this opening hand here with a Blight Pass Smuggler with Berserk. So for instance, Kilo would be able to find up a four drop with that. Right. And so it, it actually goes quite up the chain a lot faster than, than you might think when you first look at the card. Yes. But and for I mean, Isomorphic, they're going to go down to six here as they didn't like the looks of that hand with no justice influence for that Kilo. They've got a nice little uh, early start, at least. Yeah, I mean, Darkwater Vines into Sporefolk is fine, but th th we're missing some meat here. There's nothing here that really uh, is a lot of action. Though Darkwater Vines is very resilient against a bunch of 2-1 threats. Yeah, this is one of the best anti-aggro one-drops. That 1-1 one -one regen body just is going to do such a nice job here at potentially blocking that Snowcrest Yeti. That regen means, and you see that glowing red shield around it, means that the first time it takes damage that damage will be prevented and the regen shield will be popped. Here we see the Dark Water Vines ultimate be procced by the Sporefolk. Whenever a, play whenever a player discards a card, ultimate each player discards the bottom four cards of their deck. So one of the quirks of the Mandrakes is they like to discard from the bottom. They dig into the roots. Very nice. Well, Permafrost is a good answer uh, to the Vines here. It, it, it's actually a one-for-one, one, whereas most of the cards in the Yeti deck kind of be forced to two-for-one themselves. But Sporefolk is still pretty annoying. You don't really want to trade your two and ages for a, for a Sporefolk that already did its thing. Yeah, so Synesthesia probably weighing the options here of making that trade or bonding out the Pock Pock. This 1-5, when you bond it out, you get a Snowball. Uh, Isomorphic really not uh, doing what their deck is trying to do. They have yet to mill a privilege of rank up. Oh, I guess there they go. They, they, they did find one. But they don't have a Kilo. They don't have any of their engines. And in, instead, they've got a, access to a total of five power once they play it all, 
plus a Vara in hand, which is not really that close to coming down. No, it's not. So for Synesthesia, though, the lovely little curve topper to a couple of early Yetis, one party seeker. Your Yetis have plus one, plus one, and whenever you play a Yeti, it deals one damage to the enemy player. Yeah, and waiting on the attack, of course, made a lot of sense given that, you know, a Wump is coming, so now your 2 and can get past uh, the, the Spore Folk pretty easily. So the 2-1 Darkwater Vines, it got an extra point of strength off of its ultimate, was able to just eat up that Snowcrest Yeti. It did lose its regen, though, which opens it up to that Snowball from Synesthesia next turn. For Isomorphic, they drew a Blight Pass Smuggler. That's fantastic. It maybe opens up the option, depending upon what's in their Void, of going into their market and grabbing that Grasping at Shadows, which will play a unit from their Void. The downside of that right now, Luis, Isomorphic doesn't have a second Shadow Influence to play the Grasping at Shadows. Yeah, and that's kind of the, the cost, because if you look at Isomorphic's deck list, five Justice Sigils, and then also those Chairman's Contracts, you, you are ha looking at some pretty steep uh, influence requirements, and that's in order to really take advantage of, you want the, the mill off the Chairman's Contract and Privilege or Rank to always find a Justice Sigil. But yeah, you run into situations like this where Isomorphic is not unable to cast a Grasping at Shadows. And I mean, they could have kept another power if they did an exchange the Vara, but because that power didn't help cast Grasping, there's no reason to do that. So Synesthesia has a depleted Skycrag Silex in hand. They're just going to play out this next Wump right now. And it, it'll deal two damage thanks to the other Wump and its own ability. Meanwhile, the Pock Pock gets buffed up to 3-7, but still can't get through that Blight Pass Smuggler. So, you know, Isomorphic with just the Rinky Dink unit still has some time here. Well, another double Shadow card here, and Isomorphic's forced to just pass the turn back doing nothing, which is never a good feeling, especially uh, when you're kind of playing Constructed, right? Like, that, your decks are just never designed to do that. Nope. Meanwhile, Champion of Fury designed to come down and hit hard as a charge unit once you have enough Primal and Fire Influence is going to crash in here as a 6-3. Interesting that Synesthesia didn't fire off the Snowball there, at maybe the Darkwater Vines. Maybe they want to have the option to hit that Blight Pass Smuggler if it blocks again. Yeah, so what if, 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 if they do... I mean, the Snowball's known information, right? So it's not like Isomorphic isn't aware of it. You can see that the Blight Pass Smuggler's not immediately blocking the Pock Pock. So maybe uh, Synesthesia's happy just kind of keeping that off the table. The, the downside, of course, is that uh, these Wumps are, are really not doing a whole lot besides pumping the team, though I think next turn they're more than likely to get in. This is the turn Isomorphic needs to draw, and ugh, another brick. Yeah, it doesn't look like like Isomorphic is literally dead, but it does look like they're at sort of a virtual two right now to my eyes, and they're going to get to draw... Ooh, I, I think they're that at a virtual dead. I'll <laughs> do it. <laughs> All right, bend off, going to come down stun that play pass smuggler and isomorphic is going to pack it in unfortunately for isomorphic uh, their deck was a little more ambitious and didn't quite have the kind of consistent draws that it needed in these two games and you know what they worked hard to to get here this weekend but it's a tough field and they're now eliminated from today's competition yeah I, I, isomorphic can't be happy about uh kind of how their deck performed because you know, when you, especially when you play a really sweet deck, which Isomorphix was, you, you do want to like show it off a little and and kind of let it do its thing. And I, I think both games won't really display what that deck is capable of. Clearly, if Isomorphic, you know, kind of cruised into the top sixty-four, but knowing Isomorphic, they're going to have a lot more bites at the apple because they're uh, a frequent visitor to the top sixty-four. And as a reminder, if you go to the Eternal subreddit, the all of the sixty top sixty-four deck lists were shared there yesterday, so if you want to check out any of the decks that you see today and give them a spin in the queues, just go over to r slash eternal card game to check them out. All right, so we're going to get another match queued up for you folks here. The bonus of that match sort of being such a beatdown on Isomorphic so fast was that we're going to get to check out one of our other matches. Let, I think we're going to see Popatito's deck in action potentially now. Uh, Popatito was the one player in our field, Luis, who brought a eccentric officer the, nice. They are down a game right now, but Eccentric Officer, a new four-cost unit from Stormbreak, and it has it's a 2-2 two -two Decay, and it has Summon. Randomly rearrange the costs of all of the cards in your deck. And so they're trying to potentially turn something like a Channel of Tempest into something that costs one. And, you know, if you, you Luis, you've played a lot of Channel of Tempest in your, in your day. Do you think that's a card we could buff to one cost? <laughs> well... I, given that it, its cost crept from seven to eight to nine, I, I'm going to say no. And, and 
you know, Pope Petito's deck looks wild, but it does have the capability of going eccentric officer into next turn, cast Channel the Tempest, cast Scourge of Frost Home, cast whatever else. Like it, it th that is in the realm of possibility. And again, all the players you see here, they made top 64 out of a huge field. So, you know, as eccentric as the deck might be, it's certainly working. Yeah. Super cool to see somebody. Oh, Some you know, that was of resistance that was... and <laughs> Kairos Grand Champion. Like, like what, 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 you know, what, we don't know what to expect and neither does the opponent because literally anything could happen uh, the turn after or even the turn of that uh, eccentric officer comes down if Pope Tito can draw some cards. Yeah. Uh, it's a card that I'm, I know that many had just pegged as more of a meme offering on day one, but, you know, didn't stop Popatito for bringing it for us this weekend. So doing, doing some cool stuff with it. Uh, you know, I, one of the things I really like with their, where their list is the, is the crown watch press gangs. And so they've got some one cost, you know, cards, <laughs> and then they have the possibility if just any of their big, big plays gets big units, gets turned into a one cost unit, the crown watch press gang will always be able to find it. Yeah, that is amazing. You're, it, it, it's not often that you cast a card like Crown Watch Press King and don't know what to expect. But after you cast Eccentric Officer, Pope Tito is going to cast the Crown Watch Press King and hope something monstrous pops up. All right, so we'll be joining them in action. As we mentioned, they're just in between games. They're up against Jez2718. They're one of the players who brought a Fel mid-range deck to this weekend. So I assume we're going to see some Grenahens in action. Yep, the usual exactly what you kind of expect a lot of just great primal and shadow cards exploit maveloft huntress bar of vengeance seeker rindra infiltrator felrock the outcast so we'll be seeing what their found what the found deck does this is one of the most popular all right sounds like we got the game but this is going to be one of the decks we expect to see a bunch of today yeah grenahan is is not a weak card and uh it's always funny when cards that uh, look a little goofy end up being uh one of the more played cards all right, so Popatito's got uh, a Crest of Fury, a Primal Sigil, and a Praxis card, a Time card, and a Mono Justice card, Luis. It, it, don't undersell it. A Seek Power tying it all together. <laughs> well, kind of, because you can't get all the things you're missing with it, but you, you can certainly start. Yeah, and Popatito taking advantage of Crown Watch Press Gang in just a fair game can get Logistics Expert. That's from the last set. And uh, what logistics experts so nice about it compared to initiative, the sands is that it's also plus one maximum power for a one drop. But with that amplify four plus four plus four, it could become a real beat down unit in the late game. Meanwhile, uh, Jez kept a hand that basically all six drops, except for that even handed golem, which of course is going to draw them into, well, hopefully some more action. So Pipotito interestingly only played one of their logistics experts. Looks like they're trying to hold up a transpose here as Jez is going to get us started off with an even-handed golem and draw two cards. <laughs> At this point, we've increased the hand size to five six drops. You know, it, it's not clear that even-handed golem is going to do enough here, but the second one might help and find enough power. Also, drawing all those Felrock the Outcasts, that's not, not how you want to encounter that card. So to me, it looks to me like Popatito is potentially just going here for that eccentric officer out of their market. Uh, I sure hope so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they don't actually <laughs> have a fourth undepleted power ready to go for it, but, you know, we'll, we'll see what they can do. And uh, so one of the things you'll notice, uh, you know, in... in in all these decks, uh, like whether it was the Grasping at Shadows and Isomorphics deck or the uh, uh, Eccentric Officer and Popatito's deck is because of the the kind of smugglers and merchants that they have access to, it's better to play one of the card you want in your market and none in, in your main deck in order to have the most access and the most copies. So Popatito getting to draw two cards with their Aurelian Supplier. It draws a card if you have more units than the enemy player and it draws a card if you have fewer cards in hand. So a nice little catch-up tool for sort of Praxis Tempo decks to help them catch up sort of in the in the card economy race. An exploit the draw from Jez here. Yeah, but with a... Uh... Aegis there, that I guess that is not really going to get there. And Defile can actually take the Aegis out at a pretty good deal for, for Jez because you don't really care so much about that ability, but it's still going to be quite difficult for Popatito because I don't think they have an undepleted power in hand, which means, yeah, they could run into some issues here. Yeah, this is a this is a real dangerous scenario for Popatito. Because they're all of their eccentric officers were just the one copy in the market, 
if it gets back to Jez and they just fire off that exploit, it's going to be a major disruption to what Popatito does. We're going to need to see them start playing fair with all of those uh, expensive fatties well, that they have in their deck. I mean, to, to, to Popatito's credit, they've built up a decent power base so far. I think even if uh, their one of officer is in fact exploited, which I assume it will be, they're, they're going to still end up in a spot where they're not that far from casting most of their cards. And so we'll see a plunder from Jez. And ooh, that what felt a little greedy, Luis. So they plundered the Felrock, and it turns into a sigil of one of its factions. It went primal, but they really wanted to make sure they kept getting more shadow influence so that they could actually play an Akari on turn six. Yeah, that that was a, maybe a little bit ambitious there. Yeah, I, th I think if you're Jez, you might just want to plunder one of the three Akaris and just take no chances that you don't get shadow influence there off of that plunder decision of transforming one of the cards in your hand. If it's a power card, it becomes a treasure trove. If it's a non-power card, it becomes a sigil of one of its factions. Meanwhile, the Aurelian Supplier is going to attack for two, dropping Jez down to 21. And now popatito has got a, another big decision. What are they going to get with Crown Watch Press Gang? Looks like it's just a logistics expert. Do they actually have any other one drops that have long game utility besides logistics expert? Doesn't yeah, I mean, they, like it. they've got the initiates, but yeah, those, those, <laughs> those. Well, you know, the thing is, I think the the expert obviously makes a lot of sense. At some point, getting initiates not the worst in that you do have these expensive cards, but yeah, Popo Tito is going to need to kind of play on the fair here, and I'm starting to see how maybe game one went as well. Exploit seems like a very good card against Popo Tito. Yeah, and, and you see why also why Popatito decided to go with Transpose as one of their main ways of getting the eccentric officers. They just wanted to have some more insulation against Aegis. So Popatito now plays the Logistics Expert, plus one maximum power, Amplify four, plus four, plus four. And so, you know, they've assembled a decent little attacking army here. Uh, they're attacking for five. They have no more action in hand, but they are certainly winning on board. <laughs> Another fell rock here. Yeah, so because Jez played a primal sigil, it's now they've got six power, but they don't have six shadow influence. So fell rock's going to come down, summon the enemy player, discards a card from their hand, and discards cards from their deck equal to its cost. But power cards don't have a cost. And wow, so there's Kairos. But, um, uh, you know, we're still a power off, and we're actually still shy a fire and time influence. So. <laughs> yeah, if there's a fire time, if Popatito's running some fire time power, which I imagine they've got some of in their deck, I suppose they could. Yeah, they, they, they've got like Praxis painting and whatnot, but uh, they, <laughs> they, they, they could get there with just one power draw, but for the most part, they're going to be at multiple power draws away from casting that Kairos. Yeah, I was surprised Popatito didn't want to attack with the Aurelian Supplier. I wonder why. Meanwhile, Akari is going to come down Kill the logistics expert, drops Popatito back down to just seven power. They pick up a blazing salvo. Do they have anything interesting they can get from the market? Oh, well, these aren't the best offerings, Luis. I'm gonna read them out to you. They've got Caleb's Choice, Lightning Storm, and Reweave as two cost spells in their market. I guess Reweave is the, has the most utility, but like, the what what could they do? Reweave an Aurelian Supplier into like a Red Canyon Smuggler? I'm not really seeing any. I guess a like crafty occultist is probably the best offering. Okay. I mean, at this point, now that uh, Jez has gotten past their power issues and start to play Ikaria after Ikaria, the Ikaria is going to be the first middle and last Reaper here because I don't think Popatito is going to have a, a too much of a chance given that, well, the main engine card in their deck got stripped away by that exploit. Yep. We're seeing the power of Feln as a great disruptive option in the metagame just cards like exploit and dazzle just give you such fantastic utility at answering all kinds of different problems and akaria the first reaper nicely as the avatar finishes things off for jez as they take down this match two to nothing all right so back to the booth here with me and luis the virtual booth of course we are still taking all precautions right now we we love to be in person broadcasting these events but for now at least we're still doing some remote broadcasts hopefully i'm i'm optimistic though that at least at some point this year we will be getting to do another broadcast in person together well one of one of my conditions for doing the broadcast is that i was never have to be in the same room as andrew beckstrom so that, me, me, yeah maybe maybe me and Corey can get together we'll see 
<laughs> yep, Corey Burkhardt will be joining us uh, later on today for some rounds. Uh, he'll be on the booth next round. Uh, we're going to look and see if we've got any other matches outstanding. You know, we're only about 20-something minutes into the round, so I anticipate we are. All right, so we've got Always Face versus Gerga APM. All right, they're in game two, and Gerga APM's up one. Let's check out that match when we can. Gerga APM is one of our most successful players in Eternal Organized Play. We see them in almost every single top 64. They've always got a great deck. And this weekend, Luis, they brought the Fire Primal Shadow Praxis Trove deck. And so this is like a sacrifice token-y kind of deck. Um, lots of cool stuff going on with it. And we see them up against what looks like a Huru Kira deck with two different sites right now. Lord Steyer's Tower just fired off a Curfew Enforcement, and now they're going to play a Koryavop Palace. All right, let's see if the Palace can stand alone here. Uh... The, the Maveloft Huntress, not a whole lot to, to glom onto here, unfortunately. Well, here's the thing it does. The Palace has four uh, sort of durability left, and the Maveloft Huntress just killed two of the four that was on the other side of the board. So True, true. That does keep the, the Palace around for, for another go-round here. Uh, I, I always like to Unfortunately, the other Palace modes after this are... Um, they, they get a lot of units Berserk, it gives something plus four, plus four in Endurance, so that ain't much doing. Also, Strange Burglar is just going to buff the Gurga PM's entire squad. And in fact, it looks like they can just go for lethal. They can just ignore the palace. Yep. It appears that they have a shrine to carve it in play. And so all of their units get plus two strength and overwhelm. And look at that little bit of synergy, Luis. <laughs> they use no one to hold them to draw the broken contract. Fate, if you have a unit in your void play, of plus a 4-1 cell sword that can't block and the shrine to carve it gave it haste and lifesteal or charge and lifesteal excuse me and yep just finishing them off what a what a i haven't seen no one to hold them for broken contract yet but that makes a ton of sense you gotta know when to hold them <laughs> <laughs> yeah you can't so no one to hold them one cost primal card draw a card of your choice from your deck but you can't play it for five turns and players have been doing their best since this promo card was released to break it by frequently searching up fate cards so cards that give you some kind of bonus when you draw them the most powerful interaction we've seen has been with Kroll zumek occultist with its fate to play a unit from your void um, and take damage equal to your remaining power um, but yeah they there's there's other ones for sure and uh, a nice a nice bit of uh, deck building there getting broken contract yeah and so far we've seen a, a bunch of routes so <laughs> that that leaves us looking for another match here and uh, once again i think that we're likely to find one all right, so we've got Jetty versus Navigator. They're in game two. Jetty is up a game, and so we're going to... Oh, sorry, Jetty's down a game. So we're going to check out game two of their match in just a moment here. Jetty Ejai, one of our popular Eternal content creators in there. They're on a Fel deck this weekend, and it looks like we got a little Fel mirror action on deck for you. Net Netscape Navigator, though, the old internet browser, has brought back... An old staple of Felndex, Champion of Cunning there, all the way buffed up. And it looks like it's even got regen, probably thanks to a Vine Grafter. Yeah, there's some real cha-cha-cha over there. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, for Jetty, Jetty, EJ, EJ, Jetty, EJ, <laughs> mouthful. Uh, they're going to play out of Fel Rock. It's got regen, probably again from a Vine Grafter, but it's just going to get killed from an Akaria. And with Netscape Navigator up a game, Luis, um, yeah, we're going to get to see another match just to wrap up. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, you know, we'll, we'll we'll find a close match at, at some point here. It looks like uh, round one, at least, uh, the the spoils are going to uh, everyone who started strong finished strong. Yep, and the browser wars didn't go their way for Netscape Navigator, but the round of sixty four did as they'll move on to our round of thirty two. So, you know, we've been able to dodge duck into a bunch of different matches so far. We'll see if there's any more outstanding in our field. As soon as all 32 matches are concluded, we will get set up for the round of 32. I don't think anyone's currently outstanding in a field. Just most people are probably indoors playing Eternal at this point. You can play on your phone if you like. Nothing it's true. You know, if you haven't checked out Eternal Mobile, it is actually a great way to play Eternal. Tablets and phones, all good. All right. Batteries versus Cinemod, they're in game three. So I assume the match score is one to one. You like that deductive reasoning, Luis? That is uh that that yeah I would say that's uh that's your strongest suit. <laughs> All right, Cinemod's got a nice little Skycrag Sling of the Chi deck here for us. They're up against Batteries. Looks like they're on a similar style deck to Gurge PM, another sort of Fire Primal Shadow sacrifice offering, and 
They're going to use that Grenahen to find a display of menace. Uh, Grenahen draws a unit or spell that deals damage from the top three cards of your deck. And since display of menace, one of its modes deals damage, there you go. It's to find it. Taking a look here. Uh, I'm curious how close Battery's deck list is. Though oh. I suppose they just exploded, so <laughs> there goes that. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, nice, a, a nice little tech card there. I like the inclusion of Tamaris, the Earthshaker, out of uh, out of Cinemod's deck. That's not a card you always see in the Skycraig Sling decks, but that and it, it's an expensive card. It's got six health, and just the utility of being able to shift it out for three, deal one damage to each unit without flying, uh, just does some nice little work at helping stabilize you. I mean, you play that against the deck like Yetis, and you get to kill so many of your other units and gives you the time that you need to be able to take over the game with your Rose and your Geminons. All right, but for batteries, uh, did not work out for them this weekend. And so let's see. So still got another match or two out. Uh, we could check out Keith Pelleg versus Almost. We saw, we've saw we seen both of these players a lot last season. Keith Pelleg did quite well with Zine and Strangers. Let's see what they've got for us this weekend. So... Up at the top of your screen, almost looks to be on another. Looks like we've got two more players here on this Fire, Fire Primal Shadow Sacrifice deck. And as I mentioned, this is a game three. <laughs> looks like everyone really knows when to hold them at this point. <laughs> yeah, such a fantastic card with Kroll for these decks. Being able to buy back things like Kato's in the late game is, uh, is a real nice bit of utility for that no when to hold them plus Kroll combo. Meanwhile, here... Strange Burglar going to deal three damage to Keith Pelleg, sacrifice a unit to draw three cards. Drawing three, not... I mean, it, it's fine here because it's, it's letting Keith Pelleg hit their power drop, but at this point, they have a lot more cards than they have the ability to use those cards. So, you know, at, at, there are diminishing returns with using that ability. I, I imagine you only want to use it in spots like this when you're when you're really desperate to, like, hit power drops. All right, so for almost, they picked up a Senway Smuggler, that 3-2 Decay. And, you know, they, they can attack with that Cell Sword there, that 4-1, but it would just trade off with the Crafty Occultist. That's a one of the new cards from Stormbreak. 3 costs 3-3. Three, three. Summon, discard two cards, and draw two cards. If you discard a unit this way, you play a 1-1 one, one Grenadine, and if you discard a spell this way, it gains flying. So... It's a 3-3 three, three that really fixes your hand and can do a nice bit of work at adding to your board presence. A lot of menacing going on here in the last couple matches we've checked in on. <laughs> All right, so they picked up a Kroll here. They're going to have to... It's going to deal them a bunch of damage, but they're going to be able to play a Mother of Skies from their Void. Let me start this, generating some tokens here. Yeah, this two-cost 1-4 flyer, the first multi-faction unit you play each turn... You get to play a 1-2 Cloud Snake with flying. All right. So the Display of Menace gets them a Defile and a Sky Craig banner. They could use that Defile to just take out the Crafty Occultist. It kills enemy units with cost three or less. Unfortunately, they can't kill that Strange Burglar. Um, but we're going to see first a snowball just go on to that Grenadine. And I guess that opens... In there. What was that? Yeah, just picking off a Grenadine there. And both players are really good at putting a lot of kind of like junk onto the field here. You know, you, you see these cloud snakes coming off the, the mother. You've got a bunch of Grenadine tokens. It's going to make it a, in a, a totemite hanging out. It's going to make it difficult for players to get damage through. Yeah, so Keith Pelly got a bunch of options here. They can go to their market with Senway Smuggler. They could use Grenahan to dig. They could search something up with no when to hold them. So these uh, these Fire Primal Shadow decks are great for players who want to have a lot of control over what cards are in their hand and what they're going to be doing on any given turn. So they go into the market there. And they get that open contract. Kill an enemy unit. It costs four or less, and then reduce the cost of each card in the enemy player's deck by one. So a very efficient removal spell, but it opens you up to giving them some long-term help by reducing the cost of their I, I think that, units. Yeah, that could really come back to, to, 
to to bite Keith Pelleg here because both players are actually kind of stuck on five power. So giving uh, almost a little bit more efficiency is going to be rough. Uh, the Defile does hit the Crafty Occultist kind of as you predicted. And now almost finds themselves behind enough on board that they're, they're going to need to make some strides here. Another new one to hold them. The, <laughs> the, I guess the, the, the countdown's ticking down on that crawl here. <laughs> yes, someday it'll be able to play again. All right, so for almost... You know, they can go into the market with Senway Smuggler. I'm, I wonder if they have anything that's impactful enough that they need for only two costs, because that's all the remaining power they'd had. I can look they, at their market real quick. Hurler ready to, to cash out, too. Yeah, you know, that's the problem with their hand, is they've got a bunch of cards that, in hand that just don't do that much right now. All right, well, we'll see what uh, Senway Smuggler can find, because it, it is coming down here. All right, so it's going to go for a crawl. They're going to be able to bring back the Mother of Skies... What could, it's just a one four flyer. They don't. Yeah, they don't. They don't have anything that that'll trigger it right now. And meanwhile, Keith Peleg has a, a, a lot of options as well, but a, a lot more options at least, even though with the same amount of power. Though getting that kindling carver down I, really wants to see power here. That would be the the optimal thing. All right, it's another blade pass smuggler instead. It's cost reduced by one thanks to the kindling carver. But if you don't play it this turn, it'll just get discarded. And they're going to grab that Shrine to carve it. So queuing them up next turn for a huge attack. They are going to attack with the Senway Smuggler this turn, though. The nice thing about this attack is that it's, it's a 3-2 Decay. It's either going to trade with the 3-2 on the other side or shrink down the Mother of Skies really small. Either way, it either gets in for damage or makes the board easier for their smaller units to attack next turn. And, uh, you know, even though both players have put a lot of units onto the board, Keith Pellick does have more, and, and that, that will add up uh, eventually, especially since almost hand is pretty dead at this point. They're going to need a lot of help from the top of their deck. So a tough spot, and yeah, just the Senway Smuggler is going to trade off here for almost, and then we'll see a Grenahan show up, going to draw a display of Menace. And hmm? almost... Get a zero cost Kindle Carver is not the worst. <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of a free roll, I guess. It's it's it, it is annoying that it exhausts itself and kills one of your minions. All right, uh, I guess now we'll see a crafty occultist come down. It's going to yeah. bring along some friends, though. Oof. Okay. I mean it. They added a lot to their board. The problem is they just didn't really find anything to use. I guess they can know when to hold them again. If they can go for another crawl, it's going to deal three more damage to them. And what can they bring back? Is there anything that good? I, they can go for this. <laughs> I guess they've sacrificed something this turn. If they get a shrine, how, the attack's pretty big. Oh, all right. Yeah, that 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 is not bad at all. In fact, I, I would imagine they're just going to send everything in, right? Like... They, they have pl plus two in lifesteal this turn. It's better. You you gain more by attacking than you do by leaving them on defense. I guess maybe they don't want to throw away their 3-1 tokens into the, the pair of 1-4 uh, merchants over there, but... Yeah, that's the problem. The smugglers just eat them up. And they have Berserk, so you kind of got to... I mean, they're going to be pretty big attackers next turn if you anticipate Keith Pelly got a shrine of their own. But anyway, we see that uh, almost does have a... I mean, almost made a lot of hay out of that draw. 22 stack. strength attack here with lifesteal. That's pretty, that's going to get almost back up to 24. Yeah, I had to double check your math, you know, but uh, that you, you are you are correct this time. All right. Oh, I love it. Keith Pelleg. So what Keith Pelleg did here was very good. They, they took the hit down to one. They took the maximum amount of damage possible because the fewer units they have that dies, the better, because they have, like you mentioned, their own shrine that if they can get that going, and well, they have a kindling carver, so it'll be easy, that they'll, they'll be able to, to strike back for even more. All right, so Keith Pelleg did find the power card off of the kindling carver, so they could do something here like Shrine to carve it plus display of menace to deal one to all enemies that would kill the carver, it would kill the two grenadines, 
it would pump up these units on their side up to three attackers and with the berserk it's a pretty big hit but is it big enough well they, they could also go get another crawl and, and also play two grenadine drones perhaps i would not get a crawl at one health, oh please. i suppose at one yes that they did, they did go down to one they got a broken contract instead which also also put something into play there so but now the we just have both players just smacking into each other with these trying to carve it boards and we're going to see the health total swing up and down maybe 12, once or twice more. 21. This looks lethal. Let's see. You, you can block. What, what are they going to end up blocking? Because it uh, looks like it almost only has two blockers here. Yeah, you can, you can block a five-strength attack and a three-strength attack. Yeah, and then you take uh, 12, 15. Looks like 24. Is it really? Wow. So Keith Pellet took a hit down to one. Almost went up to 24, then Keith Pelag attacks back for 24. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're if you're almost, the blocks are mostly pretty easy. Uh, at this point, you can kind of just block the Cell Sword and one of the three strength attacking units, maybe the Grenahen, and then everything else is just going to come through. Let's see. Yeah, six in the Berserk attack. Wow! So Keith Pelag <laughs> finds an exactly lethal attack after going down to one taking the most amount of damage they could possibly take to give themselves in a spot where they could attack for as much as they possibly could the next turn. And it was exactly enough that they needed. I mean, th th that's what the shrine does, right? Like, like I mentioned a turn ago, it gives the attacker so much of an advantage that both players want to do the minimum blocks possible and, and the most attacks possible. Turned out the math worked out in Keith Peleg's favor, but you know, almost really didn't have a choice there. I don't think that they, they could have done better by, by playing any differently. In fact, they took what looked like an unwinnable situation and made it into a, a, a spot where they took Keith down to one because they were so far behind on cards. It happened that Keith had the double Grenadine drone plus the no one to hold him plus the shrine and that all added up to exactly lethal. All right, sounds like there's one match left. Phoenix versus Johan Grunt. Let's see what they're up to. Johan Grunt is on Hurukira and I'll get Phoenix's deck pulled up. Well, we'll probably figure out what it is from seeing what's in play. We got a little Huru mirror, Luis's. Johan Grunt is attacking. That's a lot of enforcement. <laughs> yes. We see Lord, we see Rhoda Lord Steyer's adjutant, that 6-6 six, six flying endurance at the top of your screen. That means that the agenda has been completed for Rhoda. And for Phoenix, looks like they're going to need some help off the top. Is Johan Grunt is just cruising along right now. They've got everything going for them. They get a Koryavat Palace now to follow up this other site. Yeah, I don't think a Karya is going to be quite enough here. Because if you if you look also, Phoenix's side, almost all their units are, have, have been shrunk down to oblivion. They're, they're, two of their enforcers are O3s. <laughs> yeah, yeah their, their Hojan's a minus one strength. And even their smuggler is just a one strength. So it's just not really gonna, going, going their way. Whereas everything on Johan Grunt's side, even if it's silenced, it's still burly. All right, for Johan Grunt, they can now go to Koryavat Palace. Be interesting to see which part of the agenda they go for first here. Is it just good enough to go for Sack the City? Is the Berserk attack just going to be that big? Or are they going to do attack like... looks pretty good to me, not having done the map, but I guess plus four, plus four in Endurance is also going to open open some doors here too. I, I kind of think that Johan Grunt is in a position where either of those modes would, would be impactful enough. So Johan Grunt is going to attack. Yeah, I think you can attack with all of the flyers because maybe one of those flyers gets double blocked down, but you'll still have the... They both have now have endurance thanks to the withstand. And for Phoenix, they've got some hard blocks for them. I mean, they could do a little bit of chumping with some of these units that don't do anything anymore, but otherwise their health total is dwindling fast and with a sack the city coming potentially next turn off of that Koryavat Palace, well... They're going to need a lot of help off the top. This turn is also, even as you mentioned, if there's some double blocks, it's going to clear out a lot of Phoenix's units, which means that the sack the city is going to be especially brutal. All right, so Johan Grunt attacking here, dropping Phoenix down to nine. And now we see Phoenix. Oh, they're going to get to warp. <laughs> a Lord Steyer's Tower. I thought they bricked off the top of their deck, but Valkyrie Warp, thanks to the Valkyrie Enforcers, they can play it. And when you warp Lord Steyer's Tower, you can use its agenda for a second time that turn. 
So what's the first part going to be? It's going to be going for those watch wings. We're going to get some 1-1 one, one Valkyries. And then after Styr's Beckoning, we're going to see Curfew Enforcement. Minus one strength to all enemy units. And you can amplify it, pay one, exhaust a Valkyrie to increase the amount shrunk by one. And so they did that two more times. And that basically reduced the strength down to nothing for everything except for that Rota. All right. Well, plans to sack the city have uh, been put on hold, I believe. <laughs> you, you like going for drawing cards? Weird. Uh, well, I, I mean, I kind of wanted to sack the city last turn, though. I think uh, I think that uh, Johan Grunt made a good call e either way. But yes, at this point, it, uh, sacking the city has been delayed. Though I, Johan Grunt is still quite far ahead. War warping there was one of the best plays that uh, Phoenix could come up with. Like that, that was one of the best things they could have seen in their deck. And in fact, even better that they didn't draw. All right, so for Johan Grunt, they play that Janitor Dovid, and it gets to draw a Soldier or Amplify spell from the top of their deck, but there was none. So they just get that 4-4 instead, and now we see Johan Grunt going to make a nice big attack onto the Styr's Tower. The Valkyrie Enforcer will trade there, but uh, Phoenix definitely has some potential to get their own Rota in a turn or two here. Next turn, they're going to be able to play their Ironclad Oath, and then the next following turn, they get a Rota. Yeah, and they, they the 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 Watch Wings give them a lot of uh, chump blockers on on like on route to that. So we see Akira come down, picking up Aegis thanks to the Koryvats Palace's ability. When you play a unit with four strength or more, give it Aegis. And now Bubble, Bubble Shield is the pickup for Phoenix. Not not a very impressive draw here. So Ironclad Oath on the Huru Envoy does mean they get to draw a card. And they're just going to Bubble Shield it right away so they can draw another card. They get a Valkyrie Enforcer. Oh. And, oof, another tower on top. Do you just yeah. warp that one? So you could warp it. Those Aegises are kind of annoying. Um... Yeah, I guess if you don't think your tower is going to survive, you, you you might as well warp here. Since you, you, you guaranteed get some value, and you effectively draw a card, because now you get to draw a new card next turn. Put more watch rooms into play. Yeah. Yeah, right? is it even worth it to go for curfew enforcement? It's like, you get to shrink down all of the units that basically are already shrunk, but all the yeah, ones you want to like, shrink have ages. You yeah, could go for another Ironclad Oath. Ironclad Oath seems like it's a lot better here. Phoenix is doing a really good job of uh, having the top of their deck cooperate, and you know, multiple warp towers are actually giving them a really good shot here. So, what was the pick here? They're running out of time on this turn. They go for the curfew enforcement, and they did amplify it twice. So, it got the rota down really small, which is nice, and. They, after the curfew enforcement, they got to silence the Kira. And yeah, it actually that, that was... made it so they can make an attack here. That's pretty nice. But, you know, Johan Grunt in the position where they have some easy chump blockers. Yeah, both players end up with a lot of fairly, like, useless units in play. Much like our the last matchup we saw, but without any Shrine to Caravet. So they're probably not going to be charging in anytime soon. Deciding kind of who, who to, to toss away here, because certainly you're going to chump block. Just a Hura Insignia off the top for Johan Grunt. Do they have something great for Rhyme Conclave Smuggler? They fire off that Sack the City, but it looks like they have maybe a Janitor Dovid, which as a 4 4 Berserk is going to do something. And, you know, maybe if the uh, if the Hojin gets an Empower, it could, I guess, attack for a little amount. Hojin's going have be. a little attack. This might be late enough in the game that the smugglers are drawing pretty thin at this point. Definitely a possibility. So, like thin I with imagine... like multiple ends, in fact. What was that? Oh, I just said thin with like multiple ends. <laughs> Would you agree? You know, I, I'm i going to just watch the action and see what's going on. So, yeah, Johan <laughs> Grunt started off the game with a Bring to Justice, a Trick Shot Ruffian, a Pristine Light, a Corybot Palace, and a Crown Watch Standard. So, 
it's interesting if they had a uh, a trick shot ruffian still in their market getting that and putting that onto the hojun for the berserk attack would be pretty good i guess they wouldn't have the empower because they'd be putting away the power so then it's not a lifesteal berserk attack well they're gonna go for pristine light <laughs> pristine light is a funny one uh depending on uh, who, whose forces have been shrunk and whose hasn't <laughs> yeah i mean we've seen a lot yeah six <laughs> that's true yeah, Pristine Light, not the best combo with Curfew Enforcement, I suppose. All right, we see a Mayloft Huntress show up, that 2 cost 2-1 two, killer imbue, and it gets to Plunder. Not that you're especially looking to turn any of the cards in your hand into power right now. I'm just impressed that Phoenix has kind of dug themselves out of this hole where they're hugely behind, but I guess uh, warping multiple towers will do that for you. Yeah, so both players are about to complete the agenda on their sites. For Johan Grunt, they're going to get a Svetia Orin of Kosal, which will attempt to block spells for a turn, but will be blocked by the Face Aegis. And for Phoenix, they'll get a Rota, which is a 6-6 six, six Flying Endurance. At the end of your turn, draw cards until you have as many as the enemy player. Well, Svetia also, I mean, this might be a game that goes long enough that you could see Johan Grunt start activating Svetia. Yeah, Cost eight, so it's a pay eight and exhaust. So they're 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 close. That definitely yeah, gets you one power. So meanwhile, we see a big attack going into the site, but not enough to kill it. Just puts one point of damage on it. And now Phoenix running out of time. Can they get off this Mayloft Huntress imbue and kill? They play the Acaria. They use the Acaria and. And the Mayblast Huntress does, in fact... All right, they're going to go after the Janitor Dovid. And so when you kill an enemy Janitor of Dovid, you get two 2-1 two, soldiers stunned. And so you know, that'll, that'll help them in a couple of turns, potentially. Svetia comes down, just gets blocked by Aegis, as you mentioned. Not that it's doing too much right now, anyway. And... Uh... Well, we're seeing an attack back here from Johan Grunt. I wonder if there's an opportunity. Yeah, that, that pristine light really does indicate there's just not that much going on on uh, on Johan's uh, in Johan's market at this point. It's just not all that strong. I, su I suppose that there are some targets, especially like the Mayblast Huntress, but there's not a whole lot else. Yeah, and it's, you know, sometimes with a pristine light, you could just chump attack and then pristine light to rebuy your units, that onslaught draw each unit that went to your void this turn. But they whiff off the Generator Dovid. I mean, these Huru Kira decks are not well positioned to make the most of Generator Dovid. They're really trying to just take advantage of the fact that it's a pretty good tempo beatdown unit, and hopefully that its drawback won't materialize too often or too and too badly. G giving it Aegis is cute, though. <laughs> yes. All right, so Phoenix gets the Rota off of the Styre's Tower. Rota, the second in command to Lord Steyr. And, uh, you know, Phoenix right now has two flyers. There is a 0-6 Rota on the other side. And so I think we're going to see Phoenix here. They're going to imbue the other Mavelov Tuntress. And they're just going to take out the Rota, even at 0-6, just so they can attack. And do they want to put the just this attack onto the site to just... Stop any future Aegises, or are we going to see them go no, face? They're 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 going to go face. Oh no, they're, they're. I guess I guess with Johan being at thirty, maybe they decide just to take the Cordyvot Palace down. But I, I just don't see Aegis being that big of a threat right now. So they're going to sack, and uh, they went down to zero cards in hand. That's one fewer than Johan Grunt. So the Rota drew them a card. It drew them a Silverblade Intrusion. And for Johan Grunt, this looks like the turn that we're going to see the pristine light happen. And we're just going to see them attack with everything. I mean, uh, they, they, yeah, they're, they're, they're going to get a decent advantage out of this, it looks like. Yeah, and they're not going to go after the site. Uh, Styre's Towers no longer has any useful game text for Phoenix, so... And we're going to have to see Phoenix make some blocks. They're probably anticipating the pristine light, so they'll probably be more than happy to do things like just trade your Akaria with that Generator Dovid, just knowing how likely it would be to die anyway. 
Yeah, and as a reminder, both players have access to to full deck lists here, so they they do you know they do get to try to figure out what 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 is going on in the opponent's deck list at this point. All right, Silverblade Intrusion here. Except for Rhyme Conclave Smuggler, thanks to drawing a card by playing it on her envoy, and now for Phoenix. Well, let's see. They they've made their blocks. Uh, Johan Grunt. Not sure where we're waiting on. They could bubble shield something, but it doesn't really. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't accomplish anything right now. All right, and so now we see another Generadovid. It's entombed, just blocked by the fact that Phoenix is totally board capped right now, and Pristine Light <laughs> comes down, kills four of Phoenix's units, and is going to draw one, two, three, four units. That Silence Cure, not much though. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, at this point, Johan Grunt drew a bunch of cards. They're behind on board, clearly, but they, they do have 30 health based on their earlier uh, kind of advantage, which means that even if they take a turn or two to deploy all these units, Phoenix can't get too aggressive or they they might risk dying because they're, they're at, you know, 9 plus 6 armor here. I guess Johan Grunt's got one armor kind of hiding up there as well. All right, so we see a Rhyme Conclave Smuggler for Phoenix. It gets their palace now. Yeah, Phoenix Phoenix looks to be advantage to me, Luis. Yeah, the Corivat Palace is, is a big is a big game. They they had their market had some goods still left in it. The shelves weren't bare. And uh that, that's gonna make a pretty big impact here, even though Johan Grunt has a bunch more cards in hand. Like you said, the Kira's silence, the bubble shield's really not doing much, so and we, we kind of already know, or at least we suspect, that that Rhyme, Con Rhyme Conclave Smuggler doesn't have, like, too much exciting to get. Well, we'll see if that's the case, as they're going to go to the market one more time here. Gets them that Trick Shower Ruffian. Yeah, I wonder if Johan Grunt had something earlier on with trick shot ruffian plus sack the city but they do still have some berserk units i guess they only have eight justice influence and some of their units are pretty small in strength i mean they could toss it on the hoge on here and, and still do a good amount of damage all right we're, we're swapping locations here Oh, that's enough for Johan Grunt. They they have had they have seen enough. Yeah, I bet they just didn't think that they had the goods left in their deck. Yeah, All right. that, that was an attrition battle, and that was a fitting way to end the round here. All right, so for for Phoenix, they advanced to our top thirty-two. So got to see a lot of matches wrap up there. So now we are going to take a couple minute break, and we're going to swap me out for Corey Burkhart, Luis Scott Vargas. You stay where you are, and. We'll be back in a couple minutes with more Eternal Card Game action here at the Stormbreak Open. All right, we got a special treat today. Andrew Beckstrom here and Corey Burkhardt. And we're not the special treat. You guys see us on these broadcasts all the time. But today we have the Eternal World Champion joining us for an interview Lights out, Ace. Welcome. How are you doing today? Hello. I'm doing great. It's always fantastic to be on camera, especially with fine fellows like yourselves. Just to get things started, you are our Eternal World Champion. You won the 2020 Eternal World Championships. Um, so we know that about you, but why don't you tell everyone watching at home a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and really sort of who you are? Okay. Well, I've lived in Wisconsin my whole life. I grew up near Eau Claire and I live in Madison now. Uh, I'm an actuary by trade, but that's a thing I do. Who I am is a strategy gamer. I play lots of board games. I play lots of card games. I play lots of survival horror games. And that's kind of what I do. Who is Lights Out Ace? Where did that name come from? 
So there was a website in the early 2000s with message boards called GameFAQs. Yeah. Uh, back in the old like player's guide days, it was like yeah. hard to find uh, video game walkthroughs and GameFAQs is the place to go. And when I signed up for those message boards when I was, I want to say 12, I thought it sounded really cool. Like lights out is kind of a cool phrase, like lights out, gotcha. And then Ace is just uh, a cool high flying name. So lights out Ace. And then I used it when I organized melee tournaments in college and so the, the, it was just always attached to me so then i just kept on using it as i i mean i'm 31 now and i still use my name i made when i was 12. how did you first get started playing eternal do you remember what year it was and what how did you first hear about the game i remember it exactly it was july 2016 back when it was still a closed beta one of my friends was playing it on his tablet in between rounds of a local magic tournament and he was showing me the one of the really cool things in Eternal is the stat modifications persist between zones. And he was playing a Haunting Scream Dark Return deck. And I just thought that was so cool. And he, he had an extra closed beta key and gave it to me. Do you remember what some of your early favorites were? What were some of the first cards that jumped out to you? You mentioned Dark Return and Haunting Scream. Were there any uh, early closed beta cards that you still have fond memories of? My favorite card uh, was definitely Channel the Tempest. It was removal and card draw all in one. There was a, a quote bot on my old stream channel. And one of the quotes was, I want to find somebody who looks at me the way Lights Out Ace looks at Channel the Tempest. If Channel the Tempest is, you know, the, the first real card that jumped out to you, is that your favorite card? What's your favorite deck as well? My favorite deck is definitely Scrappy Hour. Uh, a deck that I had a large portion in making. I, I'm definitely not the only person to make it. But I'm definitely the one who popularized it in a certain build. Super fun. I love grindy shadow mid-range decks. It's definitely my favorite archetype. If you had our powers for the day, if you had the powers of the Dire Wolf devs and you could change any card in Eternal, what would you change and why? Uh, well, I really miss playing those grindy sacrifice decks. So I try to change something to sort of bring those back into prominence and playability in Throne. Uh, so the card that would probably help the most would be Unfamiliar Interloper, revert the nerf on that. <laughs> So you can play all the factions you want and have an excellent fodder card early on. So you talked about it earlier, really enjoying the mid-range shadow decks. Is that is that your favorite faction? Like, what faction do you say that you identify with the most? Oh, definitely shadow. Uh, if I looked in game, my shadow is at 99, almost 100, and my other ones are like in the high 80s, early 90s, except for fire, which is like 78. Sure. So I'm definitely a, sh a shadow gamer. So battle skills. Do you have a favorite battle skill in the game? And then if you could have a battle skill in real life, what would it be? So my favorite battle skill in the game is definitely War Cry. I think it's super well designed to encourage attacking. I think that the the animation where you see like the little horn and it blows is super satisfying and it goes over your deck and you're like, oh man, like I wonder what got buffed. I sure hope I draw that soon. It's just a very exciting mechanic. I think it's uh one of the ones besides like the stat persisting through zones, or I guess it is an example of stats persisting through zones, just an excellent showcase of the digital only mechanics in the game. Just such a fantastic mechanic. But if I could have one, I definitely choose flying. Cause like, if you could fly, why would you not choose flying? Like being overwhelming is cool and all, but I'd rather just fly. Yeah, I think I I think I would want to have Berserk to be able to eat twice, but yeah, lights out is your, your choice of flying a little bit more effective there. How does Reckless translate to eating? Mm. <laughs> I figure getting to attack twice, I'm just like, well, I'll take one bite out of you, and then I'm going to come back for more. Maybe not the best analogy, <laughs> think of, but that's how I always think of it. Yeah, I'm just going to go with revenge. My enemies aren't getting away with it. Alrighty, welcome back here to our uh, Stormbreak Throne 
5K, we are uh, qualifying for Worlds here. The, the winner of this tournament will be qualified for the 2021 Eternal World Championships. You got me on coverage, uh, LSV, alongside Corey Burkhart joining us for this round. How's it going, Corey? Hey, buddy. I'm good to be back. It's been a few months since we've gotten to do one of these, and I'm excited to you know go through, go through some thrown action here. We're already in the top 32. Yeah, uh, as uh, you know, we, we talked about before the first round, this is single elimination. So it's best two out of three games, but if you lose a match, you are done for the day. So half the field gets eliminated every round as uh, half of them you know, pick up their loss. And that also means the winner of this tournament is the only player who's going to go undefeated throughout the entire day. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. So we lost half our field last round. Of course, they left with tons and tons of packs. You know, they left with their their alternate art moment of creations, maybe premium, perhaps, if they had their master's medallion, they got their two free wins, and that's, you know, just for showing up, just for playing Eternal on the ladder, earning masters in Expedition Throne or Draft, you know, that earns you those premium alternate art copies, those earns you those two free victories that those players got to start with. So if you're not already out there, if you're not already battling in the queues, you definitely should be, because you could easily be battling here on our broadcast on Sundays. Yeah, and an awesome thing about what how these events work is uh, you've got about you know about 24 hours once the queue opens on Friday to play your matches, but it's asynchronous, which means you can kind of play at your own pace. Uh, plenty of players will play a couple matches in the morning, go do what they want during the day, play the rest of their matches at night. You know, you, you hit a you hit a cold streak, you can take take a break for lunch. You hit a hot streak, you can just keep playing, and it's a uh, it's very convenient. All right, our game is up, so we're going to head down to the match because uh, our goal is all eternal all the time. And uh, once we get there, we're going to have Corey tell us about this pretty sweet matchup. We've got Sling of the Chi here in uh, Eater Lux's hands. Yeah, so Eater Lux is one of the players that actually chose to bring Sling of the Chi here this weekend. We see a few different versions of it. We see Instinct, so you might see Time Fire Primal bridging into time, you know, for... Things like Sandstorm Titan, usually additional sort of fatties. You might get some, you know, additional relics there into your deck. We see it looks here. Keep it clean. State straight uh, Skycrag and Cheese City Shogun there on the bottom of your screen. Another even Felm deck. So, you know, getting to the top end there, those Acarias, those Fell Rocks, and a great pickup here in that Granite Hand, Luis. Yeah, so Sling of the Chi, which Eater Eaterlux does have in play, uh, it's a relic that says enemies can't transform your cards, so it gives you a little bit of protection from various like disruptive transform effects. But what it really does for the deck is whenever you play a unit with 6 strength or more, deal 6 to an enemy unit, and at the end of your turn, if you have a unit with 6 health or more, you draw a card. So all what Eaterlux is trying to do is play a bunch of cheap, large units that have various drawbacks, like you see them you know, shift out a unit there, in order to... To, to kind of cheat these units into play and activate Sling of the Chi as much as possible because the two abilities on the Sling work really well together. When you play your six strength units, it starts taking their stuff out. And then when you have your six health units, you start drawing extra cards, which draws you into more units. And one of the things that's going to be really good for Eaterlux here is Feln is not known for its prowess in getting rid of relics. So once this Sling is in play, Chai City Shogun's going to have to take Eaterlux down by killing them as fast as possible or really stopping them from sticking any units, but it's going to be hard to stop either side of Sling of the Chi, much less both. Yeah, and I really love this Tamaris here from Aider Lux. This is an excellent choice here this weekend. Tons of Kindling Carver decks. We've seen that on Menace. In this case, six health unit with Shift. It's going to be protected there in play for three turns. Once it emerges, it'll be able to swing in for four unblockable damage. And all the while, you know, we saw Aider Lux there miss multiple power drops, but just drawing multiple cards a turn here off the Sling of the Chi. They're keeping pace with Chi Shitty Shogun, but, you know, there's there's Fell Rocks waiting in the wings, Luis. And, uh, you know, a lot of players have brought various Fell decks, whether it's even Fell or Fell Midrange or even Fell Reanimator in some cases. Because Fell has a, like you said, Grenahan, a huge pickup for all these decks, just a very strong card by itself. And, a, and it's also fairly open-ended. There's a lot of different shells you can you can kind of put it into. And just combined with a lot of strong cards like Vara or, you know, Ikaria, the first Reaper, you've got a lot of options for a very strong Feln build. And that's why you see a lot of players running it this weekend. And we see, unfortunately, a Shadow Symbol here picked up for the Shogun. They're actually just going to fire off the Dazzle here to stun this Geral. Go ahead and plunder away that into a Sigil here so they can get this Vara Vengeance Seeker down. An important one in this matchup is once you have that unit with Deadly, it can trade off with one of these big units, but 
Aider Lux now being able to actually develop their board a little bit, finally hitting that fourth power drop. I can get rid of that Jarral. I don't really need Jarral ascending here. I'm already churning, gaining card advantage this other way, and now we're seeing Aider Lux start to get in there with this, these Tamarises, and this is this is actually an awesome play here, getting to turn this into a killer unit. We'll be able to take out one of these Varas and stop that lifesteal on Shogun's side. Yeah, also, uh, you know, plunder into another power here. And uh, Maveloft Huntress is another way, you know, if, you, if you're missing a six health unit, it's a way to maybe get a six health unit to play at very cheap cost. Yep, build your own, if you will. See a little well, non bow here between the Champion of Cunning and the Vara. <laughs> Champion of Cunning still a pretty big threat, so Eaterlux is going to have to do something about that. But with that Sling of the Chi in play, Eaterlux does have the long game. Like so, they 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 know that they just need to to kind of do what they can to prolong the game and gain uh, incremental advantage after incremental advantage from their relic. Taking a look here at the marker for Aderlux, as we do see them with that primal etchings in hand. There's a declare victory, a lightning storm, a turn to seed, a savage incursion, and a helio, the skywinder. So if they do want to answer this champion of cunning, now that it no longer has an Aegis thanks to that Vara, they could go ahead and turn to seed it and all the other copies in Chi City Shogun's deck. Is that how they want to spend their turn, though? The Champion of Cunning has already buffed up this Vine Grafter and that Grenahen. Also caused them to not be able to attack with this Maveloff Hunters that has been buffed up thanks to that Mbio. Missing an attack is unfortunate, but I, I don't... I, I don't know how much Eaterlux cares about ending the game. I think that they're they're going to be happy getting that turn to seed, like you mentioned, and I think kind of unsurprisingly just going after the Champion of Cunning that's just the biggest threat right now. Yeah, and the Sling of the Chi just doing massive work here as we see Eaterlux, I think, pick up their fourth or fifth card off of that Sling here. They are falling down to 11, though, but unfortunately for Shogun, another power here off the top, unable to keep applying pressure. And, it, and I think, yeah, I think this is the turn where Eaterlux really gets full control of the game because Chai City, Chai City Shogun is out of action. They have a full grip of cards. They actually have enough power to play multiple cards in the same turn. And uh, they, you know, they're, they, they managed to unshift that uh, Tamaris here. So they're, they're looking pretty good. In fact, they're going on the offensive here with the Mayblock Huntress and the Tamaris. Love it. I wonder if we'll see the Siege Breaker come down and actually get to use the other half of Sling of the Chi here where the Siege Breaker will get to deal six points of damage to an enemy unit. And thanks to that Overwhelm, also overwhelm here onto Shogun's face. Yeah, pop that Grenahen and, and hit Chai City Shogun for an additional three, just in case. Chai City Shogun here really behind the eight ball. They're going to need a huge draw here off the top. Maybe a Grenahen into something like an Akaria. Crest of well, the best I can do is a Crest of Cunning. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Ringer would have been nice earlier on when you had all of the, the spells that you could have used with like those treasure troves, maybe with your plunders instead of making sigils. See that one go to the bottom, and now a Kenna Uncontained joins the fray with a ton of units able to attack this turn, Luis. Oh yeah, Vicious Overgrowth going to take out the last blocker, and I think we're this is actually just going to take out tri City Shogun in one hit. Yeah, and it really... Just a clinic on what uh, the Sling of the Chi is trying to do. I mean, th that game would have gone a different direction. Either Eaterlux drew, what, five, six, six cards off of that? Plus got even got one of the uh, six strength triggers as well? Yeah, it was every single turn from turn four onwards. There was a Tamaris in play, either shifted and protected so it couldn't be removed. Or, you know, once they had emerged, it, it got to attack. It then was imbued with a Mavelop Huntress. And just every single turn of the game was just two cards flowing into Eaterlux's hand as they were able to keep pace with, you know, some of the maybe more flexible, more powerful, potentially Feln units, they were just able to overpower by, you know, leveraging the fact that Feln really struggles with dealing with enemy relics. Yeah, and that's one of the kind of ways you can really get an edge in a weekend like this, is if you identify that Feln is one of the best decks, and they're soft to relics, especially relics that help you win a controlling game, which is usually Feln's jam, then you, you can really end up uh, kind, of, kind of being a step ahead of the metagame. And as we take a look at opening hands here, great opening hand for Shogun. They have that exploit. They have the even-handed goal, and they're getting to go first this game because they lost the last one. That'll give them the potential that, you know, on their third turn, they can go fire off that exploit, make sure there's no Sling of the Chi coming. Unfortunately, at them, we look, you know, at Aider Lux's hand, and there's no Sling of the Chi waiting in the wings just yet. 
Yeah, as it turns out, uh, discard doesn't have protection from top decks uh, is one way to say it. And, uh, <laughs> you know, for, for Eater Lux, they're happy to have their Sling of the Cheese kind of hiding in their deck, waiting to be drawn. Fortunately here for Eater Lux, they do lose their only two drop, but as well, you were talking about, Luis, you can't protect <laughs> against the top decks, and that's a top deck for all of Sunday. Well, an even-handed goal I'm going to come down for Chai City to, to let them redraw a little bit. And they've got a lot of card draw here. You know, the Honor of the Claws, Grenahan. These are all ways to, to get additional value. But uh, at this point, Interlux is also showing off that their deck is actually capable of putting out some good pressure, especially if they draw a Fire Influence next turn to, to maybe lay that, that Siege Breaker. Yeah, as we see the Tamaris come down, clear out that even-handed goal on... Now we're going to see a Vara. We will see Vara join the fray rather than a more controlling Honor of Claws approach. But uh, unsurprisingly, Eater Lux just lets that happen because with double Permafrost, you're, you're really not that concerned about Vara. That is probably the best card uh, to, to answer her with. Most definitely, especially in a deck like Eater Lux's where they they don't actually need to protect themselves with player Aegis. They don't need to use their Cobalt Waste Stones like they might need to against maybe a Time or a Fire deck to protect those Sling of the Cheese. Ooh, but we do see the Grenahan oh. there discard a Fell Rock, which causes a Yotun Hurler to hit the bin, and five more cards at Aider Lux's void here. I, I can't count how many cards Grenahan just drew. You play the Grenahan, you, you you hit a Vine Grafter, and you, you put a, a Fell Rock into play? The limit approach to Infinity, Luis. It's just too many to count. Well, Aider Lux does, does still have some decent answers here. Uh, they are prevented from getting an HS by Vara, but that's not the biggest deal in the world. Snowball here uh, to start picking off some of Chai City's forces, and then Permafrost for the, the Felrock. So a, a pretty disadvantageous turn for uh, for Eaterlux overall. But, you know, their draw actually uh, hit hit a spell there on Etching, so they're, they're kind of clawing their way back into it despite getting three for one off that Grenahan. Yeah, a really rough sequence there of the Granite into the Fell Rock, having to use a Permafrost there on the Fell Rock where Shogun's about to hit all those really awesome six cost units that are in their deck. But, you know, the draw ascending did give a little bit back. Unfortunately, they are going to lose that to the Mavelof Huntress here as it's been imbued up. And now, in honor of Claws, can, can they find another Fell Rock, Luis? Well,. You know, one of the things that we've seen, though no Fell Rock, unfortunately, is without a Sling of the Chi out, Chai City, City Shogun is going to draw a lot more cards on in general. They've got these Grenahans, they've got Honor of the Claws, even-handed Golems. Their deck's really well suited to do this. So Eater Lux, you know, is, is really going to prioritize making sure they have a Sling in play. That's that's what their deck's built around. It's the headliner, and it is as important as you might think. Yeah, and trying to play a little bit into that card advantage game. They go ahead and trade in that Yotun Hurler, thanks to that etchings, to get that Helio out of their market. Potentially draw three cards on the next turn. But unfortunately for them, Shogun over here playing another even-handed Golem, picking up two more cards, and now we'll see this Rindra come down, and that's going to force Aider Lux to discard one of these four cards from their hand. Yeah, well, it won't be the, the Helio or the Power, so I, I guess probably the Snowball or the Siege Breaker if you think you're going to be kind of tied up for, for plays, but Snowball yeah, not, down. Not too worried about these smaller one health units that Snowball can deal with. When I see that Helio come in, find three more cards, but no Sling of the Chi just yet, Luis. Yeah, and you know, even though Chai City has more units in play, they're not very big, and half of them are, are stunned. So this isn't the worst position in the world. Though another Vara to, to to add to the one already in hand means that Chai City is gonna get to to deploy a lot more forces this turn. Yeah, we could see something like a Vine Grafter go into the market. Can't defile any of these units, even though Tamaris was only played for three power because they were played shifted. It'll cost a bit more than that. Yeah, the the way Eater Lux's deck is built, Defile is actually kind of on the weak side because so many of their units, even the ones that you spent three power for, aren't actually eligible to be targeted. Right, real only kills like the Jaral Ascendings and the Mavel of Huntresses. We will see that Von Grafter get that Champion of Cunning out of the market, give it the plus one, plus one in regen from the Grafter's ability, try to protect that one a little bit. All right, some vicious overgrowth is going to come down to clear things out here. Oh, there there's the sling. And now that also means Eater Lux has a very good incentive to not play the, the Siege Breaker this turn to set up Sling plus Breaker in the same turn. Yeah, and, it really has to play to hold on to that several turns back when they were asked to discard a card to that Fellow Rock. 
And that interaction that we saw last game is actually going to come up again where Vara prevents the champion from getting Aegis, which is pretty bad for, for, for Chai City the way this is going to play out. Yeah, thankfully, t because oh, the of that mind crafter, though. Yes. Yeah. One of the reasons why we see a lot of these even film decks, you can put the odd cost cards in your market thanks to these grafters and that champion of cunning, the ability to buff your entire team. Maybe it has an Aegis, and the ability to then put a region onto it. It's just an awesome card to pull out of your market here, and that's that regen's actually going to protect it from a sling here. Aderlux is going to have to find some way. Yeah, there's no way that uh, Chai City is gonna is gonna go uh, for for that for that bait there as the Helio comes in to try to knock the regen shield off. Yeah, especially when they attack with just the Helio and the Tamaris doesn't also come in. You got to be thinking, hmm, what's going on over there? At this point, uh, you might be forced to go after. Yeah, l looks like the the Grenahan to shrink the Maveloft Huntress, I guess, is the is the the best option here. And, and with Shogun here down to eight, and there's no lifesteal units in play, if Aderlux can actually get back to their turn and maybe peel another Siege Breaker, it's possible that they could pull this one out here, Luis. But you know, what does Shogun have in the wings for us? They're going to use this Vine Grafter, go into their market, and oof. Silverblade Reaper. That's going to cause an all-out attack here. Yeah, the, it looks like uh, Chai City was prepared for this situation here. And Tamriz is going to hop in the way of the champion. Siegebreaker is going to block the Maveloft Huntress. This is going to drop uh, Eaterlux to four here. How many spells are in the void? There's Ooh, six. Six in the void. Yeah, enough for Silverblade Reaper to finish things off. And... You know what? That's kind of how I would expect games to go with uh, when a sling of the uh, of the chi doesn't hit the board. Yeah, it was a close affair there. As Ader Lux was able sort of to keep pace with the amount of cards that were being drawn. It was just a matter of they were always one step behind. They were getting down the Jeral. It was only able to get one attack in, but there was an even handed goal and it was picking up two cards. It always felt like they were just slightly behind on these exchanges. And they were playing, you know, these rawly stronger units like the Tamaris, like the Siege Breakers. But the issue was you would see things like Grenahen playing Fell Rocks for free. And then you would have Rindra come down and it was also, you know, attacking their hand. And Aderlux just slowly fell behind, wasn't able to actually get enough pressure onto the board. And really looked like they were maybe one, maybe two turns away from closing out the game there. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Permafrost is a great answer to Vara, but... Chai City has a deck that's capable of drawing many, many cards, and that that's going to give them access to to more stuff than uh, Eaterlux has, unless they're also drawing extra cards. And that's kind of how these matchups come down, because neither player is really beat down. They're both just looking to kind of win mid range slash controlling games. Yeah, it, it is one of those where while they're not beat downy, every point of damage does seem to matter in this matchup as we head here into game number three. See if Aderlux can start off. Aderlux looks like a slime. redraw to me. <laughs> Five power yeah, yeah. or Tamriz is not going to get the job done. All right. All right. There's the sling. Let's just hope, you know, hope for no exploit here. Can we see Shogun keeping a pretty solid hand here of multiple Vine Grafters? They've got that Akari at the top end to start answering any of Aderlux's big threats. Maveloff Hunters maybe can tag team with the unit on Imbue to take something out, but there's no exploit in that hand, Luis. And you know, you know what card's great once you've got Sling going? Permafrost. It's a way to convert one power and one card into an answer. Oh, a second Sling is going to make life really difficult for, for Chai City here. And uh, Eaterlux, now they're, they're actually on the hook to find units. But yeah. given the fact that they have two removal spells, yep, and, and there we go. They're, they're, they're not that hard-pressed. You know, They've got plenty of time. They're going to play a Sling. Next turn, they're probably going to play another Sling plus Permafrost or... Maybe Vicious Undergrowth, but probably just getting another sling into play is, is going to work out well for them. Funnily enough here, though, this Kenna Uncontained, much more effective when you've actually deployed some other units to play for her ultimate ability once you hit with those five units getting to draw a card. The issue here is she doesn't actually enable either of the abilities on the sling, so Aider Lux here actually still a little bit away from getting to you know maybe take out this vine grafter or whatever it's you know granted regen onto and they're not going to get to draw any cards just yet and they're 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 going to choose not to use the killer attack 
because of that regen shield. It wouldn't really accomplish a whole lot. And, you know, Kenna's nice. It fits nicely. Uh, doesn't die to, well, it's going to die to this Mavelof Huntress, but it, it, it doesn't die to either Defile or Annihilate here. Combo there with the Vine Grafter suiting up the Mavelof Huntress, able to give her plus one, plus one in regen. That allows it to take out the Kenna Uncontained. And unfortunately for Aetherlux, again, they're just finding another Vicious Overgrowth. <laughs> Little ways to deal damage to the enemy player, finish off their units, but this doesn't match up well against all these regen units that Shogun's brought to the table. Well, Permafrost on the Mavel of Huntress is a pretty nice little combo because it does leave the other Vine Grafter locked down under the Huntress's ability. So that, that kind of takes out two units, but that champion's coming down, and this time it, it is looking likely to have Aegis, though I guess Chai City's a, a little short on power here. Yeah, a little short on Primal Influence is another Permafrost, maybe not exactly what Aerolux wanted, but, ooh, that's a big draw though, Luis. Well, the Permafrost is good on the Vara, so that, that gives uh, Aerolux something to do. They really just need to draw Tamaris. If they can draw a, 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 if they can draw any sort of unit, actually, they might just be, I was going to wonder if they were going to consider double Vicious Undergrowthing the Vara here. Now that there's a VAR in play and you can't get uh, Aegis, it, it seems like running out the, the champion could be a good uh, a good maneuver, but here, here, here they decided to just deploy multiple units this turn instead. Yes, we see that reappropriator. Thanks to the VAR clearing out the player Aegis that Aerolux had, was able to steal one of these Sling of the Cheese. So we're going to have to see double Vicious Overgrowth here fired off. First one, break the regen sealed. Second one, finish off the reappropriator. Give me that back. Fortunately, you're a depleted sixth power. Yeah, Chai I think Chai City is going to be able to beat the two slings because not once this game did either ability trigger, or at least not so far. Yeah, we're going to need to see a big draw here from Mater Lux. And okay, that's a redraw, but it's now going to need to be basically a siege breaker, I think, to stay alive here. There's a siege breaker. So they've got multiple slings going here. Right, so you could fire off, what, one at the Grenahen and kill it, and one at the the champion to break its regen shield? Unfortunately for Edelux, this it, this won't activate the backside of it, so they're, they're not going to end up uh, drawing an extra card or two extra cards this turn. So they're going to need to survive one more turn here, but Ikaria First Reaper is going to make that pretty difficult. Yeah, it looks like Aetherlux is going to get one more turn here, Luis, but I don't know what they can draw facing down a really powerful flyer here in Akaria. The entire team gets buffed up, and a Caleb's Choice is going to be Aetherlux's final draw here of our throne open. I mean, this is this is the downside of running a synergistic deck. When things work out, like in game one, we saw Sling and a Tamaris, the, the whole game was smooth, right? Aetherlux just ran away with that game. The, the second two games, Edelux didn't draw Sling and lost Nutrition Battle. Then game three, draw double Sling, but didn't draw the second missing part, the, the second component to it, and ended up losing to, to Chai City, who was playing a deck where all their cards work, right? They don't need to draw any particular combination of cards. All their cards kind of just do their thing. So that is, uh, you know, some, sometimes the danger of running a Synergy deck. When your Synergies come together, you're punching above your weight class. Your cards do more than they normally do. But when you play a, a very consistent deck where all the cards are good, just a deck full of good cards, well, you don't really need to draw a particular combination in order to win the game. Definitely. And yeah, it was one card away. There are multiple turns for Aetherlux to get back into the game. At any point, they had just, you know, they hit a Tamaris, able to draw three cards each turn. Maybe they end up hitting a Siege Break for a couple turns earlier, maybe able to break up some of these things like, you know, the Vara and being able to hold on to that Permafrost. We could have played a different game, but unfortunately for them, they're going to have to exit in the top 32, as it looks like we're going to be able to join Captain Team Bro and Sunnyvale in game number three. Love to see both these players competing on Sunday as usual. Yeah, it is difficult to find a Sunday where we don't find these two excellent players not duking it out, and here they're going to have to fight up against one another. As so we see Sunnyvale on their trusty Huru Kira strategy, as we see them use that Justice Etchings, get the site out of the market, and withstand on the Hojan. Going to give that endurance to help protect it here. Yeah, so they've gotten the Corybot Palace down. T Captain Teambro playing even Feln as well. Uh, but you see, well, 
get, getting their mind grafter on here. Pull up Team Bro's market here is Sunnyvale's likely done the same as you brought up Lost Ren Luis. All of our competitors, we don't want to have anybody be at a disadvantage for being on our broadcast, so every player in the tournament is able to see everyone else's. So we'll see them, yep, they pick up that Edict of Makar, and that can clear out either of these blockers and enable Captain Teambro here maybe to make a great attack as a really heads-up play here, using that Maple of Huntress, plundering away one of these units into a power. Now they get to fire off the Edict. The Huntress mm. finishes off the Dovid, but they are one point of strength away from finishing off this site. Yeah, and that is going to let Sunnyvale kick things off with the Wisdom of the Elders, and they found a, a Valkyrie Enforcer, so Sunny's going to gonna have a good turn this turn and uh especially with that Ikaria play multiple things in fact looks like they have enough to Ikaria pump all their Valkyries and then play the Enforcer here yes yeah, Sunnyvale here with multiple flying units they're unlikely going to be able to protect their site here into the next turn we will see them use the Ikaria as you said pump up the Valkyrie Enforcer but with all these justice influences, and we have seen this before from these these Huru Kira strategies, Sunny is building up enough justice influence that maybe they can try to make a one shot potential here using their market. Sunny up taking a look at their market. They do have that trick shot ruffian in there. Fortunately, no way to go get it just yet, but they do have multiple flyers in place, so they're they're up against it here. Yeah, deciding what they want to silence here with this Valkyrie Enforcer. Uh, choosing what between the Vine Grafter and the Maveloft Huntress. It's tricky because if you silence the Maveloft Huntress here, you make the Grenahan back into attacker. So, yeah, we will see Sunny use that silence on the Vine Grafter. Even though it's already used its market ability, that does disable the regen. Also, the, thanks to the palace, both of the, the Sunny's units have Aegis, so Sunny not too worried about uh, opposing spells, but that second uh, Maveloft Huntress there is going to be a real problem for Sunnyvale. Yeah, Aegis protecting from spells and abilities, and however, does not protect you from killer attacks. Captain Team Bro here just thinking, well, do I want to go into my market? Maybe I want to give regen to this Mavolf Hunters before I use it. Determining the time is now. They're going to go ahead and use that Mavolf Hunters. Pick up the Valkyrie Enforcer. And and they, they really didn't want to tap down their 4-5 uh, or five Mavolf Hunters because they wanted to be able to get attacks in with it. Though, at this point, if they want to kill the Koryvok Palace, they actually have to send in multiple units, though, at this point, you could just send in the even-handed golem as well. Yeah, but Captain Team Bro here, it looks like valuing... Nope. Thought they were going to value every single one of their units, maybe give Sunny the choice of, hey, you can you can sacrifice your Akaria Valkyrie Captain block my Mavelf Hunters to save that site, but instead, nope, values, hey, I just need to get this site off the board, and we see the Vine Grafter here play, but a Hojan picked up for Sunnyvale. Not the best follow-up at this point with so many ground blockers on Captain Team Bro's side. On the other side, Sunnyvale's at 33 and Captain Team Bro's at 13, and Sunny does have a 4-3 flying Aegis Endurance, so that's not bad, though. A a another even-handed Golem here is likely to give Captain Team Bro the gas they need to pull through here, and, and in fact it does. And Akari, the first Reaper, and a Mavelop Huntress coming off the top, Captain Team Bro's going to have a pretty good time over the next few turns. I guess can't quite cast uh, Ikaria yet, but that Huntress is going to do a great job of taking out Ikaria. Two absolutely huge draws here for Team Bro. We're going to see an all-out attack here. And this Mavelof Huntress will be able to finish off this Ikaria. Captain Team Bro here trying to figure out, hey, maybe do you have a Silver Blade Intrusion? Is there something... Something waiting for me. Am I going to get got? Nothing there on the attack, so they're going to fire off this Mavelof Huntress. Assume we won't see them plunder away this Dazzle. Rather hold that up maybe to stun something. And yeah, trading off that Mavelof Huntress. And a pretty heads up play there, getting to ready actually their Vine Grafter, thanks to Imbue. Yeah, oh, no, also no, no real need for an extra Primal Influence at this point. Definitely. Huru Envoy, but 
nowhere to go with it. And ooh, a Felon Insignia. That is going to unlock Ikaria. The reaping will occur, and that Ahu uh, Anvo is not long for this world. And then now you see the, you know, that, that 33 health is going to drop down to zero very quickly uh, under this kind of onslaught. That's been just two turns, and Sunny down to 17. They find the primal etchings, but it's a bit late here as Sunny no longer has a flying unit. Already use that Croviet Palace. They do have access maybe to a pristine light, but they wouldn't be able to make any attacks and enable the onslaught. It would take out Ikaria and a Mayblock Huntress. That's better than nothing. But yeah, having to ha having to exhaust your Hojon here is a pretty big cost in this case. So it looks like Sunny might just be going for an attack with Hojon instead, getting that lifesteal in. Yeah, we're going to see that attack, and it'll just break the regen shield. No block there. Captain Team Bro with the Akaria. See on their own turn, Dazzle here. Fire that off for Treasure Trove. And heads up line there by Captain Team Bro as they find another even handed golem. <laughs> also, that Dazzle is going to stop that uh, Justice Etchings from doing its thing. So. Sunny falls to two here and fairly hopeless here, draws a, a justice symbol, and I think that'll do it for Sunnyvale's run on this Sunday here. Yeah, Sunnyvale gonna bow out here in our top 32. Congrats to Captain Teambro advancing to our top 16. They're even found deck here. We'll take a look, see what other matches we might be able to find. You know, the boxer was in game number two at the point in time at which we joined Captain Team Bro and Sunnyvale on action. See maybe if they're still in a battle. Talk to me, Luis. What has been your favorite deck that you've seen so far today? I really wanted to 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 see uh, Popo Tito kind of advance there with the eccentric officer. Uh, I think that would have been a lot of fun. Um, I really liked my favorite part of the deck was the uh, the ability to play eccentric officer and then use the crown watch to go get a one cost unit and hope that <laughs> hope that there was something to get with it because there likely would. You know, the odds are that that would work out. So I was sad to see exploit kind of ruin Popo Tito's hopes and dreams there. Yeah, we almost saw that they got it out of the market, they had the player Aegis, but then just everything crumbled in that one moment, and then getting it discarded from their hand. They had they had everything set up, though. They had the influences, they had the Crown Watch Press Gang. I was excited for that moment, and then just to watch it all fall apart, you just, you know, see Gerga, or not Gerga, sorry, you see Puppetito drawing these Kairoses that are actually still 9 costs, and it's like, hmm, this, is, this isn't part of the plan. <laughs> I also thought Eater Lux is a sling of the chi deck that we just saw kind of go well, we saw we saw unfortunately get eliminated but I thought that deck was pretty cool because the kind of interplay between getting to put you know units that have like pretty you know high strength or, or high health into play and kind of cheat those into play is is an interesting puzzle to solve and here we see Gurga PM exploding so that's not good for them with <laughs> RNG <laughs> taking the win here uh the, there are a lot of found today so it, i'm kind of interested in the decks that have a good match against found because in order to take one of these things down in order to to be the winner right you have to finish first place to qualify for worlds you usually have to have a a, a good matchup against the most popular deck because you're going to face it usually a couple times on your way there so interesting to see who brought uh you know a, a deck that that has a good matchup against Feln, which has has I think the highest density of good cards and, you know, like we, we mentioned earlier, not as not leading quite as much as synergy on synergy, though, of course, its cards do work together well. Just it relies more on raw power, and it's interesting to see what players have brought to combat that. Yeah, and we saw their RNG evening up the score against Gerga APM as we'll be hopping back down into a game number three here in just a moment. But to, you know, key off of what you were saying there, Luis, yeah, it's... It's sort of this weekend is the story of we've got even Feln and we've got this sort of menace, Praxis Trove, Sacrifice, like a, a mid-range sort of combo deck, if you will. And it's really, okay, if you're good against one, maybe you're not good against the other. 
can anybody actually find something that's really good against both of these decks? Because if, if you've got that in your arsenal this weekend, this is the weekend for you. All right. Well, speaking of these decks, uh, we've got game three between Gurga PM and RNG ready to go here. Uh, Gurga PM going first and uh, yeah, so solid hand here uh, with, a, with a whispering wind to start out with. Yeah, a hand that I'm a really big fan of here. Double film painting, start off with the Whispering Wind, use that banner, maybe get the Trove down. Fortunately for them on RNG side here, we do see that exploit, and they might be able to break up this Trove as we talked about when we were watching Sling of the Chi. The Felon deck's really weak to enemy relics. They can steal it with Reappropriator out of the market if they're playing that, thanks to Vine Grafter. Ooh, but... Respect here for the Whispering Wind. We're going to see RNG choose to annihilate that, but no undepleted power for Gurga APM. Yeah, they, they would have loved to have an undepleted uh, fire influence there, but uh, a second Whispering Wind is going to come down, and that's just going to going to leave RNG in the same situation again. Do you want to cast Exploit, or do you want to just deal with the Whispering Wind? And I would say most players are inclined to deal with Whispering Wind before it attacks, and you see RNG choosing to do that as well, just because giving your opponent value, everyone's just allergic to that. Yeah, the ability here to discard one of these powerful units into the void, immediately get it back with a Kroll. Don't want to see that on RNG side as they'll play that Mave off Huntress. Trade off for the Whispering Wind as we now see the ability here. Maybe you play a Praxis Trove, and we will see that out of Gurga rather than playing maybe the Grenahen this turn. Yeah, I, I like Gurga PM's uh, you know priorities here. You really do want to get that uh, that trove down to start getting value out of it, and it also does play around exploit. An exploit, which by the way, RNG has never really had a smooth place to play the card, and I don't even see it getting played over the next couple of turns. It's still going to do something this game, but right now it's 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 kind of lacking. And uh, ooh, the Senway Smuggler here going to get that open contract in order to not only kill Vara but also start uh, you know we're working on uh, Gurga PM's plans as well. Yeah, but they are going to pay a cost here for that open contract. The ability there where it reduces the cost of each unit in your opponent's deck by one. I mean, that is the price you pay for getting such an efficient removal spell. We might see that pay dividends here is with exploit in hand for RNG. They can use that, plunder away one of these cards, and now play that Rindra. And Gurgia PM is going to be on empty, Luis. Well, one of the, the disadvantages of open contract here is that the earlier you play it, the worse it is for you. And in fact, RNG got to use their turn very efficiently here as a result. It's got a huge turn there for RNG, but a nice draw for Gurgi APM is they pick up a Devour here. Unfortunately for them, they haven't gotten the first step going uh, on their Praxis Trove here. So they would really love to to have that have that on before uh before they they they, they go too deep here but I, I don't think they have a choice they're very low on on resources so i think they're going to have to even devour away something good potentially yeah really needing to find a grunin and drove or a kindling carver here to start off the trove chain and you also kind of don't want to draw devour you, you really want to play it off your trove if you can <laughs> most definitely yeah whenever you're like all right play my kato you know, get that totemite, immediately eat the totemite with devour. It really feels like you've, I mean, you've built sort of a masterpiece there. And unfortunately for Gurga, they're going to hold on to this devour, but now they're going to pay a little bit of the cost here, Honor of Claws. And we see even more of these units now with reduced cost from that open contract be picked up. But one funny thing I did forget about of the open contract, each of those even-handed golems there turned off there are odd cost cards oh yeah that, in no, rng's that, deck that that's a really good point even-handed golem this is a, a a kind of sideways hate card against even-handed golem <laughs> still a one cost grenahan that's that's a real good deal yeah one cost grenahan keep another one on top keep keep them coming if you're rng you've got to be pretty stoked about this as now you're just a single shadow influence away from you know starting to spam akarias and with access to exploit in hand, you got the grant of hand on top. Maybe that can find another spell. This render is hitting for some real damage. Yeah, uh, Gurga, Gurga PM. This is the second time we've seen this, right? Where uh, kind of a fell mid range deck beats a synergy deck that just kind of fails to get its synergies off the ground. And here you see a Praxis Trove that has done nothing this game. Grant of hand there, not building with enough damage dealing spells as RNG as we see that Annihilate fly directly into the void. That one can't be picked up by the Hen. 
but look at this turn. Thanks to that open contract, you know, RNG got to play Grenahan, Vara, in a Vinegrafter all on, on six power. Yeah, and without a unit in play to sacrifice, and another trove here picked up for Gurga APM. Not, not, a, so not a treasure trove. Yeah, so exactly. Close to greatness. Okay, so a second trove comes down, and they are going to deploy that banner. So Gurga APM basically setting up here saying, hey, if I can hit a one cost unit, I can go to town. Unfortunately for them, they are going to lose this display of menace, so we're going to lose multiple redraws here as that that last Rindra drawn out of RNG's deck, and now they're going to cash in this exploit with no enemy hand. It's looking rough here if you're in Gurgay PM's shoes. They've got basically one draw step, and it uh, does not look like that's going to do it here. I suppose sure. they're not. Let's see, nine... 13. The painting is going to give them an extra health here. But at this point, even if Gorga PM draws, draws the perfect cards, I don't even think the two troves are going to get them out of it. I think if RNG has access to an edict in their market, they can go ahead and use this fine grafter. Of course, you can just go with the exploit that you already thrown in there. That's a spell played. <laughs> yeah, Render is yeah. pumped up. Plus four, plus four. And RNG is going to advance into our top 16. All right, we're down to top 16 already. Let's see if we've got more matches going on here as Gurga PM uh, has to be content with a top 32 this weekend. Checking in here with our producer, trying to see if there are any more matches in progress. Got one left, Luis. The Boxer and GS Midtech Leech. How do you think you pronounce that one? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hold on, let, let me let me let me let me go see exactly what it's spelled because while I, while I take a look at their deck list as well, <laughs> and and I'll, I'll report back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'll check out the box here. here. Oh, uh, G Schmid, G Schmid, Cleach, G Schmid Cleach, Schmid Cleach. All right, so G Schmid Cleach. What are they battling with this weekend, Luis? G. Schmidt has got, uh, it looks like another Menace deck with, uh, you know, Grenadine Drones, Gust Riders, uh, Praxis Trove, you know, Kroll, kind of uh, know when to hold them. The, the, the same deck that Gurga PM was playing here and that we've seen a couple times. Uh, well, again, one of the more popular decks and uh, battling against b b the Boxer on Feln. So uh, it looks like uh, this is going to be one of the classic battles that we're going to see kind of going on here as uh, the Boxer... Well, this looks like a pretty close fight, but I think G. Schmidt has a lot more to work with here. Though even a, even a nerfed Blight Moth good enough for the Boxer in this in this matchup. Yeah, the tables turned here as we're seeing, you know, attacks made, Trove come down, Gust Rider, that procs the Trove. Get to play no one to hold him. The Gust Rider here gonna draw two, pitch two. No one to hold him, gonna find a broken contract. We see this come up quite a bit from this deck is once they get ahead, Using those no one to hold them to keep finding those broken contracts, the ability to, you know, play one of those units that can potentially proc the Praxis Trove in a pinch if you need it to. Additionally, you know, getting a 4-1 unit, maybe you can pump it up with, with the trying to carve it. I mean, that's six points of charge lifesteal damage potentially later down the road. Now puts Boxer in a really tricky spot. They do have access to this Blight Moth, which looks absolutely awesome here for their sake. But how much can they afford to attack in with? Yeah, the, the problem I'm seeing with, the, with with Blight Moth here is it's good on board, but a lot of what uh, Schmid has going on is, is that Praxis Trove, and they've got a lot of cards in hand, plus multiple Devourers. So they, they, they're going to be in a position to, to draw more cards and be able to proc Praxis Trove more times, which is going to continue generating value for them. Heartbreaking situation here for the boxer. Your opponent has two of those soldiers out, and he can't actually use Blight Moth here to attack the soldiers. Too worried about what Kindling Carver can do. As we see a no one to hold him, it's gonna go get a crawl. That's gonna go get back one of these smugglers out of the void. That's gonna proc a three cost spell off the Praxis Trove. Display of Menace being the option, and then looking at uh, what they've got, it looks like they're gonna. 
kick things off with a devour on that gust rider here Oof, no undepleted power that, that could that's have what they're looking for <laughs> yeah getting getting that shrine down this turn would have been would have been a beating so actually it looks like uh schmidt's gonna wait here because they just they don't want to they don't want to trade off their four ones you know until they've got that shrine going and they can get a bunch of health out of them yeah, to worry about potentially trading off one of those soldiers into the Blight Moth and then it being able to kill two more of the units with its with its corrupted version is a huge turn here for the Boxer. Grenahen discarding a Fell Rock. The Fell Rock gets to come down. That's an additional blocker. And now the Boxer gets to play a Vara. And yeah, this is a huge board able to block a potential Shrine to Carve it. And, you know, has the Boxer actually stabilized her, Luis? Are they actually in it? Uh, they, they 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 managed to put a lot on the board here. I'm still worried about these troves, and G Schmidt has access with uh, the smuggler to, you know, the, their their market here. Open contract, probably gonna take out the Vara here. But as of right now, yeah, I mean, this is part of the the downside of the the prax or the the menace deck here is you end up sitting on a bunch of like one health units, and that blight moth actually looking like an excellent call this weekend for the boxer. Really heads up deck building. We see this basically each and every time we have the privilege of watching the boxer in one of our events. They end up showing up with, you know, these lists that are pretty well teched out, pretty well prepared for what their opponents might be up to. And you know what we don't see very often, Luis? We don't yeah. usually see Krull actually played full retail version. It's looking like that's a possibility here, though. The, 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 maybe the smuggler is going to have something to say about that. <laughs> one crawl turns wow. into another and that's 14 damage the g schmidt is taking here they are gonna now assemble the way to sacrifice sack off one of these grunted and drugs and find a <laughs> lumen shepherd love it love it L lumen shepherd being played in decks that effectively can't cast it awesome but this is all a, a grand plan that g schmidt has they, they moved a bunch of crawls around they took 14 they got their kindling carver and now they, they got their Shrine to Carve it going, and they're going to uh, attack back and gain, what, 20, 28 health back here. Uh, though they are going to lose quite a bit of their squad. Now the issue here is this is actually going to cost them every one of these units on this attack is going to end up trading off. What, and you now, gained 28, but what did it cost you? Everything. Yeah, everything. <laughs> <laughs> and it, the Blight Moth even going to be able to take out that Kindling Carver here. And this sets G. Schmidt down, to, down basically to, to ground to square one, but... Yeah, they did get a lot of health off of that. I will say that. Oh. And that silver blade. G. Schmidt may have just gained, you know, 20-something points of health, at least. They've gone through a lot of their deck, and Praxis Trove helps you burn through some of that. These Grenahens are discarding parts of your deck. I, I, God, look at the, look at the respect the boxer has. They chose not to attack with their fell rock, just out of uh, out of fear of that shrine popping off again. Yeah, and this is the boxer saying, "Hey, if I was able to live through that big onslaught that last turn, I think that I can get through anything that you're capable of. I just need the time." Oh, look at this! Crawl swap, swap for crawl, swap for crawl off of these smugglers. This is awesome. That you're getting every smuggler out of your market back as you swap these crawls back and forth, paying a lot of health in the process. But the the big finish here is going to end up, uh, you know, possibly getting that shrine going here. Let's see the crafty occultist here. Ghost comes down. We don't see a sacrifice outlet found, so the shrine to Carvet's not going to enable a massive attack here. But we did see yeah, three smugglers there picked up. That was just such an awesome rebuilding of the board. But is this for 14, Louise? How, how much Ooh, we'll does find out deal? 12. 12. Okay. Uh, unfortunately for G. Schmidt, they, again, no no way to get the, the, the shrine on here. And it's going to be pretty difficult. They do have that Gust Rider, so they're, they're, but they are going to have to attack first in order to get their cards off of it. And their health total's really low now, so they won't be able to pull off any sort of Kroll shenanigans this turn. That whole Kroll engine is is pretty devastating, though. Oh, most definitely. The ability to chain off smugglers like that, exceptionally powerful. As we'll see Gust Rider come down, draw two, discard two, pitch away two sigils, painting come down, Oculus, last card in hand, don't have anything to discard, no worries, pick up two more cards. 
And a crawl on four <laughs> power. And crawl is going to finish the game. You, you know, you live by the crawl, you die by the crawl. And G. Schmidt, I, that's the most crawls I've seen t uh, today, right? They, they, they got to activate crawl five or six times, including three in the same turn. But uh, that last crawl in a fitting end for G. Schmidt's run here. They're going to have to to be content with the top 32 as the boxer moves on to top 16. Congrats to the boxer. Unfortunate there for G. Schmidt. As you said, out in our top 32. But that is our last match for the round, Louise. So with that, two rounds in the books, 16 players remaining. One of these 16 players will be joining Lights Out Ace at the 2021 Eternal World Championships later this year. Stay tuned. We'll find out who it's going to be. Turning our attention to your World Championship run. Uh, so... Taking it back to ECQ Strange Lands, do you remember the deck that you qualified for to get to the World Championship? Oh yeah, it was that classic LOA go garbage. It's the big uh, grindy shadow mid-range deck that can play the game forever. Uh, at the time, Tazmu was the best card in Expedition, so it was a, a super shadow heavy. Like the only justice sources were eight duels, four seat power, and one justice sigil. You qualified pretty early on in the year, back in uh, January of 2020, and then had to wait quite a bit of time before the world championships and in that time period uh what did you do to stay sharp and start getting yourself ready i mean that's kind of a big big ask is like you now know that you have all this time to make sure you're at your best to try to win a huge tournament yeah mostly what i did is just freed up some weekends like the only tournaments i played from then on were all the quarterlies uh because i, I had like uh 75 points whatever it is to get by so it's like a pretty easy shot into the top 64 from there. So it's like really high chance of getting into top eight and winning more money. And then I played one more ECQ with Skycrag Chonkers, which is a deck that I had was involved in the development of, and I really loved that deck. That was the only other ECQ I played. So for the World Championships, it was a two, a two format tournament last year, Expedition and Throne. And in Expedition, uh, you brought Skycrag Sling. Can you talk a little bit about that deck and what drew you to playing it? Yeah, so Sling was the obviously most powerful card in Expedition that I think that whole format revolved around. And there was a popular list at the time that was FTP, which we really hated. It just like it had a really inconsistent power base. It played a lot of cards that we just thought were absolute garbage, like Guardian of Spring. That was a huge trap. Because it ever died, you were just so far behind. It could never block again because your opponent Eye of Winter. Uh, so we trimmed it down to just two factions. We added better cards like Torgov uh, and Geminon. I think we kind of misjudged it. The TJS deck that uh, several people brought was definitely a really bad matchup for us. Uh, but we didn't focus that much on Expedition since top eight was thrown and more of the Swiss rounds that mattered were thrown. Like you could make top eight without winning a single Expedition if you swept thrown. So we spent probably six times longer on thrown than Expedition. We just found a deck that was good enough that we liked and we just played. You guys had just an absolute breakthrough performance. Everyone who was playing this Time Justice, or sorry, Justice Primal Splashing Fire Control list, a pretty close to unit list. You guys had Genev Merchant and Jotun Hurlers. Uh, do you, who was responsible for most of the development of this deck and what went into tuning it? So until two hours before registration, so like for us, it was the deck was to do at five o'clock on Friday night. And until three o'clock on Friday night, we were going to play this even Xenon deck that was heavy time uh, for Twin Spiteling. Uh, I put the deck on Eternal Warcry like after the tournament. So they'd be like, this is what we almost played. And it was like very heavily teched for uh, Elysian and Kira, which we thought were going to be popular. At the last minute, we're like, why aren't we just playing this control deck? Like the Xenon deck is great if the field is exactly what we expect. If there's anything we don't expect or like anyone plays control, Xenon is never beating control. And we had played a bunch of the control deck earlier in the week because like the first thing you want to do is just write it off. Just be like, all right, Yetis is going to be a popular deck because it's the best aggro deck. And it just gets completely smashed by can, uh, it just completely smashes control, right? It's like control is unplayable and we played it and it's control one every single game. Like it just beat Yetis over and over and over and over again. We're like, hmm, okay. So like control actually can't, does beat Yetis. So like maybe we can play that. But then we just kept on working on Xenon until right before the tournament. We were just like, you know, does anything actually beat this control deck? It beats the mid-range decks. It, it beats Yetis. 
uh, if you draw Stormhold Knife, it beats a Legion. And so we just registered it and uh, well, it really worked out. Do you remember who was responsible for Savage Incursion, how that card ended up in your market? That card just, it was seemed like such an important piece of technology to give you more action against enemy sites. Let's see, I, I'm pretty sure he pulled a random list off Warcry, uh, probably from like the Burgund or somebody who uploads a million FJP decks. So we just kind of took that list off Warcry and probably changed three or four cards and then redid the power base uh, with uh, such master touches as a single Huru Vow as uh, an extra justice source. <laughs> <laughs> so you go through this whole tournament, you end up making it to the top eight, you end up winning the tournament. What's the first thing you do when you win the tournament? Well, I went out of this back little computer room into a living room to tell my wife, who was taking care of my son at the time, that I had won the tournament. And she was tired and she said, finally, let's go get some pizza. So <laughs> I got in my car and I drove to, Pop, to uh, Papa Murphy's and I got a couple of pizzas and I came back and I baked them. <laughs> So it's oh, not oh. running around your room screaming, <laughs> jumping up and down. It's, all right, babe, we can finally go get pizza. I, I probably had like an emphatic like, yes, and uh, like stood up uh, sort of thing. But there wasn't a whole lot of running around screaming. There was mostly getting pizza. And then while I was in the car, then I was just like, you know, I'm the world champion. I'm pretty great. <laughs> are there any matches or memorable moments that are going to stand out to you from that world championships? I, I think the the most memorable match, the one I think about the most, is the semifinals against Collector, who is, I think is the most fearsome player in the game, besides myself, of course. Like, <laughs> he did, like he won an ECQ both years. He made top four of both world championships. He I the ECQ that I won back in January, I beat him in the finals. And then I, I played him in the top sixteen to get into the top eight and again in the top four. Like those matches are all super close and super intense. Uh, I remember I thought I was super far ahead in one game and then he dazzled two honor of claws and then suddenly he had more cards than me and I died and it's like I can't believe I lost that game uh, then I ended up winning it was super uh, relieving and exciting to have, to have won that match. All right, welcome back to the booth. We are here for the round of 16. I'm joined now by Corey Burkhart. Uh, Corey, you did a round with Luis. We got to see the top 32. Well, what happened that round? It was crazy. We had a little bit of everything go on. We you know, started with Sling of the Chi, and it was able to start with a really awesome Star Wars Tamaris and just overpower one of the even Felm decks, but then fell in games two and three where it wasn't actually able to get all of its things to come together. Then we jumped into... You know, Sunny Vale falling with their Huru strategy up against one of the Menace strategies. And then we sort of saw a back and forth between Feln and and Menace there, where each one took down a following match. And, you know, it's it's turning into the tournament of Menace and Feln, Andrew. And which side do you want to be on? Yeah, I'm excited to see. Um I mean, for this round at least, we're gonna get another look at one of the Feln decks. I I, I love the way that these found decks are built and there, there was a couple different variations some players aren't even some aren't some players have the sort of the fell rock unstable form package for this round we're going to be checking out synesthesia and their even found deck they're going to be going up against netscape navigator oh sorry excuse me the other way around synesthesia is on i believe there are yeti's player Correct. and we got to see actually both of these players in round one win both of their matches in pretty dominant fashion uh the big addition to yeti's the one is that we haven't maybe seen in one of our tournaments is the buff to Mask Maker. Now a three cost three three. When it comes into play, you choose one of your units. It gains its types, and then you get to it gets 
plus one, plus one, all those types. But it sounds like that game is ready, so it's time for a round 16 match here at the Stormbreak Open. All right, kicking things off here. We've got Synesthesia at the bottom of your screen. They're on that Skycraig Yeti stack. Unfortunately, they're not going first, as Yetis love to do. They're going to be going up against Netscape Navigator with a couple of nice-looking two-drops in their opener. Yeah, and unfortunately, also for Synesthesia is they're actually down a card. They started here on six cards with that redraw, and, you know, a little shaky here on their influences for that Champion of Fury as a Grenahen's going to join the fray for Netscape Navigator, putting that roadblock in the way of these Yetis. Yeah, that one three lifesteal body does tremendous amount of work for them, even if they don't necessarily get the uh, get the unit or spell off of it. But you know, if you build your deck right, you can make it pretty reliable. See a fearless yeti joined the fray, and unfortunately here for Senestio, they're also going to have to potentially face down maybe Vine Grafter or a Contha this turn, and. Yeah, now you've got a one three lifesteal body and this two two regen body. Not exactly where the Yetis want to be when, you know, they already had to redraw down to six. They were going second, and now, unfortunately, it looks like potentially missing this third power drop here. Yeah, Granahan and Vinegrafter can't hold up against some of the bigger units in the format, but against the small stuff, if you have a go-wide board, they are just fantastic with their ability to come up the works. As we'll just see the Fearless Yeti there break the regen shield on the Vinegrafter. Deploying extra Yetis here onto the board first and foremost. If they draw power here, you can get down that Mask Maker. As you were talking about, Andrew, that buff now down to three cost to potentially buff up all these Yetis plus one plus one here on their next turn. But unfortunately, we'll see a Mavelof Hunters here come down. That's a 4 3 killer. We're going to see that eat up one of these Yetis. Yeah, it's going to take out the Snowcrest Yeti. It's nice to get rid of the Aegis one and to just eat. You take care of business while you sort of have the opponent with no power up. They can't do anything like play a Blazing Spalvo as a fast spell. Meanwhile, uh, Evenhanded Golem lining up fantastically against Yeti Spy. And Yeti Spy is just, it's just the best free roll in the world when you're on the play. When the opponent doesn't do anything, you just get that 1-1. One, one. It infiltrates, draws a card. When you're in these kind of spots, it can be a lot rougher just because you don't uh, you can't necessarily get it through. But here, Synesthesia doing a great job. They're going to manage to get it through just through uh, just through using a couple of removal spells there. You know, they're not trading for value, Corey, but they're hopefully trying to regain some kind of primacy on the board. Yeah, trying to gain some amount of pressure here. Want to try to get the board state to a spot where this Champion of Fury could actually pressure, maybe deal four, eight, 12 points of damage if they're fortunate enough. Still, unfortunately for Synesthesia, though, unable to actually hit the influences required to give that charge to give that overwhelm to give it the plus two strength and still lacking the third power for this mask maker so while they have this board that is actually going wide and contesting with what netscape navigator is sort of put in their way unable to actually deploy these units in time yeah the found deck does a really impressive job now of playing with a lot more units than we're maybe used to seeing i mean i just remember a couple months ago when last time we were watching Feld in these tournaments, their decks were just like Honor of Claws and just Mono Removal Effects. And those just don't line up as well against something like Yetis, which can really go wide to the board quite quickly. But you put down a nice little 4-3 in this form of this Mayblot Huntress, this 2-3 Rindra, which is, could grow up to a 6-7 lifelink. I mean, fantastic stuff. Yeah, you usually think of removal spells and you're like, oh yeah, that's the perfect thing I want against the deck that's full of like 32 units and, you know, eight emblems that are going to make all these additional units. But yetis are a lot more formidable. They're a lot more textured than that. Certain units survive, certain of the removal spells. You have a sight in the works. You have some Aegis units, as we see Sin here combining up a Torch and a Permafrost, again, removing all of the units on Netscape's side. Able to pressure through for two points of damage. Unfortunately for them, Netscape has now reached that six power territory as we're going to see double a Kantha and a Vine Grafter here join the fray. And Andrew, I'm not loving their chances here up against six Shadow Influence. No, and the Akanthas are going to now add even more to the board. Once you have enough Shadow Influence, when you have four Shadow Influence, when Akantha is sending attacks, it plays a 2 1 elf. When you get up to six Shadow Influence, it gets plus two, plus two in flying. And, you know, let's not even worry about how big things get out of control once it gets up to eight Shadow Influence, where every time it hits, it makes the opponent 
sacrifice a unit because that's probably not going to be necessary this game is two Acanthas make two more 2-1 elves and boy you know what I, this just looks like this game has fallen completely out of grasp for yetis yeah a little slow to get onto the board unable to cash in those spies early enough to draw cards they were finally able to deploy the bask maker but i mean we're talking three turns too late more or less as you see these yeti pioneers now being drawn in the seventh turn of the game yeah, and Sin's just going to pack it in and hope for, hope for a better start here in game number two. Yep, being on the play will definitely help them out in this best of three matchup. They'll get on the play this game, and then if they win that one, Netscape Navigator will be on the play for game three. Uh, you know, I mean, I it's one of the things that Yeti's really excels at is getting to play, you know, those Blaming Salvos, Permafrost, Torches on units to remove them as blockers. And it really does do a good job of removing units quickly. The thing that makes the Felon deck so strong is that with these Grenahens now adding to the mix, they have so much more ability to being able to play something to the board that gets them another card. So even if it gets that Grenahen gets torched and it really does need to get torched, they still have something great to follow it up with. Yeah. Going first here, however, they are going to be in a spot where maybe if you have that fearless yeti on the second turn or maybe that yeti pioneer you can follow it up with a mask maker or a thudderock masterwork and sort of pump up one of those units able to brawl in past what the grenahen might be able to block that maybe the grenahen's just nothing more than a speed bump here for netscape navigator maybe you know they're going to need more in their defensive arsenal to actually keep up with the yeti aggression yeah and i, I like I'll, I'll, the one card I hope that we'll get to see is Thudrock's Masterwork show up for Synesthesia. The way that that one can add to the board presence, remove a blocker, but also provide some ongoing advantage is nice. All right, for Synesthesia here, you're definitely going to keep this opener. Once again, doesn't have the third power, but a lovely little start with a Skycrake Insignia into a Snowcrest Yeti, and then potentially being able to follow that up with some nice-looking two-drop options. In addition, they've got a Permafrost early removal. All looks great. How about the Felon deck, Corey? An amazing hand here for Netscape Navigator. Maybe you don't have all the removal options that you would like, maybe in terms of those Annihilates. Maybe you'd want an exploit potentially to play on your second turn, but Grenahen, Vine Grafter, you've got those two resilient two-cost units. You've got sort of that top-end threat, a second Vine Grafter on the top, and you've got the three power here to start off. Solid hands for both players. So they went for Champion of Fury there, Corey. They could have just followed that up with two more one-drops. That was an interesting little early decision they had. Yeah, not having access to a Thudderox Masterwork, not having access to maybe something like uh, the Mask Maker. You know, you, you can't draw it on the next turn. You don't have access to the third power either. Sin here thinking, hey, I just need to apply as much pressure as quick as humanly possible. I have this Permafrost. I know I'm getting through six this turn. I know I'm going to get through six the next turn. And getting to follow it up with another Snowcrust uh, Animus here, like, you've got eight strength, and Mask Game Navigator is already down to 14. Yeah, definitely uh, Definitely got to be a little bit worried about their how their health total is slipping away here. See the Grenahen fish up another Grenahen here. Doesn't have access to two additional power even after playing this Blazing Salvo, so we won't see, you know, a Mavelof Huntress, a Seer, or an Ice Bolt, or anything like that come out of the market just yet. Squad goals here for the Yetis, and it drops Netscape down to 10. Yeah, we're going to see really go wide here. Two more Yetis join the fray. But it looks like Netscape has the tools here to defend themselves. They have this Grenahen. Can they discard a Felrock? Felrock to hand. Unfortunately, didn't see anything else. So they do have to draw that Felrock and a Vine Grafter here. So, you know, defenses are put into place. Ooh, but a third power here. For Synesthesia, they have Ice Bolt, Caleb's Choice, Torrential Downpour, Seer, and a Mavelov Huntress. Yeah, those are some real options. Hmm. Fortunately for them, I mean, they would be jumping for joy if they had access to a Thudderox Masterwork here, being able to stun one of these units out of the way, forcing the other one to need to block. No way to pump up all of the Yetis here. They need to find a way to keep as many of their forces around as possible. See the Blazing Salva here break that regen shield. We'll see a Seer picked up. 
That's going to finish off the Grenahen. So we're going to see the Yeti Spy stay home. No, Yeti Spy is getting in there also, trying to drop Netscape Navigator here maybe down to four. This is a tough decision here for Netscape. If you block the Yeti Spy and go to four, I mean, just on the board, you're still dead. You need to get something else down and into play. You have the ability to in your next turn, but if you trade off, you do allow Sin to draw an extra card, and you'd be at five. So they choose to eat up the Yeti Spy and not let Synesthesia draw an extra card here. For Netscape, yeah. Oh, look at that, Thudrock's Masterwork. That's I... the dream draw. <laughs> Here's the great thing, Corey. Netscape Navigator's got a Dazzle, but if you just play a one-cost spell, Dazzle can only negate spells that cost more than one. So that fend-off, you couldn't negate it. Not that it would have been enough, but forbidden okay. research. All right, maybe we can discard enough fell rocks. <laughs> only one. Wow. So Synesthesia ties it up in one game apiece, but that would have been wild if they had managed to hit a second fell rock there for the fast put one into play. Yeah, you get two into play there on the discard, block both of the snow crust, go to one. The issue is then you still need to stop the site. All of your units are stunned. You're on one. Net Netscape had the ability to potentially come back there. They needed to, you know, really get lucky and, and hit that extra fell rock to even start the chain. But they were really close. And look at the cards that Netscape played that game. They played double Grenahen, double Vine Grafter, and they were going to get to put a Fell Rock into play in their fifth turn of Forbidden Research. And that was not enough to stop the Yetis. And that wasn't like the dream draw of like one drop Yeti, Yeti Pioneer, play Thud Rock's Masterwork and play a one drop Yeti and maybe bond it into a Pock Pock. Like it wasn't even that insane. It wasn't the dream draw that Yetis, Ooh, you know, you could sleep thinking of. Look at this hand here now that we've got from Synesthesia. They, they've they got a seven, but the first play is on three, and so they're going to go down to six. All right, they've got a Blazing Salvo and a Champion of Fury. I guess if you could only draw one unit, I, I guess Champion of Fury's got to be at, towards the top of your list. Yeah, but you have these two Diplomatic Seals, and they don't provide influence until you draw another Yeti. Okay. Okay. Everybody take a deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> the Diplomatic Seals are online, and you look at Netscape Navigator's hand, Andrew. This is this is a sketchy sort of seven up there. That's a Grenahen, some power, and basically nothing else. No, it looks perfect. No, it's definitely <laughs> uh, Sans definitely got some issues. You're not wrong, Corey. Grenahen fixing the curve there finds that that Rindra. And that, that was a great pickup here for Synesthesia. Find that Thud Rock's Masterwork. That can move some blockers out of the way. Pump up these Yetis. You didn't have the one drop. But you will get to deploy... I assume the Pioneer here this turn. Yeah, I mean, if you play Champion of Fury, you can attack with it as a 3-1. But, like, the Granahen will be more than eager to block it. So now for Netscape Navigator, they could just play this Mavloft Huntress and... If they want to get really greedy, Corey, they could just pass the turn after imbuing and not block. But uh, I, I like I like just taking your money and cashing out there. Yeah, anytime you're given the opportunity against Yetis to try to eat up one of their units before they can combine some synergies with other Yetis, if any sort of, you know, the pump effects that we see out of Mask Maker, Thunder Rock, Masterwork, you got to take those moments. And Netscape Navigator not giving Synesthesia any resolve here. Is now two vine grafters are going to join the fray, and the defenses are now up for Netscape Navigator. Yep, these are just hard units to get through. The vine grafter, one of the best units that we saw from Empire of Glass at First Shadow, just doing a tremendous amount of work in this matchup, in particular against Fire Aggro. Not a All bad right. pick up here, though. Yeah, it's interesting where you go to solve your problems because the permafrost. It, the Mavloft Huntress is bigger than your sort of damage removal, but man, Permafrost such a clean answer on a Vine Grafter. Yeah, you also have potentially Masterwork here, throw a Snowball at one of these Vine Grafters, and then Blazing Salva to finish it off. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Start with the Fend Off here. Assume then we'll see the Permafrost to 
protect the site. That's going to have to stun down the other Vine Grafter. And oh wow, she's going to get aggressive. Guess I guess if you're playing the Yeti's face is the place. Unfortunately here though, we will see the Thudderox Masterwork fight the dust. It always hurts yeah. my soul a little bit to, you know, have to sacrifice Mount Slushmore. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. It's tough to protect it when your opponent's just playing with some units that can stick around. It only takes one point of damage, one attack to get through to kill it. So sometimes it's just good to cash in. For Netscape Navigator, though, they've got great six drops coming. And they like to not go for Ranger. They're first going to go into the market with a Vine Grafter. That champion of cunning, and it, they have all the influences on locks. So that is going to be Aegis. That is going to be pumping their team. This other Vine Grafter is going to be unstunned on the next turn. Fortunately here for Sin, picking up another power. Yes, they're just going to have to contend themselves with playing down this Ice Elemental. Oh boy, Andrew, that is a uh, a big and well protected champion of cunning here. Yeah, we call that the we call that the lock there. You vine yeah. grafter up a champion of cunning. It got Aegis thanks to having five primal influence, and then the vine grafter giving it regen just means she, it's going to take a lot of work to get through it. Now, synesthesia did have a plan, I suppose, and I don't know how much of a plan this is, but Maveloft Huntress. Um, you know the problem. Here's the problem, Corey. The Blazing Salvo it knocked off the Aegis, but it didn't never dealt damage. The Regen's still there, right? And so now we actually didn't actually get anywhere. And you know, a Aegis just takes precedence. It's it blocks it blocks the spell from trying to do anything to your unit. It blocks the damage. So then the Regen never get needs to get used up on the Blazing Salvo, and what is typically quite a reliable sort of one two for the Yeti's deck of. Yeah, Blazing Salvo means I can just deal with any unit because I'll be able to pop its Aegis against this setup. It just it just doesn't do it. And what a what a tough little hole that the Yeti's deck has dig, dug themselves into as Netscape Navigator is now going for the Dezo's office. Seven cost Shadow Sight, and it gives all of your units lifesteal. And with Champion of Cunning pop it, pumping their strength at the end of each turn. Oh my gosh, Corey. I don't know. I don't know what Synesthesia is gonna be able to do about this. That's already one of those things, though. The health totals are close. It's 19 faces, 13. Obviously, the Champion of Cunning here is going to come take a bite of Synesthesia down to 11. They're going to choose to also take the hit from the Maveloft Hunters down to 6. But, yeah, you, you tack onto it the ability that, yeah, how about this? Buff my entire team up, and the whole team will have lifestyle on the next turn. Yeah, the Torch isn't going to do it here. Too many regen units on defense. Even if all of your units get through, it's not like this torch all of a sudden is going to deal five damage. Two of the Skycrag beaters bite the dust. <laughs> torch for good measure, just to let you know where you stand. And that's game navigator going to win this match, advance two to one over Synesthesia into our top eight. And you know, give uh, give Synesthesia a lot of credit there because. Given how tough that game was for them, being on the draw, being on six, going against all the bevy of problems that we were describing there, getting them down to eight as their final health total, kind of impressive, you know? If they have a one-cost Yeti, that game could be totally different. Right. It would be a completely different ball game. All right, so we will see the Felon deck advancing to our top eight and you know this is a this is a real nice round to win Corey. obviously you want to win the last round but making it into the top eight means you get a share of the cash prize pool colacoma and watch wolf are about to go to game two we've got watch wolf up a game let's uh check out what we're playing do you know off the top of your head remember what watch wolf is on Corey? yeah so watch wolf is playing sort of a old school menace take they're playing you know strange burglar mother of skies combust Definitely in the Menace Sacrifice space, but we're not seeing the sort of combo here with no one to hold them and crawl. They've sort of kept it simple, kept it more structured, if you will, where there's, you know, less of these haymaker, crazy powerful swings. But the full set is trying to carve it, so they still have that really powerful sacrifice engine ability to make big swings in the health totals. But for going crawl and just leaving that in their market, 
On the other hand, Colacoma is one of the few players here this weekend sort of playing even Xenon. So we've seen this before. You got your Arcana Mauer glasses to go with Kotra the first seals to help accelerate your power. You sort of got, you know, your spore folks to help discard all those of the void, accelerating Duvara Fate Touched, Azendel, uh, Akaria the First Reaper. But again, sort of just built around that structure of exploit, even handed golem, and send an agent sort of as that initial structure, with Vine Grafter giving you access to a market with a varying cost of units. So we see or cost of cards, we see, you know, Banish, Silver Blade, Menace. Grasping at Shadows, which combines nicely with some of the things that we're seeing, like the Spore folks help discard things into place. And, you know, maybe we'll end up seeing something like a, a Pale Rider's timepiece come into play. That'd be cool. All right, it's time for the game. Let's head down to the action. All right, so this is game two here of this match. And we have Watch Wolf up a game here with their take on the Fire Primal Shadow Sacrifice deck. Both players are playing with Grenahan this weekend. Definitely the breakout card of the new Stormbreak set. And yeah, so one thing, Corey, is that there's a pretty greedy splash going on in Colacoma's deck. Four Felm Vows, one Primal Sigil, two Felm Paintings is the Primal Influence. But one uh, way they can get to it is that if they use their cop discard some a Primal Influence and then use something like an Arcanum Hourglass or a Katra, the first seal, to play that power from their void. For Colacoma, they, you know, they've got a exploit start and they're gonna do a little plundering here will they just turn that grand end now they're gonna ditch the spore folk and hope that they can someday get primal influence for watch wolf gonna kick things off here with a little kato action that two one's gonna bring along a little totemite later on that that uh the kato might be able to bring along an eight eight giant if there's enough units in the void yeah we see one of the sort of tech options here this weekend for colacoma three copies of aramot's designs in their starting deck generally something where you know, you're playing this even-handed golem deck. You're forgoing the ability to play one-cost cards, forgoing the ability to play three-cost cards. You can generally fall behind pretty often early on in these games, and Aramoth's design is one of those great tools to, you know, give you the ability to sort of keep pace with what your opponent might be doing in the, op the opening stages of the game, maybe against something like Yetis. Is additionally, here against Watchwolf, they're making a bunch of one, maybe two-cost tokens with, you know, Grenadins and... Uh, soldiers and the cloud snakes that Aramoth's designs can clean up every single one of those. Yep. For Watch Wolf, they've got some uh, some cute little synergistic cards, and you know the the Raven there can be sacrificed into a one a zero four can be sacrificed into a one one flyer. But they don't have much to go with it right now. There's no shrine to carve it. There's no sort of strange burglars or kindling carvers. So. Gonna need some help from the top of their deck as they play a Nesting Raven. And ooh, all right, so Colacom has got an Aramot's designs. It would kill it would kill all of their units, but I think that might be what they're queuing up here as we see all of the units attacking. They are pretty far on influence right now from that Katra, the first seal in hand, still lacking a second time in fourth shadow. Yeah, if, I, if I'm in watchful seat here and I see all of a sudden the spore folk is attacking into my own my zero four nesting raven on top of well the grenahen's already attacking i'm i've got to be assuming that an aramot's designs might be coming and this is a pretty wide board that colicum is really happy to sweep up against any potential sort of strange burglar or set up to a shrine on the follow-up turn yeah one unfortunate bit of business there for watch wolf was that since they didn't sacrifice the nesting raven to make a one one raven they could have sort of had two bodies for that card for like future kato value but they didn't, and instead they're just going to draw more power as sort of both players are getting bricked until Colacoma rips a Zenith Silex that will turn on that Katra the first seal. Unfortunately for Colacoma, not a ton of units in play anymore. Had to already fire off that Aramont's designs, but they will get to play a Crest here out of their void. They'll send that Akaria packing is already have one in hand, still an influence short of it. And in a, in a really fancy spot here, Andrew, where, you know, power you... could draw. What a huge draw from Watchwolf, picking up that Strange Burglar. They got to sack that Totemite, turn it into three cards, and now look at them. They went from having nothing, Corey, to now they've got the Strange Burglar in play, a Kindling Carver in hand, and a Display of Menace. So they're about to gas back up into this game. Yeah, two great refuel options there. Only one power in the void, unfortunately, for Colacoma, But that is their eighth power. That does turn on the ability to get this Azendel down as 
We see that Aramon's designs fired off. Move the Nesting Raven out of the way and a big swing here for Colacoma. But yeah, the refuel options available for Watchwolf and a Combust in hand, ready to go. Where are they going to take this turn? So the Crafty Occultist shows up, summon, discard two cards from your hand, draw two. Since they discarded a unit, they get a 1-1 Gretadin and might see a little Combust take out a Katra. We're going to see a trade offered up from Katra to Strange Burglar and Colicom is going to take it. We'll see how happy they are after maybe a Combust comes down. But you know what? They've got an Azindal and, and an Akaria, the first Reaper in hand that they can play next turn. That was a cheeky little attack there by Watchwolf saying, hey, I just discarded a Kindling Carver. I'm giving up all of my card advantage here. Do you want to trade off for my Strange Burglar also? And yeah, Colicom, it takes the trade. But now, when Akato actually picked up. So we're going to actually see Watchwolf here, Stan Pat, just look to block this Katra and maybe sacrifice whatever they block with the, the display of Menace here. But yeah, Azendal's going to join the fray. So now Watchwolf's got to plan out their their against this Zindal here because you know you, you could use maybe the display of menace to kill both of the Helisi, those one one deadly unblockables. Really, the dangerous thing here is that a Zindal's text when one of your units hits the enemy player, steal and draw the top card of their deck and reduce its cost by two. So basically means that as long as the Zindal's in play, Watchwolf is going to do everything they can do possible to stop a unit from hitting them. Yeah, this is a really tricky spot because you fire off this display of menace. You have to figure out whether or not, hey, do I want to block and try to draw two more cards? I just want to kill these two Halisi with it. The very last moment here, we'll see Watchful block with the Grenadin. Pick up two cards, and wow, those are two excellent cards to pick up, Andrew. No doubt. Mother of Skies plus a Combust means there's a lot of potential cleanup we can see onto the board. Dangerous thing, though, is what Watchwolf doesn't know about. That copy of Varfei touched in hand for Colacoma threatens to do tremendous work with that as Zindal should it end up in the void. Yeah, and one thing that we haven't seen yet for Watchwolf, they're now building out their forces. They're able to go wide on this board. We see the Kato get fired off to that combust. We'll probably see this Kato shade cashed in, get another gladiator. But the thing that they're sort of missing here, they're missing the shrine. They're missing the way to turn these, you know, powerful turns that involve sacrifice outlets into these massive swings and give all these units that they play charge in that same turn. And yeah, with that Azendel in the void now, Andrew, as you called out, this Vara could add dozens of, <laughs> of units to play so quickly. Yep, Vara. When you play Vara, you can bring back a shadow unit, and whenever you play a shadow unit, you get to bring back another unit from your void. So Azindo comes back. Azindo plays two more shadow units. That brings back the Katra and a Grenahan and all kinds of goodnesses, and Azindo is picked up, and I saw a Katra go to the void. So all kinds of great things happening right now for Colacoma as they play another seat. Their Katra surge, gaining them health, growing larger. We're going to see Katra here trade with a giant. Two Halisi are going to get through deadly unblockables. And for Watchwolf, uh, they're going to need to... Man, it, this is a... I don't know what they can do from this spot because it's just... They want to be able to go wide on the board, but Colacoma sort of outdone them by with the Zavara Zendo combo. Yeah, if their window hasn't already closed, it's going to close after this turn. They Okay, the Shrine to Carvet, huge draw. You can now play... The Combust, the Shrine to Carve It, and the Oculus here, but you know, you're going to get to pick up two more cards, but you're only going to have two power available. And I mean, look at the blockers that Kolokoma has. You have these two Hulisi, you have this Vara, you have the Azendel, you have a 9 7 Katra and the Grenahan. Like, that's six units on defense. How are you actually going to be able to push through all of this? See Watchwolf here go deep into the tank, trying to figure out, okay, what can I actually do? Like, how can I actually put Colacom on the back foot here? Starts to sacrifice in the ground ahead and taking out the Azendel. Here comes the Oculus. That's going to make another Claw Snake as the first multi faction unit played this turn. We see a Grenahan picked up. Yeah, I guess the one sort of area that Colacoma isn't dominating the game is, is in the air, so. This combination of Mother of Skies plus trying to carve it, allowing Watchwolf and Avenue to make progress on the board. 
The big thing, though, is how long is that line of attack going to hold up if you just keep getting hit by Azindals? Uh, fortunately, they did get an Azindal off the board. Since Far brought it back, it does have Void Bound, but the second Azindal in hand means there's a lot more about to happen for Colacoma. Yeah, I think Watchful's going to get the bad news here. They they had the ability to maybe take out the Vara, but then there were the four Halises combined with the Azindal. And yeah, we'll start with Look at this display of menace that I stole from you. What wouldn't it be a shame if I killed all your your shrine to Carvet over there? There we see Crafty Occultist into an Azindal. They they nice little play there of using the Crafty Occultist to discard the Akaria, so that way Azindal could bring it back, and it's now going to kill the Mother of Skies. So remember how we were talking about through the air might be a viable plan for for Watch Wolf to continue to apply pressure. It's not really looking that way anymore, Corey. Well, yeah, Colacoma now has the biggest flyer. <laughs> they have the Azendel in play. I mean, heck, they actually have two of the biggest flyers out with, with an Akaria and the, the Crafty Oculus in play. And, hey, let's just discard some more cards for good measure with that Spore Folk. Alisa Lisi will get in. May as well attack with Katra for good measure too. We've already already got enough sort of surges to gain some health that way. This is Colacoma, I think, at this point, kind of putting on a bit of a show for us. See all of these cards here picked up from Watchful for Grenahan and Nesting Grave and Combust. All of these cards are free to play, Andrew. Yeah, this. This, this game has gone from being kind of close. Once when Watchwolf had hit that Strange Burglar, it looked like they might have a shot to... Not not so much, you know? <laughs> not, not something we get to see come up often either, is play the Nesting Raven I stole, get a Raven, which is a Feld unit. Oh, I played a Shadow unit from my Vara. Go get another unit out of my Void. <laughs> Well, if Watch Wolf's got a miracle in their market, it's the time to go grab it as they pick up a Blight Pass Smuggler. But... Let's uh, take a peek. We see that open contract, an urgent missive, the Dark Purveyor, an Edge of Uprising, which would be fairly cheap, and then that Kroll. So Kroll's going to be the take, but that's six points of damage upstairs at Watch Wolf. I don't even know what unit you can get here out of your Void that you've played this game. Like, I guess you can get a Strange Burglar back and maybe draw some more cards. Yeah, I mean, Strange Burglar has that ability that when you play it, it gives all your units plus one, and it sacrifices something to turn on any sort of sacrifice synergies, but... Yeah, without the Shrine to carve it and the way to life still up a, a huge attack here... Okay, we do see the broken contract. No now we could play the crafty occultist. We can ditch the contract and the crawl, get a granite in, draw two. There's a shrine. Maybe next turn there's something, but I think. Oh my goodness. Looking at Colacoma's hand, I mean, if, if we could just remove the two. If we can remove the two cloud snakes, which it looks like we can with combust and nectar of life. We we would have the ability to just hit for lethal this turn. The only question is for Colacoma. It's like, to what degree do you want to use your removal on these flyers? Are you confident that there's nothing left in the tank? And you know, by playing this Akari uh, and going after the Cloud Snake, that's a big declaration from Colacoma that you don't got it. I'm gonna kill you right here. Yeah, they I mean, taking a look here at Watchful's deck. There are no one cost fast spells. So Watchful's gonna pack it in here down on the board well not done on the board just yet but they are going to lose all of their ability to block in the air and then they will be dead on the board as Colacoma will even us up one to one all right so for watch wolf they'll get to be on the play and you know it it definitely seems like Colacoma has the late game to some degree i mean it's one of the most powerful closing moves in eternal is play of our with an Azindo revealed in your void and then that gets back two more things and Sort of all of the ways that Cola, that Watch Wolf can go wide with their Katos and do powerful things with trying to carve it. It's just not going to stack up quite as well 
So really, we're going to look to see Watchwell try to capitalize in the mid game where maybe they've been able to combust a key unit away. But before we get to that sort of ultimate end game that Colacoma has access to. Yeah, we're going to, like you were saying, you have to see Watchful sort of counter punch here. If if Colacoma ever, you know, uses all their power, makes some big play, Watchful's got to make a stand there somewhere in the mid game, like turn six, turn seven, turn eight, and make one of those big trying to carve out attacks and try to get the game over with before we can see, you know, Colacoma take over with the Grasping of Shadows out of their market to get back Avara, set up those Azindal turns or you know, naturally sort of get there through your Arcana Hourglass and Katra and accelerating via discarding power into their void. I think once we see Colacoma start getting to play things like Azendels and Varas, where they can just make enough blockers that Watchful can't actually get through and reliably have successive attacks turn after turn after turn with that shrine, that's when Colacoma is going to take over the game. So we're going to have to see Watchful sort of close it before that happens. All right, so both players are getting queued up here for game number three of this top 16 match. Whichever of these players is going to win a share of the $5,000 cash prize pool today. And we will see which of them gets one step closer to punching their ticket to the 2021 Eternal World Championship. As a reminder, the winner today gets an automatic entry. But one of the things that we're doing with this year's season of Eternal Organized Play is we're making it a easier for players who put up consistently good finishes to make it to the world championships. If you make it to the top four in any of our opens this year, if you make to multiple of them top fours, but don't win, you still get an entry into the world championship. And additionally, just making it to the top 64 and putting up good finishes will make you more likely to qualify for our last chance qualifier at the end of the year. So upping the rewards for the players, the sunny veils of the world, the, uh, the, the ones who are just here with us every Sunday for our tournaments, just always showing their mastery of the game. Yeah, my first thought was the Gurga APMs. I feel like every single weekend I watch Gurga and it's just like, is Gurga going to make the finals again? Um, am I going to be watching them, you know, fight for their world championships? Yep, yeah. so we'll see. We definitely wanted to make sure that, you know, obviously in any given tournament, it matters if you can actually win or lose, if you can close the deal, but... If you're somebody who's showing up here very late in the tournaments consistently, well, that sounds like somebody who's earned their seat at the table for our world championships. As we await the game three of this match here, uh, just a reminder, there will be an expedition open in a, just a couple of weeks. April 16th to the 18th, we've got the next 5K open. It's going to be an expedition open, and we'll be getting to see what kind of impact Stormbreak has had on that format. And We'll be looking forward to bring you all of the action. Same time, same place here on twitch.tv slash direwolf digital. Make sure you are following this channel so you get notified for all of our tournament broadcasts. Yeah, that'll definitely be a blast. We haven't gotten to cover Expedition basically since the World Championships, Andrew. I'm excited to see what the, the players have sort of come up with. You know, how has Stormbreak really shaken up the metagame and see who can take that one down and you know join whoever wins today and lights out ace at the 2021 yeah the the big championships and if you are looking to do better in these events so if you get if you hit masters in the same month as an open or in the previous month when you sign up for an open you get an act you get a master's entry into that event and what that means is you start off the event with two buys and you get four premium copies of that month's promo so a great deal all you got to do is hit masters in any format the month of or the month before and pretty soon you'll be able to see that status in your profile screen for watch wolf 92 and colacoma this is game three their tournament lives are at stake here in this game as watch wolf is carefully evaluating this two power opener Corey, they can lead off on a grenadine drone into a couple of nesting ravens and with a shrine to carve it on turn three this promises to be a really aggressive opening but instead, they're going to go down to to their next hand. This is a seven. This hand was worse, Corey, let's be honest. But you don't want to go to six. Yeah, I definitely don't want to go to six up against a deck like Colacoma's with things like Aramot's design, the ability of just, you know, raw card advantage through all those even-handed golems, and the Katra is getting back all the power they might discard in their void. But this is, this is a rough hand, Andrew. This is, we're asking a lot. 
Yeah, and this is uh this is it's tough how you play this, Corey, because you could just go diplomatic seal, gain fire influence, play kindling carver, sacrifice. But how many cards in your deck could you actually play, even if their cost is reduced by one? If you don't play it, you lose it. And then if it, you pass it back to Colacoma and they just have a removal in hand, well then you just lose the kindling carver. So we see a nice bit of patience here from Watchwolf, Corey. I think this is really heads up. You don't expose yourself to Aramos design, losing multiple nesting ravens. You really want to hit a power and see now here you miss. What you can actually do is use the Raven so we get those extra bodies build up to a Kato later. Now we can play the Kindling Carver, sacrifice the Raven straight away. You really, really want to hit like a Stone Scar painting this turn. How about another Shrine to Carve it? Uh, I'd like it a lot more if I had a Shadow Influence and maybe I hadn't spent a power already on my Kindling Carver. Basically about one of the worst things that could have happened to me. Um, but yeah, here on Colacoma's side, I mean, is this enticing enough that if you're seeing, okay, Watchwolf just missed their third power, do you just fire off Aramont's designs? Uh, absolutely. I mean, a, a two for one, you've got another Aramont's designs in hand, you've got a Nectar of On Life to deal with some more threats in the future. I, I just want, even, even though you could leave the Nesting Raven and just use Nectar of On Life, that card has additional utility going along, and anytime you've got two copies of a card in your hand, you always can feel a little bit more comfortable about just use, firing right off the first one as a beautiful little even-handed golem set of draws for Colacoma. They play a Valve, discard a Sigil from their deck to gain its influence, then play the Arcanum Hourglass. And this two-cost Relic uh, does a nice bit of business here. At the start of your turn, if you have a power card in your vo play a random power card from your Void. And so that just works so nice with all of the little Spore Folk action, all, all of the Vows in their deck. For Watch Wolf, still just stumbling around. Yeah, I mean, we're just cashing in Kato Shades for Totemites. Kolokoma is accelerating their power with this Hourglass. The one sort of saving grace here for Watch Wolf is Kolokoma actually doesn't have a power to play this turn. They don't know that yet, but, I mean, how much do you really care about this Varro coming down? Sure, we could sacrifice a Totemite if we don't want it to be a 5-5. Five five. It could stay a 3-3, three three, but there is sort of a saving grace here for Watch Wolf where they have some time can't keep dilly dallying around here and missing power drops like this this is brutal all right so Colacoma, vara vengeance seeker five five deadly lifesteal and following that up with another even-handed golem they hit a seat of mystery and a xenon silex lots and lots of options everything's going their way right now as a grenahan is going to pick up an akaria yeah, this is this is the goods right here, Corey. Yeah, this is we've got a Rizindo coming next turn. <laughs> yeah, thanks to the, the Silex that will be undepleted, having already three shadow influences there, and yeah, I mean there's some blockers in the way. You're not going to get to draw some cards this time around, but. Yeah, without Watchwolf already having sort of a real board sort of deployed, any of their card advantage engines going in either Strange Burglar or the Mother of Skies, there's sort of no hope here on the horizon either to actually be able to deal with this Azendel missing the Shadow Influence, not having something like Combust. So for Watchwolf, picking up a Mother of Skies that they can't play, they're going to pack it in, but by virtue, by getting a top 16 here, finish in, their, in the first open of the year, They've made some progress towards qualifying for that special invitation only last chance qualifier event. So we're going to look forward to seeing if they can complete the job in a future tournament and make it all the way to the world championship or do the work necessary to be in that LCQ event. So that's going to do it for this top 16 match. And we have one more top 16 match that we're going to check in on. Beowulf, 3 Wolf, I guess, versus the Boxer. They're in game three. Yes, we see Beowulf here. Do you want to call him Three Wolf or Beowulf? It really looks like they're going. I'm gonna go with Beowulf. It looks like they're doing a cheeky way of spelling Beowulf with a three. But if it's Three Wolf, they they'll have to let us know. Uh, meanwhile, the boxer it's got a Fell Rock and a Mayblaft Huntress coming in up against this Huru Kira looking setup here. We don't see Kira herself, but we see a Genitor Dovid and a Mayblaft Huntress on the other side. Fine Grafter is going into the market, picking up a Silverblade Medicine. Depending upon how many spells are in Beowulf's Void, that could be a swift end to the game. 
every time I see that Silver Blade Menace pulled out of the market for these strategies, my ears just immediately perk up and I'm like, ooh, how much damage is that going to be? And also, you know, after, after you maybe hit your opponent for 4, 6, 8, maybe as much as like 12 damage, you still have this 3-3 three, three flyer that thanks to the Vine Grafter you can turn into a 4-4 four, four flying regen, so it's this really formidable threat. 10 points cool. straight across. Yep. It looks like this game's gone on for a while, though, Corey. We see a Sveyorian of Kosa likely came off of a Koryva Palace, but doesn't look like it. Yes. Koryva Palace did enough work. Spending eight power to put the top four cards in my deck into my void and exhausting one of my units that could potentially block wasn't exactly what I would have hoped for with my Sveya activation there. So the boxer going to... Well, I was going to say press A space, but it looks like they're they're one who likes to click on all of their units before attacking. And with just a generator Dovid back to block, I smell lethal here. Yeah, with just one unit there. Your math checks out, Andrews. The boxer will advance into our top eight, knocking off the Beowulf and their Huru Kira strategy. All right, so that's going to do it here for our top 16. And, you know, I I didn't set it up earlier. One of the cool things we did the other day, Corey, uh, was that interview we did with Lights Out Ace, our defending world champion. So we're going to be, we've been showing segments of that interview in between each round. So we're going to get a little bit more of that for you all queued up here. And we'll be back in a few minutes with the next round, our top eight. There's only eight players left, and only one will be the winner of this 5K thrown open, and one will have a seat locked up at the 2021 Eternal World Championships. Stay tuned as we get into the stretch run here. So as far as, like, sort of getting good in Eternal, you mentioned you play a lot of strategy games. Sort of when you first started playing Eternal, were you just smashing people right away? Um, sort of how did you get better at the game? And becomes maybe the best player in the world well right now you are at least <laughs> yeah well a lot of the skills from magic definitely carried over like i made master my first like real month playing the game and i i think i was in the top 10 the last couple of months of closed beta granted there weren't that many players then but it's still like I, I was up there uh so my getting good process kind of happened years before but if you want to get good now, the main thing to do is just like get on the Discord, get talking to people, uh, get on streams of people that you respect and talk to them and ask them. If they make a play that you don't understand, be like, why did you do that? And they'll probably be pretty happy to explain to you why they did a thing. Or if you see a deck list and you're like, why are you playing those cards? People usually have reasons why they're playing those cards and they'll share it with you and you can get opinions from a lot of different people and you can really grow that way. It's just like asking kind of pointed questions with actionable results is the way to do it. If you were to, you know, help a player out who's in your stream asking you questions, asking you questions through the Discord, what do you think is the most common, you know, question or mistake somebody comes to you with? So I think the biggest mistake and level up moment from becoming like an average player to becoming a good player is knowing that you don't always have to play your cards. A, a lot of times, it'd be like, it's turn two. This is when I cast my exploit, or my opponent has a unit, and I have a removal spell, and I have, I'm have i not going to spend my power on a unit this turn. I should use my removal spell on that unit. But a lot of times, you're just supposed to do nothing. Like, if the card that beats you costs six, you should use that exploit when your opponent has five power. If your opponent has a 2-2, two -two and it's going to hit you for a little bit, but you're going to play a 3-4 next turn, just take two damage and play the three, four and save the removal spell for something scary with an ability or a bigger unit. Uh, so just like not playing a thing because you can, I think is the biggest difference between the average players and the good players. And that's sort of the whole thing folds into there. It's a having a plan of like, how is this game going to look? So sometimes it's about maximizing your cards. Sometimes it's about just getting what you can out of them. That makes, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so as far as uh, in continuing to improve, if you are a newer player who is looking to sort of start playing in some more eternal tournaments and being able to compete, do you have any recommendations in terms of what kinds of decks you should try? Should you play a lot of different decks? Should you try to focus on one and getting better with it? If you were somebody who was trying to get better and make it to the world championships, what kinds of things would you be spending your time doing? So... Playing all of the decks at least a little bit to know how they function is definitely great. Like if you have 
the resources. I would definitely play some games of Yetis, play some games of Kira, play some games of Elysian, play some games of Sling. It was just like try everything. But if you don't, like, like if you're a new player and you're like, you have, you know, your new player cards and you drafted five or 10 times, like you probably can build one, maybe two decks. So then I would say focus on building one of the good decks, learn what opening hands you can keep, learn how you win each matchup, learn when you want certain cards out of your market and when, when they're good and bad. Like for, for example, that uh, Elysian versus Unilist control matchup. Like we played that so many times on both sides. We learned that like, so what Collector is gonna do is he's gonna play his merchant. He's gonna get mirror image. So he gets two Aegis threats. And with the mirror image, he's gonna get a uh, Sodi spell shaper. So he can start drawing cards with that. And that way you can keep up on cards with the honor of calls and the wisdoms because I have to spend two cards on each Aegis unit and you get to draw more cards. So like learning your plan like that for each of the popular matchups and just jamming forever. And that's, that's how you get better. That's how you make the top 64s and the top eights. Yeah. I like that you called out um, going onto the Reddit, going onto the discord, because there are a lot of helpful people on there. I know, I know I've messaged players, just ask them for their deck list online. And most people are just genuinely pretty helpful. You know, you can never control human beings and they might do weird things, but I found them most players in the community are just generally pretty helpful. And really excited folks just to have other people to be able to like, oh, cool. You want to talk about this deck too? Like let's, you know, bounce ideas back and forth for 10, 15 minutes. And, you know, then you get to go battle some games and come back and talk about it again. And that's how you end up making some of, you know, these relationships that end up forming like yeah this is my testing partner and then grows into something like you guys had lights out ace for team rank star where all of a sudden you guys just had like this sort of team can blossom out of something like that All right, it's time for the top eight here. Andrew Beckstrom and Corey Burkhart. We've got only a few more matches left here in the Stormbreak Open. We've got eight fantastic competitors. Shy City Sogun, Cinemod, Stormblast, Netscape, Navigator, The Boxer, RNG, Dark Revenger, and Kolokoma. Lots of familiar great names. We're going to be starting off this top eight round as we are now in the money with Shy City Shogun versus Cinemod. Shy City Shogun on Even Felm, definitely the deck of the tournament. Up against Cinemod, and they've got Skycrag Sling. So, Corey, what is the Skycrag Sling deck trying to do here? Yes, yeah, so Luis and I got to actually cast this the round that you were taking off there, Andrew. This is all about Sling of the Chi, that three cost relic. Anytime you play a six strength or more unit, that unit will deal its strength and damage to an enemy unit. And at the end of your turn, if you have a six health or greater unit in play, you get to draw an initial card. This is sort of backed up with things like Siege Breaker, that Overwhelm, able to deal damage to an enemy unit and overwhelm the remainder to the enemy player. Something like Geminon, maybe with 100 damage being dealt, we might get to see her ultimate ability go off and just finish a player off in one burst. And then you see things like Roast and Tamaris, and these units that have these formidable sides where they get shifted to play. You can draw the additional cards of Tamaris while she's waiting in the wings. Maybe Roast, it gets killed, it gets reshifted, you immediately fire off some more damage, you're drawing more cards of those slings. This is really a, a heavy synergy deck focused on Sling of the Chi. It's sort of, you know, defensive and controlling in the early game with things like Hailstorm and Permafrost and the Ice Bolt, but then can sort of overpower if it has the sling. The issue that we saw earlier from our last Sling of the Chi competitor up against a Fel Evens, which we're going to see at a Chi City Shogun, is when the sling didn't come together, they did eventually get ground out by the things like Even Handed Golem, like things like Rindra. And it sounds like Andrew, our game is ready. Let's head down to the action. All right, we've got this top eight match ready to go. Game number one here of this best of three Cinemod on Sky Craig Sling. Uh, namesake card of their deck not in hand but they've got a strategize that'll help them big for it meanwhile shy city shogun's got a couple of nice early defensive 
value oriented two drops exactly what you'd like to see for an opening end of the film deck island's favor is a, a nice little addition for cinemod's deck with, by gaining an aegis for themselves it protects them against any exploits that threaten to disrupt their plans even-handed golem draws a maveloft huntress and a, a whoo akaria but a sky craig sling for cinemod on turn three as we like to say in the biz never didn't have it yeah, the, the perfect perfect time to draw it, right? Like, you were protected the whole time, you're never going to get exploited and lose it. Even had the favor on turn two to defend themselves against such an option. And now Shogun, like, let me see, does Tri-City Shogun have access to a reappropriator in their market? The issue is that they're still going to have to get through that player Aegis, though. All right, Tri-City Shogun attacks for one. That even any Golem, and for Cinemod... They could throw down a Siege Breaker, and that'll just deal six to something. <laughs> and with Overwhelm. Bang. Does Tri City so good? If they kill it, do they have a Relic? I don't think they do, Corey. You gotta play one Relic for the Siege Breakers. Yeah, it is really disrespectful in a, in a metagame where Siege Breaker is showing up to not show up with, you know, some sort of Relic in your deck. Maybe there just wasn't any in the, the even combination here for Shogun to, to utilize, but. Now you're facing down this really formidable threat, and you know you're looking at this Mavelov Hunters, or at least I am, Andrew. And yeah, we're gonna have to see it combined with the Mara here. Nice yeah. little play here to combine these two options. Yeah, it works. And we'll see the Siege Breaker in Tomb. The enemy player draws a relic of their choice from their deck. Shy City Sogun says, uh, "I didn't bring any this week weekend." So womp, womp. <laughs> for Cinemod, they're gonna start off the turn. I imagine we're going to see a toasty roasty of roast the walking glacier five cost seven seven overwhelm and in two play roast shifted and the the beauty the absolute beautiful synergy with sling of the chi means that the damage overwhelms it's got more than six health so you draw a card at the end of your turn and if it were to die Corey, because it has in tomb play it shifted it means it comes back into play immediately and you get to deal another another uh another burst of damage with that sling yeah i'm looking at the akaria here in shogun's hand and i'm like okay yeah we can kill the roast yeah i don't really want to kill the roast that much right the roast will just come back and kill the akaria yeah this is a really tough setup to break apart for shy city shogun i mean we've seen these fell decks be quite value oriented all weekend but this is not exactly the kind of game where shy city shogun having a ton of cards and a ton of value was going to help them. They need some very specific tools. They need something, uh, some form of interaction, like a stunning effect on the roast. They need a way to get that relic off of the board, get through that face ages. And this is sort of one of the problems when you choose to play one of these, these even decks. You don't get access to permafrost. You don't have something like that that's just going to lock the roast out. Maybe you could play something like a Feeding Time. We saw some people play something like Stealth Strike, but that also doesn't solve the problem. Like It is this sort of deadly damage way of hitting a Roast, but you know, Roasty Toasty is going to come back and blast you thanks for that Sling of the Chi, and now we're hit it here looking at Shai Shitty Shogun, and they're already down to 10 points of health. Oh, Where man. do you go from here? Well, I just want to call out Cinema not playing that Sky Greg Silex because they didn't have the third fire influence yet. <laughs> they're they're drawing two cards a turn with their sling and they've got a Babe Loft Huntress in hand. They're like, but what if what if like three turns from now I could play another treasure chump? You know, it's not like they have a ton of expensive cards in hand or anything they need to play, but just it's just always fun to, to see wh which players are just the total greed monsters and which ones are just like, yeah, let me just get an extra power down just in hey. case I need it. Maybe they went back and they watched the stream from the game earlier where the sling player got ground out and they're like, yeah, I just can't, I can't allow Trishity Shogun to draw more cards than me. It would just be too disrespectful. <laughs> All right. So looking pretty good here for our old cinema. They could maybe just permafrost attack for seven. They're pretty close to killing Trishity Shogun. If they were to go permafrost your Vara, and then attack with Roast, and then Ice Bolt Roast, I actually think it gets them just one point short of lethal. Because uh, the Roast would come back and deal seven overwhelming damage onto the Vara. 
but it's instead... see the ice bolt fired off. Yeah, and the reason why you do that instead of permafrost is Vara was suppressing all Aegis. And so now you can play the island's favor, you can pick up another primal sigil and have Aegis once again clear a sling of the chi and be insulated from any effects like an Akaria or a Felrock trying to hit your hand. How about two life steal blockers? Is that gonna be enough? Doesn't really feel like a Cory. If I'm, you actually can't play the VAR. If you play the VAR, you die on the spot. They oh, just good call. Yeah, you can sack yeah. the rose to immediately bring it back, shoot the ground ahead for three, and the remaining three damage actually fi finishes off Shogun here. Yeah, so you could play Felrock. Um, Break the player ages. But yeah, no. if you put every, if you put both units on roast, it doesn't quite overwhelm for enough. But a hailstorm will do the dirty. And Cinemod up a game here with Skycraig Sling. Just you know, that looked clean. It, it did look clean, and this is going to be the classic thing of Cinemod. Maybe their deck's going to look fantastic when they have that turn three Sling. Do, do they have the tools to win without it? And you know what? In that game, it, it kind of felt like they did, to be honest. Like, how important was Sling? Like, it did draw them a couple of extra cards, and it gave them a removal. But you know what? They didn't really need all of their cards, and they had some extra removal at the end of the game. It kind of felt like it was just really hard for Shy City Shogun to beat the uh, the Roast. No, I, have, I assume, I guess it's fair to say Shy City Shogun would have killed the Roast if the threat of the second Sling proc wasn't such a big deal. Yeah, they would have been able to kill it, but it's one of those things that would they be able to get over the finish line in time? Because eventually the, the Rose is going to emerge, and that's just seven strength unblockable. So you're going to need to gain some health there in the intervening time. And yeah, they could have had some more health to play with, but it still would have been a difficult sort of ball game there for them. So we look at the hands here for game number two, and this is an awesome starting hand here for Chai Shidi Shogun. You know, you don't have any other card advantage, but you have that exploit. You can cash in one of these extra power cards. That can find you a treasure trove, and maybe that can draw you into, like, an even hand and golem, a grenna hand, and start getting the engines churning. But really, the, the key card here, when I think of the matchup from Shogun's perspective, is just being able to discard that Sling of the Chi there. And that exploit is the one option that might be able to do that, but Cinema's got a transpose in hand. That's, that's an early Aegis option. Sure is. Yeah, and they're they're gonna play the the primal sigil instead of a crest of fury turn one just to give them that potential transpose. And yeah, that's a smart play. You might even say a heads up play, because just you know why allow you you don't really have something in hand that you care that much about protecting, but why allow your opponent to just take a card from your hand when your market fetching card could just negate the effect so easily a really great line here from Cinemod and yeah look at that Andrew just standing pat my hand's good enough I don't need to go into my market but you know the sling of the chi that's not on top of my deck yeah I'll take that one. Oh wow did that Yoden Hurler go on top? I'm kind of stunned if that's the case I think it did it I couldn't tell what happened with that crest it did wow I would have loved to have had an out at getting an undepleted power I mean you can't just play strategize this turn but Every turn that the sling is just still in your hand is another turn the enemy could just draw another exploit. And then with another Jotun Hurler on top, didn't really get feel like they got paid off on that decision. Yeah, and unfortunately here for Shogun, their hand is not developed. You started with that exploit, but again, really needed the, the card advantage sort of units here, like the even-handed golem, the Grena hen. They did finally find a vine grafter. Yeah, not as good in this matchup. I mean, it's nice that it has regen, so if an Overwhelm unit you know, comes down with Sling, it, it'll just soak up all of the damage. But And they're even going to hold on to it. Wow, without a fifth Undepleted Power in hand, it's going to be a few turns before maybe that Vine Grafter could be played and proc in the same turn. For Cinemod, though, everything's moving along quite smoothly. This turn, they, we could just see something like a Crest of Fury plus a Sling, and that just sets us up next turn for... Uh, the Roast and the Geminon in hand. Uh, this is uh, looking like a fantastic start for for Cinematas. A Shadow Sigil off the top for Shy City Shogun. Opens things up for the Vine Grafter to come down and be used immediately. It's going to go into the market. Maybe just ditching like that Defile. That, that seems like maybe the worst card. I don't know if there's a cheap unit you're worried about. Nope. Oh, the Reappropriator. All right. So Reappropriator 
three cost three one flying regen and summon steal an enemy relic with strength whose cost is less than the strength equal to the strength of reappropriator for as long as you have reappropriator so we will see here and a nice thing that they actually just pulled off there andrew the the vine grafter gave plus one plus and a regen to that fell rock so now you can play the reappropriator this turn steal that sling of the chi and on your follow-up turn, you'll actually get to play a six-strength unit in Felrock and get to shoot something for six. Unfortunately for Shogun here, the units that Cinemod's playing, a bit beefier than uh, just the six damage that the sling will be dealing. So now, now it sort of has emerged, Corey, why it is that Cinemod really wanted to keep that Jotun Hurler. And it makes so much sense now, their play. I, I guess I didn't appreciate... Yeah, they know what's in the Shogun's deck list. They knew there was a quite a good chance at some point this game a reappropriator was going to come after the sling. And that just means that now the the snowballs give them some potential utility at getting rid of the sling. And we could just see double snowball here. Yeah. I really like double snowball. This gets you back your other sling of the chi. And additionally, now you're going to draw two cards here at the end of the turn. And... You know, you're basically looking at the situation of on the next turn getting to potentially play like that Siege Breaker, and that's mm. so much damage you're going to get to fling at this no longer regen protected Vine Grafter. And for Shy City Shogun, it it feels like oh god, oh this this hurts. is a lot of damage. Yes. <laughs> if you are in a room with children, please shield your eyes. This could get dangerous. Oh, this oh, is going to no. let it be a five-five. All right. I mean, that, Cinemon, that makes sense. Cinnamon may have already done yeah. the math. This might be enough damage in their hand thanks to that transpose they can fire off right now and those two slings in play that they might actually just be able to kill Shogun with the roast getting to attack rather than getting to, you know, bring back the roast and maybe shoot one of these units. Yeah, I right. think there might be some regret on Shy City Shogun's side. There was a point in this game a turn or so ago where they could have annihilated the roast while Cinemod had no slings on their side. Now there's two. <laughs> yeah. And it, the annihilate, not a permanent answer, but it does help deal with the roast for a moment by getting rid of all of the units here uh, with that Geminon Cinemod made it so that this annihilate now can kill the roast. And it, uh, you know, now it'll be delayed from attacking a few more turns. It'll come back. It has no units to shoot, but with two slings in hand, um, can't say I'm really feeling Shy City Shogun's chances in a long game. They can exploit here, but then they wouldn't be able to play the Fell Rock. I guess their bet they figure their best bet is to exploit, plunder the Shadow Sigil into a treasure trove, draw a card with it. Transpose is even gonna stop the discard. And for Cinemod, um just gonna be a dominant performance getting to the top four here. Well, it's already discarding their own hand cards to hand size. You know, Shogun doesn't need to discard any of them for him. With a film painting off the top for Shy City Shogun, they're, I guess they're going to get one more turn here as Cinemod's not going to be able to do a literal lethal. They are going to get Geminon's Mastery 100 up to 21. Maybe someday, but it probably won't be the thing that determines this game. Still waiting for the time that we get to see that here live on, live on you know, Twitch in one of our top 64s where this Gemma gets to fire off her ultimate ability. A crafty occultist now joins the fray, discarding something like a Mayloft Huntress and a Hailstorm gets flying and the 1-1 one -one Grenadine. Three shields up with the Cobalt Waystone granting Aegis here. Yeah, this is like the third time now that or fourth time that Cinemod, I think it's the fourth time now that Cinemod has gained Aegis this game. And yeah, as we see yet another effect that would try to uh, mess with Cinemod's hand show up, it's become painfully clear that this game is not in the cards for Shy City Shogun. Yeah, and now we're turn away from play. Rose coming back. We'll see something like a Siege Breaker show up. Shoot six twice thanks to two sling of the cheese at the Rindra. Don't even need an attack. As Cinema trounces their way into our top four, they are now just two more match wins away from making it to the world championships.
that was a pretty dominant performance. I think that the swing of the chi jack might be the thing that sort of you know breaks open this tournament. Is all of our menace decks actually, Andrew? All of the menace sacrifice decks they've been eliminated at this point. I believe. I believe that we're just looking at of the two big strategies that started off our tournament. There's a lot of even found left. You know, we've got some Xenon, we've got some Huru, but you know, largely if Cinemod can keep playing against these found decks, I like their chances. Yeah, I like the way that they were playing and playing around exploit. Did a nice little job there. So we're going to check out the Boxer versus RNG as soon as their next game starts. The Boxer is up a game in that match. The Boxer is another one of our players on Eve in the Found this weekend. And for RNG, also in a little Even Found matchup. So nice little mirror match. We'll see who can come out on top. We get started with that game in just a moment here. Sounds like it's ready to go. All right. Kicking things off. Even had a goal. I'm up at the top for RNG. And for the boxer, they are up a game looking to close out RNG in two, but. Didn't do anything to start here. They've got this Defile in hand, but, you know, I, I can appreciate why they're not feeling the options here. Not yeah. really in love with killing either of those units. Yeah, the things that I want to Defile in this matchup, you know, the, the Vine Grafters, the big Mavelop Huntresses when they've been imbued. Uh, if RNG is playing, yep, they've got a Kantha in their deck as well. Like, those are, those are the units that I really want to Defile. The sort of card advantage cheap units that I want to play early, like... You know, as we see in play with the even-handed goal and the Grenahan, eh, not exactly where I want to be using my defiles. And unfortunately, that just means for the boxer here, it's, they're not going to be making a play until their fourth turn. So an even-handed golem here for the boxer finds another even-handed golem. Even Stevens all across the board here. RNG gets a fell rock. They could potentially do something with honor of claws to get that bad boy down this turn. But you got to be careful. Weird things can happen when Felrock show up. We're okay. This is going to get weird. Here so we Felrock go. comes back from the void after being discarded. Now the boxer has to discard a card. Oh, I'm going to discard a Felrock. So now my Felrock comes back. I'm going to make you discard a card. Oh, oh I'm going to discard a Felrock. I, did they hit another one? Oh my yeah, God. That's dubs. So two more Felrocks come back. So now the boxer has to discard another card. They're going to discard a Felrock. Um, which is going to bring that one back. I don't think they hit one off the discards. But if RNG discards like a uh, expensive unit, it could hit the fourth foul rock. All right, it doesn't. What in the world was that? So we had a four cost card draw spell we played, Corey, and now five units got played. Yeah, it was just, you know, four cost. Players determine who puts 25 power, 30 power worth of units into play. You know, just the normal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so an exploit is going to hit RNG. Um, I mean, the good news is that Felrock straight off with Felrock's pretty easy. Actually, here for the Boxer, too. They just picked up that Dazzle. Would have been excellent if they could have played, you know, one even-handed goal in their last turn. Held up that Dazzle for that Honor of Claws. Mm. Here in this situation, yeah, having to take the Vine Grafter here. Can't let RNG into the market, given so many cards have gone to the Boxer's Void. Who knows how much... You know, maybe a Silver Blade Menace to take a look. A Null Blade, a Champion of Cunning. Yeah, Champion of Cunning or a Vara Fate Touch should be really deadly options for RNG, so we have to get rid of that Vine Grafter. All right, so Dazzle's going to shut down the exploit. So we'll see if RNG wants to go for an Even Handed Golem or a Mavelov Tuntress. It's going to be a Mavelov Tuntress. Are we going to just start churning through these opposing Fell Rocks? I mean, if you trade with one, you can now just potentially attack with the others. This might be even a... Oh, we're going to see another even-handed golem. Yeah, so this enable attacks with all three fell rocks, and they can trade off two for an even-handed golem and a fell rock on a fell rock, but at the end of the day, RNG started up fell rocks. They're going to end up here a fell rock, and the boxer now empty board down to 17. Yeah, it's a dangerous spot. You could do something like Vara here. They'll just sack an even-handed golem, and you could also play a Kanta, and that at least gives you something that's getting you ahead if the Akanta sticks around for a turn. I 
yeah, this feels like a good spot to drop that. And then maybe next turn, the Vine Grafter can do a little something. For RNG, maybe you go to the market with Vine Grafter. It feels pretty good to just play the Akari and kill the Akanta before it starts pumping out 2-1 Dark Elves that could block and trade with your Felrock. Totally agree with you there, as we'll see. Felrock trade off with Vara and... Okay, that was a big draw there for the Boxer. Gassing back up here, what can they find? Rindra, we just can see this Vine Grafter. What is the Boxer going to get out of that market? All right, they got a Champion of Cunning and giving it regen. Going to help it out quite a bit. For RNG, could go to some... They picked up a Rindra here, so a couple of great options here. You've got a Honor of Claws and even had a Golem to both get you more cards to work with. But you know what? Once I have that Akari down, I'm kind of a little bit more interested in like the Vine Grafter, Rindra kind of plays that could maybe I... allow me to close this game out. But they're going to start off by drawing some cards. <laughs> and Ooh, That was a really big draw here. Is Looking at the market for the Boxer, the best thing I think they could have gotten would have been that Champion. I think now you use this Vine Grafter and go get this Devouring Shadows out of RNG's market. I think that the... Oh, there are no... The... RNG's thinking way bigger than I am. I love this, too. This is awesome. Why did you like Devouring Shadows? You could combine it with the Vara and knock off the Aegis on a potential Champion of Cunning should it come down and still be able to Devouring Shadows and finish it off. Sure. Yeah, I mean, the Champion of Cunning, it feels like you can let go for a second. Sure, it's giving plus strength to those ground units, but they're not on it. It's, it's not like the even-handed golem getting strength is that big of a deal, and... You've got a lot of time against the Vine Grafter at the very least. Yeah, and I, I like this dream really big approach here from RNG. So if you're RNG, you could play the Vara and bring back a Felrock. It clears out the Boxer's hand. Uh, the only downside is that it doesn't actually like allow you to start attacking uh, with the Akari, and it feels like that's what you'd like to do. I just don't really see a better plan than this. Like playing Vara doesn't do that much. Sure, it knocks the Aegis off the Champion of Cunning, but to what end? It still leaves the region. Ooh, okay. Felrock right back. Yeah, fell, get fell rocked right back. Uh, honor. Yeah, if they had hit another fell rock, that would have been amazing because they would have played it from their void, and then that would have procked Vara again. Yeah, maybe get back like an Akaria at that point and break the break the Aegis or kill off the enemy fell rock. All right, I love this attack with Vine Grafter. If you look at the board. What could really be done about this? You you could do something to block with your own Vine Grafter if you're the Boxer, but now, now that sort of regen is gone. And we pick up another Vine Grafter. It kind of feels like you just have to play this if you're the Boxer. I understand why you want to hold it in hand. But with a Vara in play and Felrocks in the board, I am very worried that holding onto a card in my hand just means it's going to get Felrocked here. Yeah. It feels like it's a guarantee. Yeah, this almost, I 100% agree with you, Andrew. This doesn't seem like a Vine Grafter that's long for this world, and at least getting it onto the board, at least you would have a blocker that can hold back a Felrock, and, you know, you're saving yourself two power on a follow-up turn by just getting it into play. Great now, point. Yeah, if you're an RNG seat, you have two Shadow units, you can sort of cobble together multiple hmm. resumes. All right, so an interesting little attack here. RNG attacks with their Akaria because if it dies, they can bring it back. And a lovely piece of synergy. Bar comes down, knocks Aegis off the Champion of Cunning, and brings back the Akaria. So in just one card, that Bar, they were able to kill the Champion of Cunning. A, a real a real smart play. Meanwhile, as predicted, Felrock comes back, discards from the Boxer. And maybe they felt like that was their best chance, but I don't know. Is the 2-2 regen, if you put it into play, that likely to get killed? It's yeah, like, it seemed pretty uh, unlikely, all things considered, that it was the biggest threat there, but too much yeah. going on. I don't think the Boxer is going to be able to come back through, you know, the, the board state that RNG had set up there with their Vara Fate touched, and RNG is going to even up the score. The Boxer and RNG are going to fight a mirror match here, one game to decide who goes to the top four. That Honor of Claws discarding a Felrock worked out about as poorly as I've ever seen that line go. <laughs> like <laughs> it was crazy it just at the end at the it just ended up with just so much stuff hap good stuff happening on the other side of the board i don't know it was interesting not much you can do about it though sometimes you just gotta you know 
hope that your opponent's not discarding a million foul rocks too. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is a weird spot because if you don't end up discarding your foul rock there and you discard another card, are you just opting into well, I can't play my foul rock until the game is developed further? I mean, they did end up with more foul rocks in net, and it's hard for like the way that it works is that it sort of ping pongs back and forth, but it's confusing because. There's also discarding from the deck thanks to the Foul Rocks ability, so you really just can't know how much it's going to end up with. All, right. that, all, all being said, it was a pretty cool little moment. Yeah, and at least from RNG side, you're like, well, I have two Foul Rocks to start with, so I at least know that if this goes kind of crazy and wonky, at least I end up with two Foul Rocks. I can kind of block and make something happen of this. But it is one of those fun moments of... Well, I'm gonna play this, and I, here's my very, you know, straightforward draw three, discard one. I sort of know structurally what my plan is here, and discard my foul rock. But where's it gonna go? That's just a total adventure. All right, so we've got a. I think we've got a couple of matches done here in our top eight. We are gonna be going on to the top four. Pretty soon here, we've got to wrap up this match first to figure out who between RNG and the boxer will make it to the top four. And, you know, a lot on the line, We like we've been talking about, if you make it to multiple top fours in an open this season, you automatically qualified for the world championship. So just winning this match is real meaningful progress for both of these players towards their goals of making it to the world championship. So for both of them, a lot on the line here in this mirror match. Additional money on the line. Each of these players has already earned a portion of that 5K, you know, cash prize pool. But you know, the ability to fight for more, the ability to fight for, you know, that partial invite to the World Championships, or you know, if you win this match and two more, you're just in. Here we go. One game in the film even mirror to decide it between RNG and the boxer. Pretty similar openings, all things concerned. Both players looking here with a Grenahan and an Akaria, um, just trying to figure out what their what the next play is going to be after that. Double honor of claws here on the boxer side. Fire off that Grenahan. Ooh, they find an even-handed goal. That's a wonderful pickup. <laughs> all right, Felrock at the ready for RNG now as their Grenahan comes down. Digging into the top of their deck, gets an Akanta Ascending. When that may have been a Felrock that got discarded, and because the Grenahen came down on turn two, they don't actually have the influences to get that out just yet. Ooh, scary moment there for the Boxer, missing on a fourth power, but they do have an exploit that can plunder them into that fourth power. Akanta Ascending comes down, threatening next turn with an additional Shadow Influence to start spitting out some 2-1 Dark Elves. Meanwhile, the boxer is going to exploit RNG's hand and take a card that is not Felrock the Outcast. I <laughs> guess I anticipated just being a Karia. It seems like you can manage VAR pretty well with some of the units that you have on board and in hand, but long term, that Akaria is going to be quite worrisome. But yeah, let's not just give them a free 5 2. One of those Vine Grafters cashed in, and Akantha being among the best targets here for that Defile. All right, a Felon Banner is going to bring down a VAR Vengeance Seeker for the Boxer. Do you want to cash in that even-handed goal and to keep that VAR a, a tidy 3-3? Three, three, they will. Big draw there for the Boxer. So now this Felon Banner being the fifth power. Ooh, interesting. Because RNG has a Felrock of their own in hand, not actually playing the Banner, in case they drew this Felrock if they wanted to discard it, they're going to choose yeah. to hold onto it. Yeah, Corey, I, I mean, going to the market with Vinegrafter sounds okay, but with Akaria's in hand, it just sounds so attractive to do what you can with that Honor of Claws to set up to have the six and a pleated power this turn. Now, it didn't work out. They didn't hit it, but by getting a Mayvloft Huntress, they've maybe set it up so that uh, on two turns from now, they will be able to get there. Yeah, and I think with the Boxer having this much control in their hand, you have access to, to two Akarias. We might not even see them fire off this Grenahen. Yeah, we'll just see an honor of claws here fired off, and it'll be an interesting spot to see if the boxer even wants to discard a fell rock. Yeah, just playing it slow and steady. Doesn't want any some anything chaotic to happen. 
The last time they saw RNG's hand, it was a fell rock and nothing. They don't want to make anything crazy sort of happen just yet. All right, a second Var Vengeance Seeker coming down, holding on to that Akaria in hand. Is, doesn't really feel like there's anything that worth killing at the moment. For the Boxer, are we going to see the first Akaria first Reaper show up? Well, going to do a little Reaping and kill that Vara. For RNG, they can just play their own Akaria back and kill the Akaria. The Entomb would proc. The Entomb is the enemy player discards all spells from their hand, and so far that's going to make that Vara's favor go away. So kind of an unfortunate draw, but at the end of the day, how much how worth how much worth did that Vara's favor really have? Yeah, there's not many seven, you know, obviously into seven cost cards, but many eight cost cards there in RNG's deck. There's just that Vara Fate touch that we saw in the market last game is. Even handed golem here with the boxer, a great pickup, and we're gonna see a chain of Mavloth hunters potentially here. Are they gonna plunt? Yeah, they're gonna plunder away all of their spells. No. No, it looks like that's actually what we are gonna see. Yeah, Mavloth Huntress, take out the Grenahen, imbue this one, get rid of my Dazzle. I've got no spells in hand anymore. RNG. Heads up line there by the boxer. Even handed golem, a nice pickup here for RNG. Where's that start him off? Wait here, probably see. I assume you have to take the Akari, even though that even handed golem's scary. No, they are going to take away the card advantage because they don't have a big unit of their own to play just yet. All right, for the boxer, they're going to get a little attack on. Yeah, we see both players kind of hesitant to play their Fell Rocks, just knowing you're basically spending six power to let the enemy not have to discard a card because it goes into play and really not have to spend the power on anything. So kind of a weird little cat and mouse game we got going on. We see Champion of Cunning is now picked up. And, you know, this is this is pretty well crafted by the Boxer. There was a bunch of Akarias to deal with earlier on in the game. But now we've gotten the game to a spot where maybe this Champion of Cunning can just sort of take things over. Um, Maveloft Huntress plus a Akanta Ascending. Well, that's enough damage to take down the Champion of Cunning, but this this regen combo with Champion of Cunning, just your end game being a 5-5 five, five Flying Aegis regen with lots of great ongoing abilities is pretty fantastic. Yeah, and because the Akanta has come down, we're going to see the Akaria come down slay Akantha before she can start making any elves or making any of the boxers units sacrificed and it's going to enable an attack here and the you know we see the players health totals they're quite large from all the lifesteal units played early on but you know things are going to start getting into range here where these chip damages are going to start mattering this is six damage coming across each turn from the boxer RNG's going to have to start fighting for the board here a bit all right ooh car Karia's for days. I'm gonna fight for the board. That's a good one to fight for the board with. Yeah, the the tricky thing is just what do you, what is what do these cards do for you right now? Like they're good. They're definitely good cards, and I guess the answer is just kill a little Grenahan. Both players are sort of waiting for the green light to deploy some of these major threats, and for the boxer, I think we're gonna see it now. Is Champion of Cunning comes down, buffs everything. Oh, interesting. We don't actually have Aegis. We don't have the fifth primal influence, but for the boxer being still two away, and they just decided to deal with it as an Akaria now is going to kill the Champion of Cunning. It did permanently buff those units. And by annihilating here, there's definitely some outs for the boxer to get some tempo going. Oh, man. Is this the moment? I guess if it, we could see some Bell Rock back ping ponging. All yeah. right. With two in hand, you know you get to clear out RNG's entire hand. You did just push RNG down to twelve, so let's uh, let's start the rodeo. Looks like a double fell rock here. And did that hit one? I uh, think it was a black sky harbinger. Oh, there was another fell rock. All right, so Kari goes away. And another fell rock right oh back. Goodness. Oh, with wow, all four? four? <laughs> Are you kidding me? The boxer played one. Fell rock and all four appeared for RNG, and now they drew uh, Honor of Claws. Well, exploit's pretty worthless, but I we can go get Mavelov Huntress and then next turn play Rindra, 
And I guess you could start. I mean, it's a, the Vine Grafter is kind of the best unit on the board looking at this, Corey. Yeah, it really is, because it's going to get to take out multiple fell rocks here, and actually even the score for the boxer in terms of, you know, who has the most stuff lying around. <laughs> so yeah, now we'll see. I assume an all-out attack from... I mean, you, pro you, you actually can't make an all-out attack. No, you game. would die if you well, want everything. You can attack with some fell rocks if you want to just make the board a little smaller. Whoa, oh. Oh no. Oh no. I mean, they only have one power. This is only an attack for 23. If the boxer... Oh my gosh. Oh no. RNG just assumed there would have to be trades, but the boxer quickly did the math. They even drew an Akari to clear out some blockers, but they don't even need it. As they're, they're, they're like plus one lethal here. Even if one of these units got dealt with, they still got there. And, you know, it's... It was an ex it was so exciting for RNG. I'm sure that they got so many fell rocks that they got swept up and realized, you know, they hadn't actually made enough progress on Boxer's health total. It wasn't a lethal attack, and the Boxer quickly just let the defenses down, let everything through, and finishes this game off, advancing to our top four. A brutal sort of end there for RNG, and that that's where those chip damages that the Boxer got in early by being ahead on the board. Those six points of damage here, six points of damage there. All of a sudden, you know, RNG fell from 34 to 12, and you you make that, you know, A space attack push through damage, and you're like, okay, I've got this on the next turn. I've got them finished off. I think RNG just forgot to look at their health total there. Yep, it happens. As uh, I'm probably the member of our design team who most frequently makes plays that have absolutely no awareness at all <laughs> about what, what the health totals are in the game. So <laughs> I've been there a million times before. It It, it just happens. I mean... Totally. That's one of the fun things about uh, card games and games like Eternal is, you know, oftentimes they're contested on axes and things about cards in hand and removal spells and lining up things right. But at the end of the game, the game is decided by who gets their health total down to zero first. And sometimes if you lose sight of that, it can lead you astray. All right. But good. But congrats to all the players who made the top four. We're going to queue up another interview segment here with our world champion Lights Out Ace as we will be back in a few minutes here for our semifinals. Corey, do you have any more questions for Lights Out Ace? I don't. In fact, let's open up the floor. Lights Out Ace, do you have any questions for us? Do you guys pay attention to the community decks at all? Like, do you try out decks that people win tournaments with or put on Warcry or anything like that? Yeah, it's yeah, we def we definitely do. We you know, we're we play ourselves on ladder to to see some of what's going on, of course, and while we're testing so we can make sure when we're making balance changes we're in tune. We have analytics here that we're looking at to get a sense of what's going on, but you know, sometimes it's it's always fun when the uh the analytics diverge from the tournament decks and sometimes a deck that the community is like super sold on for the tournaments and the competitive play we look at it in the analytics and it's like, well, it's winning an okay amount. Do you have an example of a deck like that? I guess like an older one. Well, like the classic one is probably Yetis. I mean, at this point, I think the secret's out. But Yetis was basically the winningest deck in the game for a lot longer than it was ever given credit for, for being like a serious competitive deck. And at this point, we could pretty safely just say this. Like, we generally don't want to be like trying to influence too much about like, oh, you know, we, the end the numbers say this deck's really great. So now everybody goes and just all starts playing that and then the, becomes swarmed. But yeah, Yetis was like always just winning a, a ton, basically more than anything else. What is your favorite card if you, if you had one in Eternal? You know, it's usually something that we're currently working on. Um, but <laughs> as far as like my actual favorite, all time favorites, I think I just have to go with Privilege or Rank. I mean, that was the card when I first encountered the game. I wasn't, I started working on the game um, when set two was just about to come out. And that was the card that sort of blew my mind and made me want to just try all kinds of crazy things and just got me sort of hooked on, on the deck building experience. Mine's always been Aramod's Machinations. The... As you called out, you know, the Dark Return, Haunting Scream, caring about different stats through zones. This one allows you to do it in so many different ways that if I can reduce the cost of my units, I can change what I'm getting back. Getting overwhelmed to a unit that's growing in size, if I can grow it further, that scales even harder. If I can maybe give double damage to it or lifesteal, that scales in just a totally different way. Usually if you run into me in the queues, that's, <laughs> I'm playing some sort of Aramont Machinations deck, even if it doesn't actually end up being the best thing.
every month now you've been having the patch notes with uh I've been, I've been liking the nerfs a lot and the buffs always come out of left field. How do you pick what old <laughs> cards you're going to buff? Yeah. Um, it's first of all, I would say that it's, it is harder. There's sort of two general things we're looking for. One of which is things which have maybe n old stuff, which we knew was once popular and fun that people enjoyed, but maybe has fallen out of the limelight as, you know, newer cards come into the play and maybe pushed it out and giving that a second chance. Um, and so sometimes the, the cards will fall into that category. Uh, and sometimes it's, and then sometimes it's just a real creative, just if anybody has inspiration. And so, and sometimes we will literally just be, you know, looking at community sections, uh, suggestions and feedback because there's ideas that we maybe haven't considered for a card to buff. And we're generally trying to make it so that there's something new to explore and not just make it so that it feels like we are trying to dictate what is good in the game. We want to make sure that with each live balance patch, there's hopefully something that no matter what kind of player you are, if we're going to be doing some buffs that makes you go, oh, I kind of want to go and check that out. And, you know, we, we like it that some cards are good and some cards are bad and it's fun to explore, which is which. So obviously, you know, we, we always get the sort of the complaints, the classic complaints of like, this card is terrible. What if you made it slightly a lot less terrible? And, you know, sometimes that's appropriate, but sometimes it's kind of dangerous or maybe it wouldn't be that much fun if the card doesn't show up as often, sometimes it's cool that there's a bad card in the game that somebody just gets to have their be their pet thing that they're the only one who knows how to make it even like medium <laughs> when it's just terrible most of the time. When when we do live balance cards, particularly when we're making buffs in, in general when they're not, I would guess aimed at Expedition, more of this is for Throne, is there needs to be something to think about, something more for you to want to go down the rabbit hole of like, well, what if you know, this now combines better with X card and X card makes me want to play Y card. And if that opens up the door for somebody to build four or five, six different decks, that's like one of the best candidates that we can ever find for buffing something. And then I have one last, this isn't a question. This is a, just a request. Yeah. I want to play with the diesel cycle on expedition someday. Oh Please yeah. Make it happen. <laughs> yep. They could definitely show up in expedition someday. Yeah. Those cards yeah, are I mean, so I, fun. And they're just not quite good enough anymore. All right. Well, I want to thank uh, Lights Out Ace for joining us today. I uh, really appreciate all of the insights into sort of what makes what made him the Eternal World Champion, how you could maybe become the Eternal World Champion this year as we get our Eternal Organized Play 2021 season off and running. If people want to check out some of your content, are there any places that they can go to see some of it? Uh, I think all the article websites been taken down by this point <laughs> I, I haven't done much since my son was born i've been a lot busier not streaming as much not writing articles but to, if i'm plugging my stuff it's uh twitter.com slash lights out ace or at lights out ace or whatever youtube and lights out ace one all right uh so Corey, thanks uh for joining us as well uh you know i see you every day but it's always good to hear from you and thanks lights out ace and uh you will lights out ace is qualified for the 2021 Eternal World Championships by being our defending champion. So they will be back later on this year to defend their title as world champion. And we're excited to see that. Welcome back here to the Stormbreak Throne Open. We are down to our final four competitors here this weekend, as one of them will be winning a seat at the 2021 Eternal World Championships. We're going to be showing you both of these matches back to back here at our semifinals. We'll be holding the second semifinal. We're going to start things off at the top of the bracket with Cinemod versus Netscape Navigator. And Corey, for Cinemod, we got to see them in action with Sky Craig Sling and it looked fantastic. Yeah, they, they put on a real show, you know, really highlighting why they've done so well this weekend, just dismantling this even film strategy. And fortunately for them, Cinemod's up against Netscape Navigator, who we've seen earlier on in this tournament. They are also on an even film strategy. So we're going to see if Cinemod can do it one more time and take down 
sort of the deck of the tournament this even found strategy with their sling of the chi yeah it's gonna be cool uh for netscape navigator you know a, a, a real clean looking deck list for this even found archetype not playing a lot of fanciness not doing anything playing many one ofs they've really their deck is almost entirely four copies and it's four copies of the cards that we've seen shine this weekend talking about things like Granahan, exploit akanta ascending Felrock, and you know they're going to be looking to discard Felrock with honor of claws and i it's this matchup looks like it's going to be tough to me from their side just because they really only have the exploits. It looks like fantastic sort of game one natural interaction for it. And they don't have a copy of Reappropriator or any something, anything like that in their market, which can help them uh, sort of get that sling off the board. So if we can see Cinemod sort of repeat what they did last match, uh, they've definitely got a great chance against what was sort of the most popular and dominant deck of the tournament, even fell mid range. Yeah, one of those things that when you pack all these four ofs like they have, you know, they're just jamming what is, you know, perceived to be the best cards for each of these slots. You lose out in sort of that flexibility when you play these one of and two of answers. And then when you play up against a deck that is built around what is sort of fundamentally good against what you're doing, again, we talk about it so many times so far in this broadcast, where if you're playing a felon deck, you're usually weak to these relics. Yeah, you know, Cinemod has sort of found one of those relics that is really dangerous to fight up against and it sounds like the game is ready so let's head down to the match all right here we go game number one of our first semi-final netscape navigator up against cinemod Corey, i don't see a sling of the chi in cinemod's opener that's going to be the name of the game for them early use those scouts use those strategizes as they come to try to find a sling as netscape navigator gets us started with an even-handed golem. Yeah, the thing that Cinnamon does have going for them here is they're starting off with the player ages, thanks to Alan's favor, and they have a lot of really strong units to play. The issue is, is you know, can all those strong, you know, powerful units can they actually keep pace and you know keep up with the found deck if they don't have a sling in play? You know, we saw one of our earlier sling players bite the dust because of things like Akaria just taking over in the late game. We'll see if Cinnamon here no sling in sight. Well yeah, it, interesting it decision here by Cinemod. They could have gone for one of their undepleted powers and played that crafty occultist and draw discard two, draw two, and just like discarding something like you know Jotun Hurler and maybe and just a power just seems like it gets you closer to sling. But they're gonna go for the crest and delay that action a moment. As we see a Rindra infiltrator with its summon foiled by the Aegis. And looks looks like a great turn here with just a Kenna. Kenna will eat Rindra. They played the Cobalt Waystone, gained Aegis again. Love this play here for Cinnamon. And they've sort of built themselves up perfectly to that five primal influence. One away here if they can find a roast maybe on top of their deck next turn. They might be able to warp that into play. Yep, they're playing this game the hard way right now with no copies of Sling in sight, but, you know, they're onto the board first with a Kenna. The issue is Netscape Navigator's got some Akarias on the way, and those are those are hard, those hit hard. Yeah, the fortunate thing for them, though, is, you know, we saw that Forbidden Research there at a Netscape Navigator. No Fairwatch joined the fray, so Cinemod is actually ahead here on the board. They're going to go ahead and... Just card the Oten Hurler, give up the unit and the spell. So they get a 3 3 flyer and a 1 1 Grendon for their troubles. Not going to play the Maveloft Huntress. Want to save that one as removal for later. But, you know, if, if Cinemod can get to the board first, and yeah, these Akarias are going to come down and start picking apart the board, but each turn, Cinemod will make some progress with their attacks if they can do something like, yeah, just permafrost the Akaria and keep, keep crunching. Yeah, we might actually just see something here like permafrost the Akaria, play a siege breaker, and you know, try to brawl over some for some more damage. Yeah, a couple of different ways to play it. I mean, you could also go for maybe the Maveloft Huntress. You could do something like Siege Breaker plus Maveloft Huntress to just kill or attack the Akari. You don't have any spells in your hand, but it would still pop the Aegis. And so maybe you don't like that for the future. So we'll just see the permafrost instead. And will Cinemod just trade with that Grenadin? 
most of the large units in Cinemod's deck have Overwhelm, but not all of them. If something like a Geminon were to come down, I guess in the future you might regret not having the 1-1 one -one as a chumper. Okay, and we see the first Felrock there picked up for Netscape. However, they don't have any ways to discard cards currently, so there's no way to get that down on the cheap. Yeah, another Akari could just kill potentially the Siege Breaker, but then we would get to see a pretty similar sequence maybe of Permafrost plus followed up with another threat, attack for some more damage. Alternatively, there's a line here for Netscape where they go Akantha, Mavelof, Huntress, the Akantha, trade off for the Siege Breaker, then Mavelof, Huntress onto the, the even-handed Golem here and trade that off for the Oculus so they could actually maybe get this this Akantha to start triggering. Interesting. So the line was Netscape Navigator played the Mavelot Huntress. They plundered into another Primal Sigil. So you Which... definitely have all the influences you need. So I assume that we're going to see that one also plundered away into a treasure trove with this other Mavelot Huntress. Oh, interesting. So the other Mavelot Huntress doesn't come down. We see a Tamaris is the pickup for Cinemod. But this is... I mean, we are now... The way Netscape Navigator played this... Siege, looks like Siege Breaker is going to get a hit in, and it's just going to be a matter of which way is Cinemod going to deal with that Akanta, because they've got a couple. Yeah, if you're in Cinemod's seat, you've got to be scratching your head like... Okay, so you took out my 3-3, three, three, but you had the ability to play this Akantha and use the Mayfall Hunters on that and take out my Siege Breaker. So you, you're really valuing this Akantha. I think that you might want to start here with the Siege Breaker attack and just make sure that Netscape Navigator's not pulling your leg. They're not going to do any sort of double block shenanigans. Well, if Netscape Navigator is low on removal and you offer the opportunity to trade, you might regret it. The thing is, is like, so you just don't want the Akanta to hit. Like, so what would happen is the Akanta would attack, it would play a 2-1, it would hit, and then the Aegis would stop the sacrifice. But if the Aegis goes away, yeah. All right, so the Permafrost is going to deal with that. But this is not, we've now got, I guess, Akaria plus Maveloft Huntress can literally kill both Siege Breakers. Yeah, it looks like this is what Netscape was trying to set up for. You know, a, a double kill turn here. Again, we know that these even fell in decks not actually packing a relic in their deck to draw off these Siege Breakers. Cheeky little attack here with the even-handed Golem. You know, your, your health total is half of what your opponent is, and you're trading one for one aggressive, but planning to have an Akaria back on defense here. No relics to draw. Oh, there it is. Sling of the Chi. So Cinema doesn't have the power to both sling and proc the strength ability, but you could play sling and just shift it to Maris. It kills the even-handed golem, and it means you now have a six health unit, so you get to draw a card. And so really, Cinema said, you know what? It's fine. You can have the Akari for a turn. I'm going to just get onto the board with a six health unit and ensure I start drawing cards. And yeah, just because that Tamaris has shifted, it's still there in play, so it does still work. And now things are going to look really great for Cinemod. They've been scrapping all game without it, but now that they've got their sling, I'm loving their chances. Yeah, and here now it's Cinemod trying to figure out, okay, is there any way that I could deal some damage to a unit and maybe get you down into a spot where I can kill you on the follow-up turn? Cinema though, just going to take out that Akaria. That'll break the player ages thanks to her Entomb ability. Yeah, and if you're Cinema, you could imbue something right now and just have the Mavelov Tuntress up as a giant killer. The advantage is, is that just by playing the Mavelov Tuntress, you get to plunder and sort of get that out of the way as far as turning that insignia into a treasure trove. And we are going to see that. Um, looks like it's... Not going to imbue. They'd rather just have the 6-5 Overwhelm than potentially have those stats tied up in something that could be, you know, chump blocked by a Grenahen, something like that. The Snowball actually not a bad pickup here, isn't it? 
the Knights Cave Navigator picks up an even handed goal. And that's a, that's a target to move out of the way if you needed anything to move out blockers. But now we're going to see Felrock come down. We are. So Felrock is going to make Cinema discard a card, and then Cinema will have to discard cards from their deck to its cost. Five cards go away. Um, but yeah, lots of good stuff still going to happen here. Ooh, second Tamaris. So maybe we get a little action like shift Tamaris, deal one to everything without flying, all the enemies without flying, and then just snowball the Felrock, and that kills it clean. I really like that. You can fire and off you get... the Trove also if you want to. Yeah. Yeah, you... and you maybe want to fire off the Trove first just so you know you're, what you're working with. Yeah, in case you draw a Siege Breaker and you might be able to end the game on the spot. Yeah, exactly. Always good when you're in, when you're planning out your sequence. Do the things that can change the... If you have a sequence like that where your opponent has no power, do the things which can change the information you have access to first. If it doesn't work out, you can always just stick to the original plan, but if your last play in that sequence was Treasure Trove, you never know what you might have hit. All right. Too late on that, Akaria, and that unblockable Tamaris is going to emerge on the next turn, along with all the other friends. Going to get Cinemod across the finish line here in game number one. Absolutely. So... You know, I mean, that game was pretty close for most of the time, and then Sling broke it open. But it was, it, it was impressive how um, the the way that the Skycrake Sling deck was able to stick with it. And one of the things I like about it is so how much interaction it has that isn't spells. And so it's not when you get into this spot against the Fel Neck where they have an Akaria and they're really threatening you in the air. Permafrost, Maveloft, Huntress just give you avenues where you can deal with the Akaria, but you don't have to worry about having an extra copy of those cards in hand discarded by the fact that you're dealing with Akaria. Yeah, the combination of the killer units in the mid game, like the Kenna taking out the Rendra was also pretty huge. There was no lifesteal attacks that were coming from, from Netscape Navigator to buy them that extra time to build to, you know, potentially a stronger late game if there's no sling of the Shi in play. That was able to you know, completely disrupt Netscape's ability to sort of fight over the board in the middle stages of the game. And then as you pointed out, like, yeah, you got those Permafrost, you got those Mavelov Huntresses. You don't need to worry about your hand getting discarded if there's nothing to discard there. All right, so for Netscape Navigator, they are going to be in a spot where they need to win the next two games to make it to the finals here of this 5K Open for... Cinema just one more win away gets them to the finals. I and... almost feel it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they. It looks like they're. You know, it's kind of one of those things where when you have a week an event like this where even Felon was the most popular deck and put a bunch of copies into the top eight. It's like, did the person who is here playing something else did they get here because they have a great matchup or were they one of the few who got lucky against the deck? So far, it's kind of seemed like Cinema just has a good matchup, but we'll have to see if it bears out in this next couple of games. Do you Both redraw players... this for six, Andrew? This is a rough seven. It's tough. In general, against an exploit deck, I just don't redraw, like, down to six, looking for something, because if my opponent's, you know, got a brain, they'll probably be able to look at my hand, and even if I hit it, figure out what the thing was. <laughs> I generally uh, assume if I were to make the top four of a of an open like this, then my opponent's pretty heads up. They know what's going on in a game of Eternal. All right. Well, for Netscape Navigator, an interesting decision. Do you just go for the exploit right now or wait a turn to try to give them one more turn to draw a sling? The answer is go for it now. Find the sling, hit the sling, and see see some pretty good other cards if we're being honest that aren't sling roast and kenna are both quite nice at that said if i'm a nice game situation here i still want to take the sling this turn i have the second exploit to take out that roast that i'm really afraid of we've seen roast just do absolutely great work against this felon deck but you know right now i don't want to give cinema the ability if they just draw a transpose or an island's favor on the next turn give themselves player ages and i'm just stuck wondering what could have been if i had just discarded the sling the first time through oh what could have been all right for netscape navigator nice there they got to plunder that defile into a shadow sigil just such a great part of the flexibility of decks now with plunder they could play something like a defile and then if you run into a deck that is just playing 
you know, mostly bigger units, more expensive units. Well, Plunder just gives you easy access to another power card instead. If you draw too much power, of course, we can get a treasure trove. The next exploit is going to be pointed, my guess, Corey, is at the roast. That one looks like it's going to be the hardest to deal with in the long term. Uh, Netscape Navigator just did not bring the kind of tools to deal with that unit this weekend. Yeah, no feeding times. And of course, being an even deck, you don't get access to permafrost. So you're going to have to get rid of that one. But that does leave Cinemod here with you know three really strong cards still in their hand. The Naveloth Huntress, the Kenna, permafrost. Like These are really interactive options. And... Now in Island's favor, that's that's player ages, that's protection from all these potential discard effects is we might see, you know, that honor clause come down, but that Fell Rock's not gonna get to discard any cards anymore. Interesting. So Netscape Navigator is gonna go for a Granahan instead of going for the Fell Rock. They could have Honor of Claws the Fell Rock into play, but instead a pair of Grenahens, oh, well, why not get a Fell Rock along with it? Pops the face ages of Cinemod and for Cinema, they can get down Kenna and kill one of these Grenahens. It would just trade with a Kenna or... I like that draw. How about, yeah. how about a change of pace? Yeah, Hailstorm the whole board. Usually brought here for these sacrifice decks and, you know, the aggressive starts from the Yetis, but Hailstorm there putting in great work. But an Honor the Claws follow-up Netscape Navigator ended to discard this Velrock they were holding onto in the previous turn. So this is, okay, so Maveloft Huntress actually goes away for Cinemod. Uh, that, that one can just very cheaply kill our attack and kill a Felrock, but Cinemod, ooh, ooh. <laughs> oh, Corey. <laughs> I like that one off the top. That's a, that's a good draw if I'm in Cinemod shoes. So now Netscape Navigator up against it. And I think that you called this out earlier in our entry, Andrew. I don't think that Netscape's playing a copy. Yeah, they don't. They don't have a copy of Disrupt or Reappropriator in their market that that Vinecrafter can grab. So this is this is a sling of the chi that's going to stick around. Netscape Navigator is going to have to try to find a way to overpower this. All right, Netscape Navigator going into the market with Vinecrafter. Is it Champion of Cunning time? It is. So they're going to try to win this game with Champion of Cunning before Cinemod can sort of go crazy with the sling. Right now, Cinemod doesn't have anything for Sling, and with an Ice Bolt, they still don't. At what point do we just sort of fire off these removals? Yeah, Let's that's see. We should trade the Kenna off now for the Fel Rock. It was, we're losing health quickly. You've got Sling that you can win a long game, but you're going to need the time for that. Yeah. Yeah, this could go quite badly if something like an Akari were to come down and you didn't use the killer on the Kenna. That would be a disaster. <laughs> hey, Akari came off the top of the deck. Sometimes I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so here, do you actually change change plans if you're Netscape Navigator? Your opponent has two cards in hand. Now, if they're not going to fire off that Rindra, they're just going to get that really protected champion of Cunning down. Aegis, regen... And yet, you, I don't, you, you can't deal with this champion of cutting. Ice you can. Bolt. You can mm -hmm. ice bolt here. That'll break the agent. Oh, all right. I, yes, you can do this, and this is okay. Not champion the, of cutting not still great. Champion of cutting still <laughs> in play, and since you have five shadow influence at the end of your turn, it's going to give all of your units plus two strength. Um, yeah. You air Rinda. quotes answered the eight strength flyer. It's just providing a additional strength at the end of each of your opponent's turns to all of, you know to their units. Yeah, that was like answering the flyer like the way that I cleaned my room by putting all the stuff underneath the bed. <laughs> <laughs> Cinema draws a power for the turn. There's no roast on the top of their deck. They're gonna play it past the turn, and well, not even past. Let's just skip them up. Let's go to game three of this matchup as. Cinema did eventually find the second copy of Sling of the Chi after the first one was exploited, but after that, they never played another unit that had that much strength or health, and, well, it was basically just a blank. And that looked like Netscape really putting sort of a, a strategy together. Like, you have the early disruption sort of in the mid-game, try to figure out what your branching path is. Do you have to draw cards, try to get, to, get up to maybe a Karia? Do you have the ability to discard some Fel Rocks into play? And they had this sort of ladder there. And with that, they were able to apply a lot of pressure, which with a Vinegrafter, 
was able to just turn into something really dangerous really quickly thanks to that champion of cunning there out of the market. I think for Netscape, that's something you just tr need to kind of replicate in the next game. Um, you really just can't let Cinemod do this this sort of turn three sling, turn four siege breaker, or Tamaris or anything like that to you. If you can if you can keep them off balance the first few turns and maybe rush to you know that that champion of cunning into your your six drops where I think that you can overpower them if they don't have a sling. That's that's what your game plan's got to be for this this decider. All right, so as soon as both players join up for game three, we will head down to that match. It's going to be for a lot of cash, a lot of prestige to get to the finals of this Open and get them one step closer to the World Championship. So excited to see you can come out on top. For Cinema. they're going to be on the play. And, you know, one of the nice things when they're on the play is they've got more opportunities to just get down a sling before Netscape Navigator can play an exploit. But, you know... Definitely is a three drop up against an exploit, a two drop. Netscape Navigator will get a fair crack at it. But it's not like Cinema doesn't have ways to protect themselves. We've seen them, you know, make really heads up plays with their copies of Transpose, playing Sigils on the first turn. Here we are, game number three. Everything on the line for these two players. That's a redraw from Cinema, and yeah, this this looks like a pretty great keep. You do need th need some things to come together. You do need additional power. Oh wow, they're gonna redraw that hand, Andrew. I mean, you know what you want. Together. You know what you want, and you know what Netscape Navigator doesn't have an exploit, and Cinema did redraw down to a hand with a sling of the cheese. So so far so good. Second sling, and you have the Mavelov Hunters here that I assume that we'll see played, and we'll. Assume that you plunder away the Oculus here. Maybe you do it to the Geminon because you're just too far away from her. Yeah. All right. I like the decision of the Mavelov Tuntress. Just get that down and ensure we have the turn three sling lined up. Interestingly, Netscape Navigator throws out the Akantha into the Mavelov Tuntress instead of the Grenahan. That's that's an interesting decision, Corey. I'm not yeah, sure. It screams to me that we're going to see Feln Banner into Grenahan, and this is Netscape Navigator hoping to spike a Fel Rock here getting discarded, mm -hmm. but they don't end up getting there on this one. <laughs> all right. The, the game and the match is all hinging now on the top of the deck for Cinemod. They have put two Skycrag Slings into play, and they've got a Crafty Occultist in hand to dr help them draw more cards, to help them find a big unit, but the first big unit is just going to do a tremendous amount of work for them, but if they don't find anything, well, they're really not working with anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we will see a Forbidden Research there. Netscape trying to hit a second Fell Rock that they could discard into play as well to get both cards out of Cinnamon's hand, but here we go, Andrew. You play that Insignia. Oculus, pick up two cards. They won't be able to play any, you know, big units this turn, but mm. those right. are two real off, nice ones. Right off the top of the deck. And yeah, Crafty Occultist is, is pretty cool. So if you have a full hand, it does a little bit of discard and draw for you. But if you have no cards in your hand, it's just a draw two. So really nice if you to play that card in any sort of Skycrag tempo deck, aggro deck in addition to some of these bigger Skycrag decks that we've seen. Wow, that, that was a huge Oculus there for Cinema. This is not the deck that I would have thought for this one to be, you know, sort of the home, but wow, did it look good in that spot. And it matches up well on this board. It could trade off for a Felrock. I don't even know if we'll see Netscape Navigator make that trade as they're going into their market here, getting that Champion of Cunning. Yeah, and it's kind of funny here for Cinema. One of these units draws them cards. One of them um deals will kill a unit but they neither one of them does both so which one are they going to go for both do you just get down the tamara so you have the card draw engine going and yeah that's that's what we're going to see yeah this also given that you've drawn a hailstorm this also clears up your ability of if netscape navigator did go for that champion of cunning which sounds potentially likely 
you can clear off an additional seven strength out of play here. The hailstorm will break off, you know, at least the Aegis here. You're still going to need to find a way to get rid of that regen before you can finish it off with your sling of the cheese. You know, maybe you shift gears here. You have two slings. Do you just want to fire off the siege breaker and kill off the vine grafter and the Grenahan? It's interesting. It does seem like that's better than playing Hailstorm. It's like, how much does Hailstorm actually help you? Yeah, because it only breaks the Aegis off of that Champion of Cunning. Yeah, it looks like that's exactly what we're going to see. And that's seven damage upstairs that gets overwhelmed over. And okay, a Snowball. If you can find another Snowball, you can actually get your Sling of the Cheese through. All right, down to 13 now here. I mean, the math is positive for Cinemod in that it's going to take a couple more turns for this Champion of Cunning to get through. The problem is, is that you kind of have to play this the Siege Breaker right now to kill the Ikaria, but it won't also kill the Champion of Cunning. Maybe you're going to run out of time before you can do this. I guess if you... If you... If you snowball and then siege breaker and then like sort of at least point something at both of these units, and then next turn you draw into another big unit that theoretically allows you to kill the champion of cunning and anything else played that doesn't have regen. Right. So yeah, as you were saying, you use the snowball here, you break the Aegis, then you siege breaker, selecting both of the units you get to break the regen of the champion of cunning you kill the akaria but as a cost you lose your your player aegis here you lose your player aegis you lose your hailstorm to the karian tomb or i guess you just lose the player aegis right right you don't lose the the hailstorm not that the hailstorm is doing much i guess if you draw a second hailstorm well you're going to kill your whole board but at least you'll be done with the champion of cunning okay cinemat accepting their fate is to go to three here Oh, Transpose is phenomenal, because now Transpose can go and get Rain of... Not Rain of Frogs, turn to Seed. Huge so we take there. a huge hit down to three. I assume we're just going to see an Akaria show up to present a... S I mean, I guess the Transpose doesn't do it on its own, because you still need now an answer to Akaria. Because yes, you didn't have. actually buy one. Or you could leave back the Tamaris to block to deal with, to chump the Akaria, but we know that won't work against the other Akaria in hand. Oh, I guess if you're turned to seeding the first... Oh, wow, this is complicated. <laughs> All right. Yeah, uh, there's also potentially, you could go for Honor of Claws and just kind of trust your deck that you're going to find another Siege Breaker here. And if they're going to pick up that turn to seed, and there's now a strategy. Oh, wow. so they could find a permafrost. So, Corey, you could turn to seed the Akaria, and then that makes it more likely that Tamaris can chump block the Champion of Cunning. Right, you I know don't there like are more it. Akarias in the deck. There's definitely not another champion of cutting anytime soon. Right, right, right. You could also just strategize first here. Ooh, I don't... Playing the Crest first? I. It feels like the cuts off Maveloft Huntress is something that could work here for you. Right. Oh, they didn't hit it. So it's going to be close. Is Cinemod going to go for a turn... They have to go for a turn to seed on Akaria. They don't know it, but that is the only way I believe that they still have a chance in this game. It takes a lot of guts to do it and not just go after oh, the no. champion of Cunning. That's tough. That's a tough moment. I I totally respect and get why you want to just deal with the champion of Cunning with its plus strength ability and all that permanently, but it did open things up for Netscape Navigator to play another Akaria and finish off Cinemod there. And we'll never know, I guess, what was on the top of Cinemod's deck. Maybe they had a chance to dig out of it if they had played it the other way, but that is going to put Netscape Navigator into the finals with their take on even Felon as Akaria reaps another soul. Yeah, a really well-played set there from Netscape Navigator. And that that was, I think, the first time that we've actually seen one of these Felon decks actually, like, fight against an ongoing sling and actually come out on top. Like, Netscape was actually able to, you know, fight the beast and come out alive on the other side. Yeah, just finding ways to push damage through. I mean... The Vine Grafter Champion of Cunning combo, it, it really appears like that is one of the sort of the big innovations that we have seen a lot more of this weekend than we had seen in the past. All right, so we're going to see the next semifinal matchup here. We're not going to take a break. We are going to be checking out um, the boxer up against 
Corey, who ended up winning that other quarterfinal? Was it Dark Revenge Colacoma. or Colacoma? All so right. Colacoma and their even Xenon. If you want to call it knowledge, eh, we'll give it to you. It's a little bit of a stretch. There's only, you know, seven primal influence in the deck, but they are playing Granahens. So somewhat of a knowledge deck from Colacoma up against the Boxer, who is also playing even Xenon. Okay, so be interesting to see whether or not the Xenon approach. I mean, I, I like what the Xenon deck can do can do in terms of just having some absolutely giant plays with that extra power acceleration from something like Katra Arc and Hourglass. Um, but it's no guarantee, of course, that you'll be able to pull all of that out together. It's it, it feels like it's a little bit more of an inconsistent approach than just the Fel deck, but. I definitely like the top end in the matchup. Yeah, getting the top end of Vara Fate touched, you know, you also have access to the Akaria, so you can sort of fight that battle. You have blockers for something like a Champion of Cunning. But then also just getting Azendel, like, Azendel, steal up a bunch of your opponents, you know, annihilate, make them zero cost, maybe get some exploits, things of that nature. I think if Colacoma can actually accelerate themselves with Katra or Arcanum Hourglass the late game, They've got the ability to overpower what the Boxer is doing with their Feln deck. But again, if the Boxer can sort of, you know, duck and dodge what's going on here from the Xenon deck and actually apply some powerful pressure in the air that they can get around, you know, the Akarias that Colacoma has, I think they might be able to close out these games before Colacoma can take over and draw tons and tons of cards with Azendel. All right. So for both players, we... They get a few minutes to join the game. So as soon as they both hit join, we'll get going. Um, they're going to be going up against another even found deck in the finals. And, you know, we'll see We'll see where the metagame goes next in terms of combating this uh, Granahan even business. It definitely seems like one of the better things that you can be doing right now in the throne format. But, and it does seem like this deck could also use some further iteration. I mean... In particular, I think it looks like units that are good again can that are hard to kill, like something like Roast, seem like they have some nice utility against the deck just because, you know, they're really reliant on things like Maveloft, Huntress, and potentially Akaria to clear the way. And bigger units uh, that have Aegis and protective abilities seem like they have some utility against that, that kind of approach. Yeah, I definitely agree with you there. Something in like the 3-3, three, 4-4 three, four, four Aegis sort of space seems to be combating a lot of what the the Felon deck is sort of putting up in the way of you effectively. That said, you still have to deal with something like Vara Vengeance Seeker, which, you know, can pierce all of your Aegises as a 3-3 three, three lifesteal, potentially a 5-5 five, five lifesteal deadly. So you need to balance it out. You can't just put all of the, the sort of Aegis units there into into one little bucket and call it a day. Who do you like in this matchup, Andrew? I, I think I like the boxer side of things, but I think it's going to be close. Where do, where do you fall on this one? Oh yeah. I'm with the boxer. I mean, I, I, I love, I love the, the greedy approach. I like to be on the side that has the, the more powerful thing that I'm ultimately working towards. And I, that, you know, if, Especially when you get to the, the Sunday where it's like you get to know what your opponent's on. You have a lot more ability to sort of work the game to being able to counteract what they're doing. What are their most powerful things? You can try to avoid honor of clausing your foul rocks and just letting them have free roll foul rocks. When you get, to, it feels like when both players get it, have a good feel for a matchup and this kind of interactive matchup, it really favors the person who has sort of the more powerful um, late game tools. So I, I like what Colacoma is doing here. I think I said the wrong user's name, but I was gonna say it yeah. sounded like everything you were saying is you yeah. actually prefer Colacoma's side. Okay. Yeah, I, I like Colacoma's side. Sounds I like just... our game's ready, Andrew. You ready for semifinal number two? Let's head. Let's do it. All right, game time here. Colacoma kicking things off. You see those? They're a neck, but well, really, as we've said, they're a a Xenon deck splashing primal. <laughs> it, it can be a little tricky when Bowser are in the mix, Corey, to keep track of what factions everyone's on. They're a Feln deck and their hand had a, or they're a Xenon deck <laughs> splashing a primal card, but in their hand was a Stone Scar Vow. <laughs> I'll get it together. 
I mean, I totally missed the primal sigil this morning when we were going through Necklace, and I was just like, okay, yeah, this is even Zenith, and all of a sudden, we go into Colocoma's game, and I'm like, what's this Grenahan doing in their hand? And I go back to the deck, I'm like, oh, there is a primal sigil in there. Like, yeah, you play some Felon Vows, and there were a couple of Felon paintings down there at the bottom. So we see Exploit here, fixing up some of Colocoma's woes with their ability to deploy to the board here. They get a third power, taking out that Vine Grafter. And here we go, There, there's a second type of influence for him. Still not primal, so they're still not able to get going with his Grenahen. Yeah, we're going to ship far to the bottom as Grenahen will get things probably kicked off here in a moment for the Boxer after this film painting. Third primal, third shadow. Nothing picked up there for the Grenahen, so no fell rock to the void as one 8 cost gets scouted to the bottom and another 8 cost is drawn here for Colocoma as Azenvel is picked up. Honor of Claws for the Boxer. The Felrox? Nope, just a Rindra. All right. Uh, one time influence off of that, and there are power cards in the Void, thanks to that Vow earlier on, but Colicum unfortunately going to miss their power drop here this turn and unable to deploy anything. Yeah, and Rindra's going to add to the pain here. Discard Nazindal, well, adds to the pain, but, you know, you never know. I mean, we, we get a... Nice sometimes, it can be better. sometimes it can be beneficial to have things in the void, and maybe if a vine grafter shows up, we get a grasping at shadows. But yeah, a Xenon seed will be quite nice here. Lets the Katra come down, play some extra power, and you know now we have Akaria's online, so we certainly know that Colacoma uh, is not going to lose a fast game with that sort of setup. We might be seeing the Akaria show here as Akaria number one comes, takes out Katra. Rindra bashes in. <laughs> I think we're just going to see. Well, I've got no spells. Akaria here, Akaria, right back. All right. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we're just trading swings back and forth. And oh, Boxer picked up an Honor of Claws, so now it's going to hurt a little bit. If you're the Boxer, you could just, like, use this Honor of Claws. And if you can go down to no spells in hand... Then you can attack with the Rindra. It either gets, if it gets through, great. Yeah, I, I, I like this. So we're going to yes, see Honor like, of Claws. Yeah, I like this Honor of Claws here. And then you can play the Mavelov Hunters and actually just kill or attack the Akaria. So you actually leave the, the Rindra around. Oh, interesting. Assume that we're getting rid of this exploit? Okay. Okay, so that's that was the plan. Huh. I, I was kind of into just playing the exploit, and that's the way we get down to no spells. And then if you just trade with the Rindra off with the Akaria, whatever. I don't really, like, why... It's not like the Rindra is that valuable. Like, we don't want to trade it. Right, it's also anyway. like, what is the anyway, power that. doing for you? <laughs> it, uh, I mean, you know, we got Grenahan. We'll find something to do with it. <laughs> we'll, we'll play we'll, Akaria and Grenahan this turn. <laughs> Yeah, this sequencing is... If you had a spell there, it's kind of rough, right? Then you can't just play Power Akaria. I don't I think guess... Boxer has many damage-dealing spells in their deck. Oh, maybe... uh, okay. Well, if you don't have many damage-dealing spells, I guess you're not going to draw a spell that often. That's fair. They might have Vara's favors. Let's take a look here. Dazzles, Defiles, Annihilates, Exploits. Yeah, they're not playing Nectar of Unlife. Yeah, no Nectar of Unlife, no Vara's favor. So that's just just to draw units in the Boxer's deck. Okie dokie. And so... as the dust settles now, it's Akaria for the Boxer, and Kolokoma is trying to figure out, okay, can I deploy the Xenon Silex? I want to hold on to it. I changed my mind, by the way. I don't, I don't think Kolokoma's going to win. They got bad karma. They're playing with that Wolfback card, but... <laughs> <laughs> the wolf print card deck that's the card back that you get if you defeat one of the developers so do you like their chances now that they just used a vine grafter to go get a uh grasping of shadows out of their market yeah i mean i guess going back to my original stance on this match i thought that <laughs> the late game power of the whole sort of azindal var reanimation package was a great thing to add in a grindy akaria based matchup we would send an agent a nice pickup so you can get to go grasping at shadows here for that Azendel that was discarded earlier, you can send an agent. 
You can move the Vara out of the way if you really value attacking this turn. I. I mean, you basically if you kill the Vara, you kind of get a card guaranteed, right? Yeah, I actually kind of am into that. I mean, I guess it's kind of bad because if you do that, Corey, it means you're attacking with the Vine Grafter. It probably just bounces off the Granahan and loses its regen. I don't know how much you value that, but it's something. This is probably the safe way to do it. I mean, it's tough because, like, you're going to lose the Azindal probably without it ever having drawn a card. That's not exactly what you were hoping for, but... Oh, wow. So the Senate Agent doesn't kill the Akaria. Well, I guess it's probably going to kill one now. Yeah, now you can kill the one that's blocking. We don't already put Zen and Silex, so really hoping... Oh, brutal. Now drew the ability where it could have given us a treasure trove later. Ooh, an even-handed golem, though. That's a great next turn for Colacoma. Sure is. All right, so the boxer's got a fell rock. Not doing much, though. No, I guess you... Elise came in. Now you get to attack here with this Grenahan, and either you know you bring your opponent down to three attacks from these Akarias, or you get the regen shield off of the Vine Grafter. Yeah, that's a great point. the The math does matter, and the Grenahan attack for one does mean it's just three more attacks. So. If you're Colacoma, I guess you had to kind of consider maybe it was just worth losing the regen shield for that alone. An even-handed goal on the boxer's own. We might see need to see these Halisi tap the brakes here as the board has swung pretty hard back in the boxer's favor. Just gonna kill one Halisi here for the boxer, just in case another Zindal were to show up. Try to mitigate how bad that would be. Ooh, wow. Alright, so Karian Katra. So now we're back to Colacoma having Akaria Supremacy. The big issue here now is that Felrock will just discard the Katra from hand. Eh, even in a Golem, all right. Just when you think they're out of gas, Andrew, they just fuel right back up. Let's see, the Boxer does have access to Silverblade Menace, and we know that there's been... Several cards are discarded from Colacoma, thanks to all the Spore folks and things of that nature. We see Felrock come down, and that's going to get that Katra out of the way. Hourglass. If there's any Silexes there in the Void, that might be able to just turn something together for Colacoma, but not in full control of that. There could be several power cards there in their Void. There's sort of two different races here going on. There's the the race in the air where Colacoma is trying to take over and health totals, and now there's also this this big race to who can do the first big thing. The boxer getting access to their market here is going to get the champion of cunning out. They are one power off of being able to play that potentially this turn, so it looks like we'll see them deploy a Kantha here with regen. Colacoma <laughs> playing a vow there. Hourglass. Ooh, but this Dazzle Angel, I think that's a big pickup, actually. Yeah, I mean, it. You don't have. It, it's interesting how you want to use it if you're the boxer. You could just go straight for the stun on the Akaria just so you can immediately attack with the Akantha. Like, the Akantha with regen was going to get through the Akaria anyway, but this means it actually will hit. And so now if Colacoma gets hit and they don't haven't lost all of their units, which they won't, at the very least the Vine Grafter is going to survive, they're going to have to sack something. So, And this just pushes more damage. It really takes advantage of how ahead the Boxer is right now and makes it that much harder for anything off the top for Colacoma to be enough. They're going to sack the Akaria, which makes sense. It wasn't going to be useful for a couple of turns. You figure by then, if you haven't found an, enough good stuff, it's not going to matter anyway. So you might as well just hold on to the 2-2 and play. But for the Boxer, uh, they were able to take game number one. Um, really on the back, I would say, of Colacoma not being able to capitalize particularly well off that at Zindel. I mean, it, right. it's a huge burst play, but just literally not having a single unit that could get through on the board. Um, 
it just wasn't enough. And, you know, I, I guess to some degree, Colacoma will maybe have to con- re- think about that decision where they could have attacked with everything. They would have lost a regen shield, but gotten three damage, three lifesteal damage through and drawn a card. And, you know, I, thinking about it some more, that just sounds like a good exchange to me. It's not, I, it's not like a perfect upside play, but it sounds better than not attacking. Yeah, I think I agree with you. It is one of those things, though, that if, you know, the Grasping of Shadows, if there had been a Vara that had gotten discarded at some point, I think we'd be talking about something totally different where Colacoma just completely overpowered the Boxer, and despite the Boxer having three Akaria, is able to systematically take out Akaria, Akaria, and Azendel, unable to actually get across the finish line because of the sheer number of units that Vara was able to, to chain together with Asindil getting the Halisi, and then the Halisi getting back like a Katra and something else. And yeah, every little bit there I think mattered for Colacoma. All right, so moving on to game number two here of this matchup, the winner will go on to our finals, where they will be one match away from making it to the 2020 Eternal World Championships. As a reminder, we're playing for five thousand dollars in cash prizes, hence the name 5K stormbreak thrown open you know i thought the name really just says it all Corey. <laughs> oh it's not because there's five thousand cards or they're not five thousand cards yeah it's just a, just just 21 cards <laughs> in Stormbreak, but and we've seen a couple of them showing up today making an impact on throne probably none more so than granahan and i think uh granahan appeared in three of the top of our top four decks and kind of guaranteed to be in both of the finalist decks so a nice, a nice debut weekend for the little Grenadine chicken. Yeah, the... We... Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go for it. I was say, the Stormbreak card's really, you know, showing off well this weekend. We saw the Oculus, the Hen. Um, I feel like we saw a few of the other cards, but yeah, like, real Eccentric big players. Officer was yep. in some intent for a moment before it got it exploited. <laughs> But yeah, but yeah. These, these things will happen. Yeah, whenever you mark it for a four-cost card and you only have three power, you are incurring some risk. Yeah, it was it was an interesting game, that one. Um definitely it's it's always the risk when you you know it's a it's a nice option to have. You can build your deck around a card and then you can play one copy in your market, play a bunch of cards to get it, and it, it does a nice job of increasing how much access you have to it. The big two downsides, if something happens to that one copy, you are SOL. And, you know, if it, it takes a little bit more work and time to get it out of your market than just naturally drawing it. And so that's why we see something like the Sling deck, just playing one copy, just playing four copies in the starting deck. And then hopefully, you know, it's able to find what it needs that way. I saw some privilege and nobility earlier as well. Well, I guess that wasn't actually shown on stream, so... You know, we didn't get to show it off, but it was here in our top 64. Yeah, we're, we're still awaiting somebody to to break uh, Prosperity to Reach. That's that's uh, <laughs> that that one's a wild one. Uh, the new three cost spell. Gain three health, draw a card. If there are 10 or more units in your void, shuffle 10 of them back into your deck and then take an extra turn. And, you know, I mean, it's it's the cheapest card we've ever seen in Eternal for taking an extra turn. It's only a matter of time before someone finds something great to do with that one, I'm sure. All right, so now looking ahead here to game two, Colacoma is going to be on the play, and they've got a solid opening start without time influence, but with an even-handed golem. And meanwhile, for the Boxer, now they redrew once, and this is really awkward, Corey. They're going to go down to sixes. Their se- second set of hands had only two power to go with a bunch of expensive cards. Yeah, a full house of fours and sixes with just a pair of power cards there. We see another redraw from the boxer, and hey, this is the most functional of all their hands here. You know, you don't have an even-handed golem that can help refuel you after redrawing down to six cards, but you know, they do have that honor of claws with that fell rock. Unfortunately for them, though, Cola Coma here on a really awesome start as we're going to see multiple even-handed golems lead off the game for them. All right. Yep. That so a nice pickup as well for the boxer, or sorry, for for Colacoma against the boxer. So, 
There's a Vara that I believe was scouted at the top here. Do you actually audible and play Spore Folk to discard that one? No, we're going to see Exploit fired off here from Colacoma. <laughs> that might just be Colacoma trusting. Eventually, at some point, the Boxer is going to have to play a Ranger or have to play a Felrock, and I'll be able to get that Vara into my Void. I'm not too concerned. Yeah, and this is this is the turbo champion of cutting draw here from the boxer and immediately using that vine grafter there on their third turn. Still multiple power well influences at least away. Second var second var maybe not what Colocomo was looking for. They ooh, they do discard a Vara there though with the Spore Folk. Naveloft Huntress is going to kill the Spore Folk. And for Kolakama, they've got a really good finishing game if they can get up to that 8 power, but still a few away now. I think that what we're likely to see here is play that Vine Grafter, play that Sigil, or potentially the Vow, and then use the Grafter's ability, get into the market, go get that Grasping of Shadows. I don't know that there's anything to bring back with the Vara that's, you know, particularly amazing. Like, I don't know, there's an Asmodel also to combo off, or an Akara maybe to, to fight off a potentially threatening unit. I but... mean, if a Falrock were to come down and you were to discard an, a Vara, yeah. it's really likely to discard something that you can bring back with Varus, but it would require a Falrock to show up. For the Boxer, this is the how much guts do they have? Because first off, they're going to start with an attack, and I like this little double block here from Colacoma. Give up your regen, shield, and your even-handed golem to do that. And for the boxer, look at these guts. I mean, you were talking about playing and... a champion of cut in one turn for, before you have Aegis on it, and Colacoma could just go six-power Akaria, but they don't have that, and the boxer is going to be so nicely rewarded. Oh, oh, there was a Vara in the void. What did it have to get back? Anything? A spore folk. Yeah, just a spore folk to start. Okay. The, with, now there's an Izindal, so now another shadow unit's big. The boxer's gonna throw the champion of cunning into the air. And now we're gonna get quite a little race on our hands. And this is pretty dangerous if you're the boxer. I mean, it probably doesn't matter if they play this exploit and discard like Avara or Izindal, like the next shadow unit is gonna be bonkers anyway. I guess it's yeah. pretty good to play it because if there's a cheap shadow unit, you got to get it out of their hand. Right, exactly. And for that reason, my instinct is you have to play it. I think the boxer's going to be, yeah, they're going to be pretty disappointed here. It's, yeah, I've got two bars in Nazendel. <laughs> Which one do you want to put in my void for me? This is like those moments where you get like pre tilted. It's like, I know you don't have a Kolokova. If you do something messed up on your turn, I know you didn't have it. It's an even handed golem. Oh my gosh. Can we get a cheap shadow unit? Katra, maybe? Oh, no. Oh, Akari will come down next turn. Is that going to have... be in time? Yeah, and I don't know that there's an Akari in the void. I think we would have seen that come down over the Spore Folk here. So this champion drops Kolokoma now down to seven. Oh, oh God. the Spore Folk here has got to be huge. Right. If this, it, Kolokoma's goal has to be... If they can get multiple Akarias this turn, that's the big dream. So Zindel's going to show up. I think that was an Akaria discard there, Andrew. I think... Okay. I think that allows the the Kolokoma to protect themselves here from the Boxer's champion, as well as now you get to bring this Akaria back. Obviously, you're going crazy here. We're double Vara now. This is going to break the Aegis, and now the Akaria from hand can finish it off. And if you were the boxer, you were so close. Yeah, I mean, they, they went for Turbo Champion of Cunning. I mean, they ran out there with no Aegis. They, you know, no guts, no glory. Your opponent's going into six power. I don't care if you happen to have an Akaria. This is my only way I think I can win on six cards and not having the way to keep up. Uh, now, however, your opponent has Azendel, multiple Varas, multiple Akarias. Yeah, I don't. 
I don't know how you come back if you're the boxer. How do you how do you actually get the seven points across the finish line here? You would need a silver uh, blade menace, but you're a power away from being able to like several power away, of course. Bind grafter. Oh, they found the power. Wait a minute. I thought that one had already been used. Oh snap! Eight points. <laughs> All that discarding the Colicoma did last turn. Heads up to the boxer silver blade menacing for the win. Incredible. <laughs> Wow. wow, that's awesome. I thought that Vine Grafter had already been used, but it was the first Vine Grafter that went and got the champion of Cunning and protected it with the regen. Having the other one in play, holy moly, the boxer. That that was really something. That That's the boxer understanding the matchup, just knowing I have to push through every single point that I have to, to heck with this Aegis stuff. I just... I'm going to get my unit down. I'm going to hope that I can find a way to give it flying on the next turn. You know, maybe I'll find the fifth primal influence there. Holy crap, man. That was awesome. All right. So we're going to take a quick break here. We'll be back in just a few minutes with the finals of this tournament. We're going to check out the boxer and they are going to be going up against, um, who is it's uh, Netscape navigator, right on in a film matchup to determine the winner of this 5k storm break open and who will be going to the 2021 eternal world championships we'll be back in just a few minutes All right, welcome back to the Stormbreak Throne Open. Andrew Baxter and Corey Burkhardt about to bring you the finals match of this event. We will see who will be taking home the prize of champion and advancing to the 2020 World Championships, as well as winning a couple thousand dollars in our 5K cash prize pool. I uh, just wanted to let everybody know that after this event, we will be hosting Telemokos and some of the folks from Tuesday Night Eternal, our community tournament series. They've got a throne, uh, an open after show queued up where they're going to be talking about the decks, talking about the meta, talking about the event itself and where things are going. And so if you want to participate in the conversation, it sounds like it'll be a good time and conversation with some of the best players in the game. So looking forward to checking that out. And we'll be hosting that on this channel and rating them as well right after this event is done. But for now, we are going to get our finals match going here. We have Netscape Navigator versus The Boxer. The Boxer, no stranger to these finals. I don't know if I've seen Netscape Navigator before, but they've got a chance certainly 
this weekend to make their mark. Uh, definitely had some real nice plays. I mean, just seeing that last game where, you know, Netscape Navigator sort of had the amazing end game of VAR and Zindel all rolling, but just getting some damage in early and then finishing them off with a Silver Blade Menace was a great way to pull that match out when it looked like it might be slipping away from them. Yeah, and we've also seen Netscape Navigator manage to pull a similar thing off in their semifinal match, overcoming Sling of the Chi, where they realized, okay, it's time for me to get aggressive, and it's time for me to try to turn the corner. You have multiple slings going. I obviously can't compete with that. Let's let's see if I can close the door. So both of these players know how to change gears. They are very, very well aware of sort of how their deck works, and it's going to come down to... I think a lot of individual card choices here and some, you know, really heads up plays like Escape Navigator. They have a full four copies of Rindra. How is that going to play out? Is that going to be a big threat on the ground that they can keep getting in? Is that going to be potentially a liability against, you know, the fell rocks that, you know, each player ends up having? I don't know. And I think that's what we're going to see here on display from these two players. I know it's a mirror match, Andrew, but who do you like in the matchup? Yeah, if you're that's, the... that's tough. I don't want to. I don't want to pick favorites. I'm just going to enjoy going. No, I mean, uh, you know, I I wouldn't be doing anything other than saying that I've seen the boxer play before. I know that they're they're a great player and they're going to do a great job in the finals. But I can't say that Netscape Navigator has given me any reason to doubt them today. So, you know, we're going to just see who can make the most of each situation. Um, I I got no favorites in this one, Corey. What do you What do you say? I just love how clean Netscape Navigator's deck is. Just, yeah. you know, I, I realize what the best cards are and what I want. And yeah, I could be more flexible, maybe play one or two of here or there. Nah, to heck with it. I want four Acanthas. I want four Dazzles. I want all four Deviles. I mean, they even play Annihilate in their deck? No, no yeah, players. No Annihilate. Yeah, I don't need it. Yeah, I mean, there's there's some good uh, multi-faction units running around this weekend and just the ability to have some nice clean answers in the form of things like Maveloft Huntress and a Carrier for the bigger ones just means having something like Defile is nice because that's a spot where Maveloft Huntress can't kill all the early units. A Carrier obviously can't come down early, so Defile is, is a real nice pairing. Actually, you know what? The Boxer's got a couple of copies of Annihilate. But I, I think I like Netscape Navigator's selection of removal a little more for this weekend, though. I do say I have to say, Annihilate is going to look much a little bit better in the mirror. So that's always the kind of uh, metagame evolution and churn that you, you you're going to see is as players are going to try to tune things a little bit more. Maybe you see those copies of the file go down as it doesn't necessarily hit any of the premium cards in this matchup. So if it's more of a thing, that's a place that you can look. All right. For now, we're going to head down to the finals of this match between the Boxer and Netscape Navigator and find out who's going to be our champion. All right, we are starting off here. Netscape Navigator versus the Boxer. Both players on a variant of Felon even mid-range this weekend. Netscape Navigator's got a couple of Vine Grafters in their opener, and the Boxer's got a Grenahan. The Boxer's got an awkward little power development, though, as none of their power is going to come into play on Depleted as Netscape Navigator is going to be able to get some Vine Grafters down starting on turn two. Yeah, a little bit of an awkward thing going on for Netscape Navigator here. Yeah, you can get down the, the Vine Grafter here, but you're not going to be able to use it on the next turn unless you're willing to give up the ability to play your Honor of Claws here. I take back what I said. Is there's an Insignia right off the top there for Netscape Navigator. Where do you go here for Netscape Navigator? Do you just value, okay, I, just, I already know what I want in the matchup. I'd really love to go get, you know, maybe it's that champion of cutting. Maybe it's something like the Dizo's Office. Or do you want to wait until you have the player rages from the Cobalt Waste and that you don't end up getting exploited? As you know, the Boxer, you know, they've played two depleted power. It's still possible for them to have an exploit for you on the next turn. We're going to see the Grafter used cash in that symbol. And yeah, that Champion of Cunning, this is the strategy that we've seen from these Felon decks all weekend long. Putting those odd cost cards in the market for the even handed Golem deck. Ooh. All right. All right. Here we go. Here's the parade. Felrock number Ooh, one. Yep, Felrock. Yeah, yep, yep. 
So now, how expensive of cards do you discard if you're the boxer? Because the more expensive they are, the more you're going to discard from your deck, the more likely you are to hit another foul rock. They have to discard two here, but they're just going to go for the cheap ones. Yeah, that makes some amount of sense. I mean, I guess with a VAR coming down next turn for the boxer, that, that does a pretty good job of stabilizing against uh, these fell rocks. Yeah, but look at how great the boxer did. Now there's no great card for Netscape Navigator to discard this honor clause. Yeah, I don't know about this attack <laughs> with the... Uh, the Vine Grafter the vine attack is suspicious, yeah. It feels like all that happened there was you just gave up a regen. Like, was the Vine Grafter going to chump up Felrock? I mean, that's what you locked up. You ensured that that didn't happen, but I'm not sure. Even if it did chump, was that... Maybe that's good. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> these games are always hard. That's the, that's the fun thing about them, and these little decisions now we'll have to keep attention for the rest of the game. How much did that five damage that Netscape Navigator got through? How much would having a regen shield matter? Those would be things to look out for if you want to figure out if you're either of these players, what could have gone differently in this match. So yeah, here the Vara going to preempt a potential champion that may have been picked up out of the market from, Net, from Netscape Navigator. And yeah, Grenahan, love it. Get in there. Yeah, so we're just going to see Felrock and... This is a this is a tough one, Corey, because it's you could play the champion of cunning. Its Aegis is going to get immediately squashed by the Varus. So instead, we're going to see Netscape Navigator go into their market, probably with this Vine Grafter, and uh, try to find some kind of interaction that would allow the champion of cunning to take over the game. And you know, when you're playing in a matchup where both players have a lot of interaction and the games can go kind of longer. This, these are the kinds of decisions you want to make. It's not always what is the best play you can make this turn. The best play you can make this turn is definitely Champion of Cunning. It's big. It's It's got regen. It's likely to stick around for at least another turn. But long term, you're just not getting the most out of it if you play it while that bar is still on the board. And we might see the Navigator here block with this Vine Grafter. That just absorbs up five damage. No life steal, no damage dealt. Yep, prevents all the damage, so... That works. And we'll see the boxer Vinecraft, a champion of cunning of their own. So that's sort of the end game here. They're in the same boat though, it's with regards to the uh the Vara. The fact is that um the it the Vara doesn't just affect enemy ages, it affects your own ages as well. Right. However, yeah. the, the Vine Grafter here is actually like a really, really good defensive option for the Boxer is, yeah, we just see Nescape Navigator just pump the brakes and be like, yeah, I can't attack anymore. As the Vine Grafter threatens to eat up a Fell Rock or eat up a Vine Grafter. And if you attack with any of the Vine Grafters, you know, the little Granahem there is going to get to pick up a point of health also. <laughs> That's true. And actually a really big pickup here for the Boxer. You've already seen that. Uh, Netscape go into their market twice, so you know that they have some some option in their hand that they must care about at this point in time. But they're not going to fire off the exploits. We're going to see a Dazzle here fired off to negate. And I think that's going to lead to this Dizo's office coming down and probably cut ties here. I'm guessing on the Vara, I assume that you want your champion to retain an Aegis, but... There's obviously a risk to that, just as you were pointing out earlier, Andrew, where, you know, the, the Vara is sort of keeping... Uh, what, a, what, a, what, a, what a clever play. Like we're that. not going to cut ties this turn. We'll cut ties next turn, and that sort of gives us the first crack at the Champion of Cunning with Aegis. Um, the downside here is that we might not actually get to cut ties because one of the things that Akari gets to do is it also gets to kill sites. Right. Team does find a good option there, and that Mavelob Hunters can cash in that extra power here into a treasure trove. Okay. Nice little attack by the Boxer, that Vine Grafter, with its regen. And this attack is ultimately going to be wasted as the Akari finished it off anyway. So yeah, but it was a... It was a heads-up way to potentially kill a unit should one of those Vine Grafters block to save the site health there. Yep, definitely a heads-up play. <laughs> uh, hopefully everyone's having a fun time today in Twitch chat.
All right. So <laughs> looking at Netscape Navigator's options, you could just use Mavloft Huntress. Um, it's a little awkward because ideally what you'd want to do, Corey, I think, is go Mavloft Huntress, plunder power into a treasure trove. And then maybe kill Var and play Champion of Cunning. I guess if you do it that way, you don't lose the treasure trove to the Akarias and Tomb. All right, that seems like a, a reasonable approach to me, and you still get to be the first one into play with, you know, a a. a oh, interesting. They didn't plunder into a treasure trove. I guess they wanted to. They didn't want to lose the ability. They didn't want to lose it to um if they made this attack. Okay. So now Champion of Cunning comes down. It pumps up Netscape Navigator's board. Ooh, nice draw there for the boxer. In that Vara? Yeah, yeah, it sets it up so that over the next two turns you could potentially Vara plus Sicario away the champion of cunning but instead and i and i get it what the boxer is saying is they think their champion of cunning is better because with a regen unit and a lifesteal unit the plus two strength is just more impactful to their units than it is to netscape navigator so they're they're willing to sort of be behind in this champion of cunning race in terms of when they get the bonuses but because the bonuses are more impactful they're going to play into it i totally buy that and agree with the boxer there that you know, now this Grenahen can trade off for a 6-2, but they're going to gain three points of health here in the process. And, wow, the box are getting extra aggressive. Yeah. Um, Netscape Navigator is going to trade with the Grenahen. They know long-term that problem's only going to get worse, not better, as it gets more buffs. And so the, I, I get totally get that. Yeah, and I love this. Now you have a Karyad. Ooh. That's a really, really nice draw, though. Yeah, so the situation is, is that Netscape Navigator can't just attack. If they attack, they would just die. They can play this Maveloft Huntress, cash in the Treasure Trove to clear out a spell. Keep spinning the wheels here. What's the ground ahead going to oh, find? I don't like this. Okay, fortunately, they, I guess they're, they almost never hit spells off their ground ahead. <laughs> you know, it's when we were testing this card, Corey, we, had a, we were playing with a lot more at any cost kind of things and nice bolts and things. So... I was playing it a lot was, of Desecrates, but that's an odd cost card. Probably not. Yeah, that's, not yeah you're not going to see that in an even deck. That's true. Yeah, I was worried they were going to spike the power and then not be able to kill the Akari. You could kill the champion. The problem with killing the champion is that you don't get to attack and you have like two turn lethal in the air. But it does mean you just have the champion and they don't. And you're start now like buffing up the Grenahen. You can block that. Fine Grafter with your champion. Ooh, Mavelof's Huntress seems like a great pickup here. Yeah, bo both players just hitting haymakers here back and forth. Unfortunately for the Boxer, you know, you don't get it all. You don't get to cash in maybe a power card into a treasure trove here, but they're going to get to take out the enemy champion of Cunning here that Netscape Navigator has. This yeah, seems yeah. like a fine spot to just trade your Akanta with there. I guess you could just do this. I like this. Well, the problem is, is like, you have to top, maybe you have to top deck hard no matter what, but now you can't attack with your Akanta. Otherwise, okay, well, if you draw another Akanta, maybe you can. Well, you can't because you're at four, unfortunately, right? So, like, you can just take this. Oh, they're going to trade off. Okay. The, I think the boxer has the game if they just don't block there. I think that they do as well, but obviously, like. Oh, uh, this is awkward. Your Akanta doesn't even trade with their Akaria. Right. Grenahan finds Grenahan, but oh, and a Felrock and freebie. You, you probably just played the. Oh, they're gonna go for another Grenahan. What are they hoping to hit? I guess a Maveloft Tuntress ends the game literally on the spot. That's pretty good. Regardless, this game is likely to wrap up in the boxer's favor here in just a moment. Yeah, what do we have to see here? Like, Honor of Claws. Yeah, that Akari. Well, uh, it's close. You think the Demar, it alive, the Demar right? actually does it? Wow. So yeah, so the Akaria comes down, kills the other Akaria. Could trade with the Falrock. There would only be two damage coming back, but Netscape Navigator is going to get the bad news. Demar, Death Saboteur, 
two cost three one ambush we don't need to worry about its ultimate right now is it's just going to attack and finish off the game yeah i didn't need didn't need to go steal an edict of makar out of the market it could have could make the uh the akari unable to block but didn't need to take a peek already knew the game was over and the box are now one game away andrew yeah they're they're in prime position right now it's going to be exciting to see if they can finish it off or if we're going to get a game three. I, you know, I, I think the interesting thing there was sort of look, was noting sort of Netscape Navigator without being, I would say, reckless, generally was taking aggressive lines when possible and trying to use the fact that while something like Champion of Cunning is ultimately answerable by in many situations and can eventually be dealt with, the fact is, is that if you get a, a hit in with it, or even two hits in with it, it's a lot of damage. And the strength buffs to your other units just might mean that you're in a position where the opponent can't recover in time and ultimately it didn't work out for them, but it does seem like a pretty viable route to go. You you can always sort of change gears if the aggression isn't working, but it's always nice when you have your opponent on the back foot to some degree thinking about, what do I? is it possible I'm just going to die if I do something risky here? Right, yeah, no, no, no like putting them putting them on the back foot where they're having to pay attention to multiple things rather than just like okay here are my units in play and what are the things that i'm representing could be in my hand it's well if you're also at six point of health you have to worry about a lot more things going wrong than just you know what's blatantly in front of you fortunately right. did not pan out there for netscape navigator we'll see if they can put all the pieces of the puzzle here together in game number two take us to a third game Boxer, of course. Rather just end it right here. Keep it plain and simple. If Netscape Navigator were to win Worlds, I think we would be obligated to make like a lighthouse logo. <laughs> for them. I think that was the thing. I'm trying to remember. It's been so long, but it was like Netscape Navigator. All like the the logos and symbology, if I recall, were like built around like shipping things and like charting courses on the seas I, I thought it was like a little lighthouse that would spin when it was loading but i don't know <laughs> it might just, have been a while i just see sort of an n crested over the horizon is what i see but i'll take your word for it you're you're much more hip with the lingo and all of the cool happenings of the world like i assume that oh, you yeah. know more more about yeah, like crypto yeah. than i do so well wait do you remember netscape navigator we're kind of going down a tangent here <laughs> oh no i haven't no i don't Net netscape, oh, netscape navigator is like one of the original internet browsers back from the 90s like this is like pre all of like pre firefox and chrome and all of that it was like one of the most popular ones in the 90s but yeah <laughs> back in my day when we were a kid we just set the internet explorer that came on you know your your right. microsoft computer back in the 90s but Enough, enough with that. Let's get back to the eternal action. <laughs> well, fun piece of internet trivia for, for the kids out there who are too young to remember the 90s. All right, so the Boxer's up a game here in our finals. If he, they can win this match, they will be the champion of this Open and be in our World Championships. But they did discard, or rather redrew down to a six-card hand. They've got a Fell Rock and an Annihilate, so that's something, but it ain't a lot. Meanwhile, Netscape Navigator... Got things very nicely queued up, I should say. An even-handed golem backed up by a pair of Rindras. Yeah, definitely a, an interesting sort of hand here for Netscape Navigator. Your opponent's on the redraw, so there's a little bit of a idea of, well, I don't really want to, you know, induce some amount of, like, high-variant stuff with playing my Rindra, and maybe we're able to play, like, a Felrock, but, I mean... You don't play these renders out and you don't pressure your opponent, you're not really getting anywhere. They've picked up two Mavelop Huntresses here and two Cobalt Waystones. So, you know, there's no sort of big top end like no Akarias waiting in the wings here. And no Vine Grafters to go get some sort of like champion out of that market. Yeah, and poor the boxer here just finding power after power. Will we see Netscape Navigator fire off this Rindra? It'll be interesting. All okay. right, an even hand, an, a treasure trove, thanks to the plunder, picks up a Akanta, which, yeah, we're going to see that come down. And 
For Netscape Navigator, it's kind of interesting with the boxer not doing much. Ooh, we're going to see it's just a, a, a quick little dazzle here. It's interesting how much the box or Netscape Navigator is going to avoid playing Rindra to avoid a Felrock coming from the other side. Yeah, but now here with no actual threats able to brawl, we'll see Rindra come down. Felrock gets immediately put in. And Netscape play. Navigator is probably like, oh, I should have attacked first. Because <laughs> if they had attacked, the uh, the the golem would have gotten through for one, but now the five two blocks the way. Love this attack by the boxer. It's like, what are the odds going into a turn with six power that Netscape Navigator can't remove that fell rock? Sure, you might would you would love to just trade and stop any attack from any of Netscape Navigator's units, but at least this way, you hedge against the very likely possibility that. Um, that fell rock is going to die on your next turn and it allows you to get something out of it with that attack Well, interesting they are gonna cash oh, wow. in the power here Yeah, that's I Mean it, the thing is is that it it doesn't allow them to get down another Rindra. It's questionable how useful it is It's plausible the only other card in hand for the boxer is something like a fell rock And it means that the Rindra in play hits for a lot since you played a spell this turn yeah, it's more a matter of, well, the boxer didn't do anything on turn three. They didn't do anything here on turn five. What, you know, what's the way I really lose this game? And it's me playing this run and they get to discard another fell rock into play. So pretty heads up there by Netscape Navigator, not, you know, risking everything for ruin. And now, you know, they lost their card to that exploit, but, you know, we get to defile this out of the way. The render gets buffed up once again. Oh, well, the good, news, the good news for the boxers is this is not a lethal attack. The bad news is it's only one short of lethal. Uh, if you honor claws into a fell rock and the perfect cards, which you didn't. The boxer drops game number two. Not a very competitive game. They unfortunately redrew their hand multiple times. Didn't have the goods. Didn't really feel like they had a ton of room to operate there. And, you know, Netscape Navigator... It was a, that was a tough game one that they lost. It certainly felt like they were quite in it for most of the time, but just as quickly, they have now tightened the matchup at one game apiece, and we are just now a game away from finding out who is going to be in the World Championships this year. But the good news is that for both of these players, if they did lose, since they have top four at the first Open of the year, all it now takes for them is to top four one more Open this year, and they will be in our World Championships. And... One of the nice little bonuses is part of our 2021 Eternal Organized Play season. And as a reminder, if you're enjoying this action, in just two weeks, or a little over, a little more than two three. weeks, I should say, yeah, three weeks from now, we have the Expedition Open, another 5K Open, April 16th to the 18th. So start working on getting your decks together for that now, as we will be sending another player to the World Championships and having another awesome broadcast here on twitch.tv slash direwolfdigital. I'm just stoked that we get all the drama here. One game, live or die on the field of battle. Somebody goes to Worlds. You know, somebody unfortunately has to be left wondering, you know, what if, what if I had made some different play? What if I had registered this one other card instead of this card? But hey, we get we get one moment to, you know, immortalize somebody as, as our first open winner. Andrew, I tried to put you on the spot earlier. I'm going to try one more time. Game three, Boxer gets to go first. The Felon even mirror. Who takes it home? Well, the Boxer had a, didn't get didn't really have the best draws there in game two, so surely Lightning can't strike twice. They'll get game three. <laughs> now we'll see. <laughs> uh, yeah, and as a reminder, stay tuned afterwards. We're going to be rating Telemokos and the Tuesday Night Eternal crew for a after show where they're going to chat about the tournament, talk about what's next, and really just break it all down with some of the best players in the game. I know that Sunnyvale and Stormblast. So if you want to get some top-notch commentary from some people who actually have won matches of competitive Eternal, <laughs> check it out. Yeah, Sunnyvale was here in our top 32. Stormblast bowed out in our top eight. So both of those players put on really fantastic show this weekend. Shoutouts to both of them. I'm looking forward to watching that. And, you know, maybe 
maybe we'll be lucky enough to see either the boxer or Netscape Navigator join the show after after they win. See if they go for a victory lap. Here we go. Game number three. All right, at the top of your screen, the boxer going to be on the play here. They've got an Akanta. That's a nice one to start off with on turn two. It doesn't draw you any cards, but it, it's the one where it sort of checks your opponent where, you know, if they don't have removal or, inter or something to deal with in the first couple of turns, it can give you a great literal early start. Yeah, so the spot where... Nescape Navigator having that shadow symbol actually looks like a pretty big game here. The ability to to accelerate up on the third turn to that, that fourth influence, but oh wow. Change, change of plans here for the boxer. Great draw on turn number two. Yeah, I mean, if, if you hold the Akanta longer, you might be able to play it in a spot where they've already used up the removal. Meanwhile, we see Netscape Navigator getting started with theirs. They've got a shadow symbol in hand to make it online for the third turn of the game. So that, that that big boost in shadow influence with the depleted shadow symbol. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess the one question for Netscape Navigator is if you do attack here, you get a 2-1 and you trade with the even-handed golem, but it could get better in the future, Corey. If you get up to six shadow influence, you get a 2-2, two, two, it gets plus two, plus two in flying. Yeah, my instinct here would be to not attack like, the boxers sort of hedged their choices on so many card choices. There's not that many defiles in their deck. I assume that if we're defiling here, the, no, we're not going to attack. Okay, so just getting rid of that, not wanting to give boxer the option. Obviously, you don't have any Vananda Golem that you know that they will not want to attack into. Ooh, another Shadow Symbol's a nice pickup. You want to just go to the skies now, Andrew? I would, but I guess we're going to see. It's kind of awkward, though, Corey, because, like, this is... You're breaking up the increment of power. You know what I mean? Like, this turn, right. you could have an even amount. Next turn is a great turn to play that Depleted Shadow Symbol because, you know, as an even deck, you just don't really spend odd increments of power all that well. No, very, very true. You'd rather have four and four than three and five in your, your even found deck here. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> the uh, boxers uh, got two Akaris in hand, but they just they just scouted the third to the top with their <laughs> with their crest of cunning. Vara connects for five lifesteal. So we know Netscape Navigator likes to win aggressively, but you know, once you're taking hits from a fully powered up Vara Vengeance Seeker, it's not gonna work as well. Yeah, it's hard to be that aggressive into a five five lifesteal deadly. So we do see that symbol deployed. I assume that we'll see a Kanta attack here, make an elf, and then probably this Mavelof Huntress is going to use her powers to turn away this Rindra into a Sigil and eat up that Vara. Okay, problem one solved here for Netscape Navigator. Problem two is uh, just beginning. What's the problem? Oh, the Akaria. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll probably see an Akaria come back. Fortunately for Netscape Navigator, no spells to work with. So they don't have to worry about that in Tomb. Meanwhile, the Boxer, they do have an Honor of Claws, so this is kind of one of those moments where you just go like, yeah, all right, you got me. <laughs> Akaria kills Akaria. Honor of Claws... Takes it out and it's kind of weird calling it a Karia first Reaper, but this is the second one to come down this game. But you know what? That's the card's name. <laughs> Maybe Probably we should update it. Name. Yeah, we'll, we'll update it for each Karia you play in the future. <laughs> All right, so we're going to see Champion of Cunning pick up Regen. And yeah, I mean, it looks, I see a good plan for the Boxer. So the Boxer can play Bar of Engine Seeker this turn. That's going to pop any future Aegises, and now Akari is going to come in. Netscape Navigator is just forced to play out this Champion of Cunning. It's going to get met swiftly by 
the game's third Akaria. Well, the third Akaria on one side. I think that would be the fourth overall. Yeah. Something... And we're going to see pretty big attack here. I guess, I guess we're not because there's the regen. All right. So is there anything that we can pull if you're a Netscape Navigator? Are you going to be forced to just attack with your Grenahen to gain three to buy yourself another turn? Right now there's ten in the air. Yeah, I guess that does gain you another turn because you can gain three up to thirteen. You can use your Vine Grafter to block the Vara and your other Vine Grafter in your hand that you're going to have to deploy this turn to block one of these even-handed golems. But obviously, we yeah, know, not... Andrew, looking at that Annihilate in hand, that plan's not going to end up working out. I'm not seeing the goods in the market, Corey. Netscape Navigator this weekend, Edict of Makar, Aramat's Design, Silverblade Menace, Champion of Cunning, Dizo's Office. And they would be... The, the Silverblade Menace and the Dizo's Office, just another turn away from coming down. Yep, Netscape Navigator does come to the right conclusion of you do have to attack with the Grenahen to give yourself an out to live. you I can't imagine the boxer is going to do something as crazy as block with like Vara and Annihilate it to stop the lifesteal. But it is possible. It just seems so much worse than just doing this. Yeah, the, the boxer is known for finding very clever, very fancy plays. Don't think they need to get fancy here. All right, so Dizo's office... The following turn, don't think that's going to be enough. We're going to see Annihilate take out a Vine Grafter. And it looks like an exactly lethal attack here. The Boxer couldn't even click attack with all of their units before Netscape Navigator had lost and conceded. And to them, they fall in this in our finals. The Boxer is your champion of our first 5K Open of the year. Congratulations to them. They are now our second player qualified for the 2021 Eternal World Championships joining last year's defending champion Lights Out Ace. So a great start to the season for them, for Netscape Navigator. Thanks to their top four finish, they will now need one more to make it to the World Championships in a future Open, but they did not lock it up this weekend. For the Boxer, they had the deck of the tournament, even Feln, no secret among many of our players, but certainly had a well-crafted version of it. Yeah, and I mean... Netscape Navigator, even though they go out in second, they pick up a nice portion there of that 5k prize pool, you know, tons of other things like packs, those alternate arts, and yeah, as you said, I mean, they're one more top four finish away, and you know, there's eight there's eight more shots at it. They got another shot here in three weeks, Andrew, they could still book their ticket. Many more chances, many more opportunities, but I don't know, You, I would still hold my head high here. You were one game away from taking down the whole event. It sucks to lose in the finals, but you know you, you have many more opportunities. This isn't the last shot. Well, thanks so much for joining us, everyone, here this weekend. As we mentioned, we've got an expedition open in a couple weeks. Get your hit masters now, either this month in March or in April, to unlock your mastery pass, and a master's entry will get you four premium copies of that month's promo for joining the event. If you aren't masters and you join, well, you'll still get four copies. And then you will also get two buys if you have hit masters in any format this month or next month. So it'll be a great fun event. We'll be back with more coverage of that event in a few weeks. For now, that's for signing off for myself, Corey Burkhardt, Luis Scott Vargas. Thanks to Samantha Stelter for producing and for doing such a great job for us over the years and producing these events. We always appreciate all of the help that she's done in helping all of this come together. That's going to do it for us. We are going to raid the Tuesday Night Eternal crew. They're getting their stream fired up now for a after show where they're going to be breaking down the events of today's tournament and talking about the deck lists and where everything goes from here. So it should be a fun conversation and we'll be tuning in ourselves. For that, that's going to do it from us at Direwolf Digital. We will see you in the queues.